This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ana Sofia Simão de Portugal. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 33 Roman Bandits. The next morning, Franz woke first and instantly rang the bell. The sun had not yet died away when Signor Pastrini himself entered. Well, Excellency, said Landlord triumphantly and without waiting for friends to question him. I feared yesterday, when I would not promise you anything, that you were too late. There is not a single carriage to be had, that is, for the last three days of the carnival. Yes, returned Franz, for the very three days it is most needed. What is the matter? said Albert Hendrick. No carriage to be had? Just so returned France. You have guessed it. Well, your eternal city is a nice sort of a place. That is to say, Excellency, replied Pastrini, who was desirous to keeping up the dignity of the capital of the Christian world in the eyes of his guest, that there are no carriages to be had from Sunday to Tuesday evening, but from now till Sunday you can have fifty if you please. Ah, that is something, said Albert. Today is Thursday, and who knows what may arrive between this and Sunday. Ten or twelve thousand travelers will arrive, replied Franz, which will make it still more difficult. My friend, said Morcerf, let us enjoy the present without gloomy foreboding for the future. At least can we have a window? Where? In the Corso. Ah, a window, exclaimed Signor Pastrini. Utterly impossible. There was only one left in the fifth floor of the Doria Palace, and has been led to a Russian prince for twenty seconds a day. The two young men looked at each other with an air of stupefaction. Well, said Franz to Albert, do you know what is the best thing we can do? It is the best carnival at Venice. There we are sure of obtaining gondolas if we cannot have carriages. Ah, the devil, no, cried Albert. I came to Rome to see the carnival, and I will, though I see it on stilts. Bravo, an excellent idea. We will disguise ourselves as monsters pulcinellos, or shepherds of the lands, and we shall have complete success. Do your excellency still wish for a carriage from now to Sunday morning? Parbleu, said Albert. Do you think we are going to run about on foot in the streets of Rome, like lawyers' clerks? I hasten to comply with your excellency's wishes, only, I tell you beforehand, the carriage will cost you six piastres a day. And, as I am not a millionaire, like the gentleman in the next apartments, said Franz, I warn you, that as I have been four times before at Rome, I know the prices of all the carriages. We will give you twelve piastres for today, tomorrow, and the day after, and then you will make a good profit. But, excellency, said Pastrini, still striving to gain his point. And now go, returned Franz, or I shall go myself and bargain with our after Tori, who is mine also. He is also an old friend of mine, who has plundered me pretty well already, and, in hope of making more out of me, he will take a less price than the one I offer you. You will lose the preference, and that will be your fault. Do not give you yourself to travel, Excellency returned Signor Pastrini, with a smile peculiar to the Italian speculator when he confesses defeat. I will do all I can, and I hope you will be satisfied. And now we understand each other. When do you wish the carriage to be here? In an hour. In an hour it will be at the door. An hour after the vehicle was at the door. It was a high convenience which was elevated to the rank of a private carriage in honor of the occasion, but, in spite of his humble exterior, the young men would have thought themselves happy to have secured it for the last three days of the carnival. Excellency, cried Ciceron, seeing friends approach the window, shall I bring the carriage nearer to the palace? Accustomed as friends was to the Italian phraseology, his first impulse was to look round him, but his words were addressed to him. France was the Excellency, the vehicle was the carriage, and the Hotel de Londres was the palace. The genius with laudation characteristics of the race was in that phrase. 
France and Albert descended, the carriage approached the palace. Their excellencies stretched their legs along the seats. The Cicerone sprang into the seat behind. Where do your excellencies wish to go? asked he. To St. Peter's first, and then to the Colosseum, returned Albert. But Albert did not know that it takes a day to see St. Peter's, and a month to study it. The day was passed at St. Peter's alone. Suddenly, the daylight began to fade away. Franz took out his watch. It was half past four. They returned to the hotel. At the door, Franz ordered the coachman to be ready at eight. He wished to show Albert to Colosseum by moonlight, as he had shown him St. Peter's by daylight. When you show a friend a city one has already visited, we feel the same pride as when you point out a woman whose lover we have been. He was to leave the city by the Porta del Popolo, skirt the outer wall, and re-enter by Porta San Giovanni. Thus, they would behold Colosseum without finding their impressions dull by first looking on the Capitol, the Forum, the Arch of Septimus Severus, the Temple of Antoninus and Faustina, and Via Sacra. They sat down to dinner. Signor Pastrini had promised them a banquet. He gave them a tolerable repast. At the end of the dinner he entered in person. Fred thought that he came to hear his dinner praise, and began accordingly, but at the first words he was interrupted. Excellency, said Pastrini, I am delighted to have your approbation, but it was not for that I came. Did you come to tell us you have procured a carriage? asked Albert, lighting his cigar. Uh, no, and your excellence will do well not to think of that any longer. At Rome, things can or cannot be done. When you are told anything cannot be done, there is an end of it. It is much more convenient at Paris. When anything cannot be done, you pay double, and it is done directly. That is all the French say, returned Signor Pastrini, somewhat piqued. For that reason, I do not understand why they travel. But, said Albert, emitting a volume of smoke and blessing his chair on its hind legs, only madmen or blockheads like us ever do travel. Men in their senses do not quit their hotel in the Rue du Elder, their walk on the Boulevard de Gand and the Café de Paris. It is of course understood that Albert resided in the aforesaid street, appeared every day on the fashionable walk, and dined frequently at the only restaurant where he can really dine, that is, if you are on good terms with his frequenters. Signor Pastrini remained silent the short time. It was evident that he was musing over this answer, which did not seem very clear. But, said Franz, in his turn interrupting his host's meditations, you had some motive for coming here. May I beg to know what it was? Ah, yes. You have ordered your carriage at eight o'clock precisely. I have. You intend visiting Il Coliseo? You mean the Colosseum? It is the same thing. You have told your coachman to leave the city by the Porta del Popolo, to drive round the walls, and re-enter by the Porta San Giovanni. These are my words, exactly. Well, this route is impossible. Impossible. Very dangerous, to say the least. Dangerous. And why? On account that famous Luigi Vampa. Pray, who may this famous Luigi Vampa be? inquired Albert. He may be very famous at Rome, but I can assure you he is quite unknown at Paris. What? Do you not know him? I have not that honor. You have never heard his name? Never. Well, then, he is a bandit, compared to whom the Desaris and the Gasparonis were mere children. Now then, Albert, cried Franz, here is a bandit for you at last. I forewarn you, Signor Pastrini, that I shall not believe one word of what you are going to tell us. Having told you this, begin. Once upon a time... Well, go on. Signor Pastrini turned towards friends, who seemed to him the more reasonable of the two. We must do him justice. He had had a great many Frenchmen in his house, but had never been able to comprehend them. Excellency, said he gravely, addressing friends. If you look upon me as a liar, it is useless for me to say anything. It was for your interest I... Albert does not say you are a liar, Signor Pastrini, said Franz, but that he will not believe what you are going to tell us. But I will believe all you say, so proceed. 
but if your excellency doubt my veracity signor pastrini returned friends you are more susceptible than cassandra who was a prophetess and yet no one believed her while you at least are sure of the credence of half your audience come sit down and tell us all about this signor vampa I told your excellency he is the most famous bandit we have had since the days of Mastrilla. Well, what has this bandit to do with the order I have given the coachman to leave the city by the port of El Popolo and to re-enter by the port of San Giovanni? This, replied Signor Pastrini, that you'll go out by one, but I very much doubt your returning by the other. Why? asked Franz. Because, after nightfall, you are not safe fifty yards from the gates. On your honor, is that true? cried Albert. Count, returned Signor Pastrini, heard at Albert's repeated doubts of the truth of his assertions. I did not say this to you, but to your companion, who knows Rome and knows, too, that these things are not to be laughed at. My dear fellow, said Albert, turning to France, here is an admirable adventure. We will fill our carriage with pistols blunderbusses and double-barreled guns. Luigi Vampa comes to take us, and we take him. We bring him back to Rome, and present him to His Holiness the Pope, who asks how he can repay so great a service. Then we merely ask for a carriage and a pair of horses, and we see the carnival in the carriage, and doubtless the Roman people will crown us at the capital, and proclaim us, like Crotius and the vile Horatius, the preservers of their country. Whilst Albert proposed this scheme, Signor Pastrini's face assumed an expression impossible to describe. And pray, asked Franz, where are these pistols, blunderbusses, and other deadly weapons with which you intend filling the carriage? Not out of my armory, for at the Racina I was plundered even of my hunting knife. I shared the same fate at Aqua Pendant. Do you know, Signor Pastrini, said Albert, lighting a second cigar at first, that this practice is very convenient for bandits, and that it seems to be due to an arrangement of their own. Doubtless, Signor Pastrini found this pleasantry compromising, for he only answered half the question, and then he spoke to France, as the only one likely to listen with attention. Your Excellency knows that it is not customary to defend yourselves when attacked by bandits. What? cried Albert, whose courage revolted at the idea of being plundered tamely not make any resistance. No, for it would be useless. What could you do against a dozen bandits who spring out of some pit, ruin or aqueduct, and level their pieces at you? Ah, oh, parbleu! They should kill me. The innkeeper turned to friends with an air that seemed to say, Your friend is decidedly mad. My dear Albert, returned friends, your answer is sublime, and worthy the let them die of Cornell, only when Horace made that answer, safety or Rome was concerned. But as for us, it is only to gratify a whim, and it would be ridiculous to risk our lives for so foolish of a motive. Albert poured himself out a glass of lacrima Christi, which he sipped at intervals, muttering some unintelligible words. Well, Signor Pastrini, said Franz, now that my companion is quieted, and you have seen how peaceful my intentions are, tell me who is this Luigi Vampa. Is he a shepherd or a nobleman, young or old, tall or short? Describe him in order that, if you meet him by chance, like Boogaboo John or Lara, we may recognize him. You do not apply to anyone better able to inform you on all these points, for I knew him when he was a child, and one day that I fell into his hands, Going from Ferentino to Alatri, he, fortunately for me, recollected me, and set me free, not only without ransom, but made me a present of a very splendid watch, and related his history to me. Let us see the watch, said Albert. Signor Pastrini drew from his fove a magnificent brequet, bearing the name of its maker, of Parisian manufacture, and the Count's coronet. Here it is, said he. Peste! returned Albert. I compliment you on it. I have its fellow. He took his watch from his waistcoat pocket. And it cost me three thousand francs. Let us hear the history, said Franz, motioning Signor Pastrini to seat himself. Your Excellency is permitted? asked the host. Pardieu, 
cried Albert. You are not a preacher to remain standing. The host sat down, after having made each of them a respectful bow, which meant that he was ready to tell them all they wished to know concerning Luigi Vampa. You tell me, said Franz, at the moment Signor Pastrini was about to open his mouth, that you knew Luigi Vampa when he was a child. He's still a young man, then. A young man? He is only two and twenty. He will gain himself a reputation. What do you think of that, Albert? A two and twenty to be thus famous? Yes, and at his age, Alexander, Caesar and Napoleon, who have all made some noise in the world, were quite behind him. So, continued Franz, the hero of this history is only two and twenty. Scarcely so much. Is he tall or short? Of the middle eight, but same stature as this excellency, returned the host, pointing to Albert. Thanks for the comparison, said Albert with a bow. Go on, Signor Pastrini, continued Franz, smiling at his friends susceptibly. To what class of society does he belong? He was a shepherd boy, attached to the farm of the Count of San Felice, situated between Palestrina and the Lake of Cabrim. He was born at Pampinara, and entered the Count's service when he was five years old. His father was also a shepherd, who owned a small flock, and lived by the wool and milk which he sold at Rome. When quite a child, the little Vampa displayed the most extraordinary precocity. One day, when he was seven years old, he came to the curate of Palestrina, and asked to be taught to read. It was somewhat difficult, for he could not quit his flock. But the good curate went every day to say mass at the little hamlet, too poor to pay a priest, and which, having no other name, was called Borgo. He told Luigi that he might meet him on his return, and that then he would give him a lesson, warning him that it would be short, and that he must profit as much as possible by it. The child accepted joyfully. Every day Luigi led his flock to graze on the road that leads from Palestrina to Borgo. Every day, at nine o'clock in the morning, the priest and the boy sat down on a bank by the wayside, and the little shepherd took his lesson out of the priest's breviary. At the end of three months he had learned to read. This was not enough. He must now learn to write. The priest had a writing teacher at Rome make three alphabets, one large, one mildling, and one small, and pointed out to him that by the help of a sharp instrument he could trace the letters on a slate and thus learn to write. The same evening, when the flock was safe at the farm, the little Luigi hastened to the smith at Palestrina, took a large nail, heated and sharpened it, and formed a sort of stylus. The next morning he gathered an armful of pieces of slate and began. At the end of three months he had learned to write. The curate, astonished at his quickness and intelligence, made him a present of pens, paper, and a penknife. This demanded new effort, but nothing compared to the first. At the end of a week he wrote as well with his pen as with stylus. The curate related the incident to the Count of St. Felice, who sent for the little shepherd, made him read and write before him, ordered his attendant to let him eat with the domestics and to give him two piastres a month. With this, Luigi proceeds books and pencils. He applied his imitative powers to everything and, like Giotto, when young, he drew on his slate, sheep, houses and trees. Then, with his knife, he began to carve all sorts of objects in the wood. It was thus that Pinelli, the famous sculptor, had commenced. A girl of six or seven, that is, a little younger than Vampa, tended sheep on a farm near Palestrina. She was an orphan, born at Palmontoni, and was named Teresa. The two children met, sat down near each other, let their flocks mingle together, played, laughed, and conversed together. In the evening they separated the Count of San Felice's flock from those of Baran Servetri, and the children returned to their respective farms, promising to meet next morning. The next day they kept their word, and thus they grew up together. Vampa was twelve and Teresa eleven, and yet their natural disposition revealed itself. Besides his taste for the fine arts, which Luigi had carried as far as he could in his solitude, he was given to alternating fits of sadness and enthusiasm, was often angry and capricious, and always sarcastic. 
none of the lads of Pampinara, Palestrina, or Varmantoni, had been able to gain any influence over him or even to become his companion. His disposition, always inclined to accept concessions rather than to make them, kept him aloof from all friendships. Teresa alone ruled by a look, a word, a gesture, this impetuous character, which she held beneath the hands of a woman, and which beneath the hand of a man might have broken, but could never have been bended. Teresa was lively and gay, but coquettish to excess. Two piastres that Luigi received every month from the Count of San Felice's steward, and the price of all the little carvings in wood he sold at Rome, were expended in earrings, necklaces, and gold hairpins, so that, thanks to her friend's generosity, Teresa was the most beautiful and the best attired peasant near Rome. The two children grew up together, passing all their time with each other and giving themselves up to the wild ideas of their different characters. Thus, in all their dreams, their wishes and their conversations, Van saw himself the captain of a vessel, general of an army or governor of a province. Teresa saw herself rich, superbly attired, and attended by a train of livery gymnastics. Then, when they had thus passed the day in building castles in the air, they separated their flocks and descended from the elevation of their dreams to the reality of their humble position. One day, the young shepherds told the Count Steward that he had seen a wolf come out of the Sabine Mountains and prowl around his flock. The steward gave him a gun. This is what Fampa longs for. This gun had an excellent barrel, made at Brescia, and carrying a ball with the precision of an English rifle. But one day the Count broke the stock, and had then cast the gun aside. This, however, was nothing to a sculptor like Vampa. He examined the broken stock, calculated what change it would require to adapt the gun to his shoulder, and made a fresh stock, so beautiful carved that it would have fetched fifteen or twenty piastres had he chosen to sell it. But nothing could be further from his thought. For a long time a gun had been the young man's greatest ambition. In every country where independence has taken the place of liberty, the first desire of a manly heart is to possess a weapon, which at once renders him capable of defense or attack, and, by rendering its owner terrible, often makes him feared. From this moment, Vampa devoted all his leisure time to perfecting himself in the use of his precious weapon. He purchased power and ball, and everything served him for a mark, the trunk of some old and moss-grown olive tree that grew on the Sabine Mountains, the fox, as he quitted his earth on some marauding excursion, the eagle that soared above their heads. And thus, he soon became so expert that Teresa overcame the terror she at first felt at report, and amused herself by watching him direct the ball wherever he pleased it, and as much accuracy as if he placed it by hand. One evening a wolf emerged from a pine wood, here which they were usually stationed, but the wolf had scarcely advanced ten yards, here he was dead. Proud of this exploit, Vamp took the dead animal on his shoulders and carried him to the farm. These exploits had gained which considerable reputation. The man of superior abilities always finds admirers, go where he will. He was spoken of as the most adroit, the strongest, and the most courageous contadino for ten leagues around. And although Teresa was universally allowed to be the most beautiful girl of the Sabines, no one had ever spoken to her of love, because it was known that she was beloved by Vampa. And yet the two young people had never declared their affection. They had grown together like two trees, whose roots are mingled, whose branches intertwine, and whose intermingled perfume rises to the heavens. Only their wish to see each other had become a necessity, and they would have preferred death to a day's separation. Teresa was sixteen, and Vampa seventeen. About this time, a band of brigands that had established itself in the Lepini Mountains began to be much spoken of. The brigands had never been really extirpated, from the neighborhood of Rome. Sometimes a chief is wanted, but when a chief presents himself, he rarely has to wait long for a band of followers. The celebrated Cucumetto, pursued in the Abruzzo, driven out of the kingdom of Naples, where he had carried on a regular war, had crossed the Garigiano, like Manfred, and had taken refuge on the banks of the Amazon, between Sonino and Giuperno. 
he strove to collect a band of followers, and follow the footsteps of the Cesaris and Gasparon, whom he hoped to surpass. Many young men of Palestrina, Frascati, and Pampinara had disappeared. Their disappearance at first caused much disquietude, did it soon known that they had joined Cucumetto. After some time, Cucumetto became the object of universal attention. The most extraordinary traits of ferocious daring and brutality were related of him. One day, he carried off a young girl, the daughter of a surveyor of Frosinone. The bandit's laws are positive. A young girl belongs first to him who carries her off, then the rest draw lots for her, and she is abandoned to their brutality until death relieves her sufferings. When their parents are sufficiently rich to pay a ransom, a messenger is sent to negotiate. The prisoner is hostage for the security of the messenger. Should the ransom be refused, the prisoner is irrevocably lost. The young girl's lover was in Cocometto's troop. His name was Carlini. When she recognized her lover, the poor girl extended her arms to him and believed herself safe. But Carlini felt his heart sing, for he but too well knew the fate that awaited her. However, as he was a favorite with Cocometto, as he had for three years faithfully served him, and as he had saved his life by shooting a dragon who was about to cut him down, he hoped the chief would have pity on him. He took Cocomet to one side, while the young girl, seated at the foot of a huge pine that stood in the center of the forest, made a veil of her picturesque headdress to hide her face from the lascivious gaze of the bandits. There he told the chief all, his affection for the prisoner, their promises of mutual fidelity, and how every night, since he had been here, they had met in some neighboring ruins. It so happened that night that Cocometto had sent Carlini to a village, so that he had been unable to go to the place of meeting. Cocometto had been there, however, by accident, as he said, and they had carried the maiden off. Carlini besought his chief to make an exception in Rita's favor, as her father was rich and could pay a large ransom. Cocometto seemed to yield to his friend's entreaties, and bade him find a shepherd to send Rita's father at Rosinone. Carlini flew joyfully to Rita, telling her she was saved, and bidding a write to her father to inform him that they had occurred, and that the ransom was fixed at three hundred piastres. Twelve hours' delay was all that was granted, that is, until nine the next morning. The instant the letter was written, Carlini seized it, and hastened to the plain to find a messenger. He found a young shepherd watching his flock. The natural messengers of the bandits are the shepherds who live between the city and the mountains, between civilized and savage life. The boy undertook the commission, promising to be in Frosinone in less than an hour. Carlin returned, anxious to see his mistress, and announced joyful intelligence. He found a troop in the clave, souping off the provisions exacted as contributions from the peasants. But his eyes vainly sought Rita and Cocometto among them. He inquired where they were, and was answered by a burst of laughter. A cold perspiration burst from every pore, and his hair stood on end. He repeated this question. One of the bandits rose, and offered him a glass filled with Orvieto, saying, To the health of the brave Cocometto and fair Rita. At this moment Carlini heard a woman's cry. He divined the truth, seized the glass, broke it across the face of him who presented it, and rushed toward the spot whence the cry came. After a hundred yards, he turned the corner of the thicket. He found Rita senseless in the arms of Cocometto. At sight of Carlini, Cocometto rose, a pistol in each hand. The two brigands looked at each other for a moment, the one with a smile of lasciviousness on his lips, the other with a pale of death on his brow. A terrible battle between the two men seemed imminent, but by degrees, Carlini's features relaxed, his hand, which had grasped one of the pistol in his belt, fell to his side. Rita lay between them. The moon lighted the group. Well, said Cocometto, have you executed your commission? Yes, Captain, returned Carlini. At nine o'clock tomorrow, Rita's father will be here with money. It is well. In the meantime, We'll have a merry night. This young girl is charming and does credit to your taste. 
Now, as I am not egotistical, we will return to our comrades and draw lots for her. You have determined, then, to abandon her to the common law, said Carlini. Why should an exception be made in her favor? I thought that my interest is... What right have you, any more than the rest, to ask for an exception? It is true. But never mind, continued Cocometto, laughing. Sooner or later your turn will come. Carlini's feet clinched convulsively. Now then, said Cocometto, advancing towards the other bandits. Are you coming? I follow you. Cocometto departed, without losing sight of Carlini, for, doubtless, he feared lest he should strike him unawares. But nothing betrayed the hostile design on Carlini's part. He was standing, his arms folded, near Rita, who was still insensible. Cocometto fancied for a moment the young man was about to take her in his arms and fly. But this matter little him now Rita had been Eve. And as for the money, three hundred piastres distributed among the band was so small a sum that he cared little about it. He continued to follow the path to the glade, but, to his great surprise, Carlini arrived almost as soon as himself. "'Let us draw a lot! Let us draw a lot!' cried all the brigands when they saw the chief. Their demand was fair, and the chief inclined his head in sign of acquiescence. The eyes of all shone fiercely as they made their demand, and the red light of the fire made them look like demons. The names of all, including Carlini, were placed in a hat, and the youngest of the band drew forth a ticket. The ticket bore the name of Diovolaccio. He was the man who had proposed to Carlini the health of their chief, and to whom Carlini replied by breaking the glass across his face. A large wound, extending from the temple to the mouth was bleeding profusely. Diovolaccio, seeing himself thus favored by fortune, burst into a loud laugh. Captain, said he, just now Carlini would not drink your health when I propose it to him. Propose mine to him, and let us see if he will be more condescending to you than to me. Everyone expected an explosion on Carlini's part. But to their great surprise, he took a glass in one hand and a flask in the other, and filling it. Your elf, Diovolaccio, said he calmly, as he drank it off, without his hand trembling in the least. Then, sitting down by the fire, My supper, said he, my expedition has given me an appetite. Well done, Carlini, cried the brigands. That is acting like a good fellow. And they all formed a circle round the fire, while Diovolaccio disappeared. Carlini ate and drank, as if nothing had happened. The bandits looked on with astonishment at this singular conduct until they heard footsteps. They turned round and saw Diavolaccio bearing the young girl in his arms. Her head hung back and her long hair swept the ground. As they entered the circle, the bandits could perceive by the firelight the unearthly pallor of the young girl and of Diavolaccio. This apparition was so strange and so solemn that everyone rose, with the exception of Carlini, who remained seated and ate and drank calmly. Giovolaccio advanced amidst the most profound sounds and laid Rita at the captain's feet. Then everyone could understand the cause of the unearthly pallor in the young girl and the bandit. A knife was plunged up to the hilt in Rita's left breast. Everyone looked at Carlini. The sheet of his belt was empty. Aha, said the chief, I now understand why Carlini stayed behind. All savage natures appreciate the desperate deed. No other of the bandits would perhaps have done the same, but they all understood what Carlini had done. Now then, cried Carlini, rising in his turn and approaching the corpse, his hand on the butt of one of his pistols. Does anyone dispute the possession of this woman with me? No, returned the chief. Sweet thine. Carlini raised her in his arms and carried her out of the circle of firelight. Cocometto placed his sentinels for the night, and the bandits wrapped themselves in their cloaks and lay down before the fire. At midnight, the sentinel gave the alarm, and in an instant all were on the alert. It was Rita's father, who brought his daughter's ransom in person. Here, said he to Cocometto. Here are three hundred piastres. 
Give me back my child. But the chief, without taking the money, made a sign to him to follow. The old man obeyed. They both advanced beneath the trees, through whose branches streamed the moonlight. Kukumeto stopped at last, and pointed to the persons grouped at the foot of a tree. There, said he, the man thy child of Carlini. He will tell thee what has become of her. And he returned to his companions. The old man remained motionless. He felt that some great and unforeseen misfortune hung over his head. At length he advanced toward the group, the meaning of which he could not comprehend. As he approached, Carlini raised his head, and the forms of two persons became visible to the old man's eyes. A woman lay on the ground, her head resting on the knees of a woman who was seated by her. As he raised his head, the woman's face became visible. The old man recognized his child, and Carlini recognized the old man. I expected thee, said the bandit to Rita's father. Wretch, returned the old man, what hast thou done? And he gazed with terror on Rita, pale and bloody, a knife buried in her bosom. A ray of moonlight poured through the trees and lighted up the face of the dead. Cocometo has violated thy daughter, said the bandit. I loved her, therefore I slew her, for she would have served as the sport of the old band. The old man spoke not and grew pale as death. Now, continued Carlini, if I have done wrongly, avenge her. And, withdrawing the knife from the wound in Rita's bosom, he held it out to the old man with one hand, while with the other he tore open his vest. Thou hast done well, returned the old man in a hoarse voice. Embrace me, my son. Carlini threw himself, sobbing like a child, into the arms of his mistress' father. These were the first tears the man of blood had ever wept. Now, said the old man, aid me to bury my child. Carlini fetched two pickaxes and the father and lover began to dig at the foot of a huge oak, beneath which the young girl was to repose. When the grave was formed, the father kissed her first, and then the lover. Afterwards, one taking the head, the other the feet, they placed her in the grave. Then they knelt on each side of the grave, and said the prayers of the dead. Then, when they had finished it, they cast the earth over the corpse, until the grave was filled. Then, extending his hand, the old man said, I thank you, my son, and now leave me alone. Yet, replied Carlini, leave me, I command you. Carlini obeyed, rejoined his comrades, folded himself in his cloak, and soon appeared to sleep as soundly as the rest. It had been resolved the night before to change their encampment. An hour before daybreak, Cocometo aroused his men and gave the word to march. But Carlini would not quit the forest without knowing what had become of Rita's father. He went toward the place where he had left them. He found the old man suspended from one of the branches of the oak which shaded his daughter's grave. He then took an oath of bitter vengeance over the dead body of the one and the thumb of the other. But he was unable to complete his oath, for two days afterwards, in an encounter with Roman carabiners, Carlini was killed. There was some surprise, however, that, as he was with his face to the enemy, he should have received a ball between his shoulders. That astonishment ceased when one of the brigands remarked to his comrades that Cocometo was stationed ten paces in Carlini's rear when he fell. On the morning of the departure from the forest of Fosinone, he had followed Carlini in the darkness, and heard this oath of vengeance, and, like a wise man, anticipated it. They told ten other stories of this bandit chief, each more singular than the other. Thus, from Fondi to Perusia, everyone trembles at the name of Cocometto. These narratives were frequently the theme of conversation between Luigi and Teresa. The young girl trembled very much at hearing the stories, but Vampa reassured her with a smile, tapping the butt of his good falling piece, which threw its ball so well. And if that did not restore her courage, he pointed to a crow, perched on some dead branch, took aim, touched the trigger, and the bird fell dead at the foot of the tree. Time passed on, and the two young people had agreed to be married when Vampa should be twenty and three is nineteen years of age. They were both orphans, and had only their employers leave to ask 
which had been already thought and obtained. One day, when they were talking over their plans for the future, they heard two or three reports of firearms, and then suddenly a man came out of the wood, near which the two young persons used to graze their flocks, and hurried towards them. When he came within hearing, he exclaimed, "'I'm pursued! Can you conceal me?' They knew full well that this fugitive must be abandoned. But there is an inmate sympathy between the Roman brigand and Roman peasant, and the latter is always ready to aid the former. Vampa, without saying a word, hastened to the stone that closed up the entrance of their grotto, drew it away, made a sign to the fugitive to take refuge there, in a retreat unknown to everyone, closed the stone upon him, and then went and resumed his seat by Teresa. Instantly afterwards four carabiners, on horseback, appeared on the edge of the wood, Three of them appeared to be looking for the fugitive, while the fourth dragged the regret prisoner by the neck. The three carabiners looked about carefully on every side, saw the young peasants, and galloping up, began to question them. They had seen no one. "'That is very annoying,' said the brigadier, "'for the man we are looking for is the chief. Cucumeto!' cried Luigi and Teresa at the same moment. "'Yes!' replied the brigadier, and, as his head is valued at a thousand Roman crowns, there would have been five hundred for you, if you had helped us to catch him. The two young persons exchanged looks. The brigadier had a moment's hope. Five hundred Roman crowns are three thousand lira, and three thousand lira are fortune for two poor orphans who are going to be married. Yes, it is very annoying, said Vampa, but we have not seen him. Then the carabineers scoured the country in different directions, but in vain. Then, after a time, they disappeared. Vampa then removed the stone, and Cocometo came out. Through the crevices in the granite he had seen the two young peasants talking with the carabineers, and guessed the subject of that parley. He had read in the countenances of Luigi and Teresa their steadfast resolution not to surrender him, and he drew from his pocket a purse full of gold, which he offered to them. But Vampa raised his head proudly. As to Teresa, her eyes sparkled when she thought of all the fine gowns and gay jewelry she could buy with this purse of gold. Cucumeta was a cunning fiend, and had assumed the form of the brigand instead of a serpent, and this look from Teresa showed him that she was a worthy daughter of Eve, and he returned to the forest, pausing several times on his way under the pretext of saluting his protectors. Several days elapsed, and they neither saw nor heard of Cocometto. The time of the carnival was at hand. The Count of San Feliz announced a grand masked ball, to which all that were distinguished in Rome were invited. Teresa had a great desire to see this ball. Luigi asked permission of his protector, the steward, that she and he might be presented amongst the servants of the house. This was granted. The ball was given by the Count for the particular pleasure of his daughter, Carmela, whom he adored. Carmela was precisely the age and figure of Teresa, and Teresa was as handsome as Carmela. On the evening of the ball, Teresa was attired in their best, her most brilliant ornaments in her hair, and gayest glass beds. She was in the costume of the woman of Frascati. Luigi wore the very picturesque garb of the Roman peasant at holiday time. They both mingled as they had lived to do, with the servants and peasants. The festival was magnificent. Not only was the villa brilliantly illuminated, but thousands of colored lanterns were suspended from the trees in the garden, and very soon the palace overflowed to the terraces and the terraces to the garden walks. At each course path was an orchestra, and tables spread with refreshments. The guests stopped, formed quadrilles, and danced in any part of the grounds they pleased. Carmela was attired like a woman of Sonino. Her cap was embroidered with pearls, the pins in her hair were of gold and diamonds, her girdle was of turkey silk, with large embroidered flowers, her bodice and skirt were of cashmere, her apron of Indian muslin, and the buttons of her corset were of jewels. Two of her companions were dressed, the one as a woman of Natuno, and the other as a woman of Laricia. Four young men of the richest and noblest families of Rome accompanied them with that Italian freedom which has not its parallel in any other country in the world. 
they were charged as peasants of Albano, Valitri, Civita Castella, and Sora. We need hardly add that these peasant costumes, like those of the young men, were brilliant with gold and jewels. Carmela wished for a quadrille, but there was one lady wanting. Carmela looked all round her, but no one of the guests had a costume similar to her own, or those of her companions. The Count of San Felice pointed out Teresa, who was hanging on Luigi's arm in a group of peasants. Will you allow me, father? said Carmela. Certainly, replied the Count. Are you not in carnival time? Carmela turned towards the young man who was talking with her, and saying a few words to him, pointed with her finger to Teresa. The young man looked, bowed in obedience, and then went to Teresa and invited her to dance in a quadrille directed by the Count's daughter. Teresa felt a flush pass over her face. She looked at Luigi, who could not refuse his assent. Luigi slowly relinquished Teresa's arm, which he had held beneath his own, and Teresa, accompanied by their elegant cavalier, took her appointed place with much hesitation in the aristocratic quadrille. Certainly, in the eyes of an artist, the exact and strict costume of Teresa had a very different character from that of Carmela and her companions, and Teresa was frivolous and coquettish, and thus the embroidery and muslims, the cashmere waist girls, all dazzled her, and the reflection of sapphires and diamonds almost turned her giddy brain. Luigi felt the sensation he threw so unknowing horizon in his mind. It was like an acute pain which clung at his heart, and then thrilled through his whole body. He followed with his eye each movement of Teresa and her cavalier. When their hands touched, he felt as though he should swan. Every pulse beat with violence, and it seemed as though a bell were ringing in his ears. When they spoke, although Teresa listened timidly and with downcast eyes to the conversation of her cavalier, as Luigi could read in the hard looks of the good-looking young man that his language was that of praise, it seemed as if the whole world was turning round with him, and all the voices of hell were whispering in his ear ideas of murder and assassination. Then, fearing that his paroxysms might get the better of him, he clutched with one hand the branch of a tree against which he was leaning, and with the other convulsively grasped the dagger with the carved handle which was in his belt, and which, unwittingly, he drew from the scabbard from time to time. Luigi was jealous. He felt that, influenced by her ambitions and coquettish disposition, Teresa might escape him. The young peasant girl, at first timid and scared, soon recovered herself. We have said that Teresa was handsome, but this is not all. Teresa was endowed with all those wild graces which are so much more potent than our affected and studied elegancies. She had almost all the honors of the quadrille and if she were envious of the Count San Felice's daughter, we will not undertake to say that Carmela was not jealous of her. And with overpowering compliments, her handsome cavalier led her back to the place whence he had taken her and where Luigi awaited her. Twice or thrice during the dance the young girl had glanced at Luigi, and each time she saw that he was pale and that his features were agitated. Once even the blade of his knife, half drawn from his shed, had dazzled her eyes with his sinister glare. Thus, it was almost tremblingly that she resumed her lover's arm. The quadrille had been most perfect, and it was evident there was a great demand for repetition, Carmela alone objecting to it, but the Count of St. Felice beside his daughter so earnestly that she acceded. One of the cavaliers then hastened to invite Teresa, without whom it was impossible for the quadrille to be formed, but the young girl had disappeared. The truth was that Luigi had not felt strength to support another such trial, and, half by persuasion and half by force, he had removed Teresa towards another part of the garden. Teresa had yelled in spite of herself, but when she looked at the agitated countenance of the young man, she understood by his silence and trembling voice that something strange was passing within him. She herself was not exempt from internal emotion, and, without having done anything wrong, yet fully comprehended that Luigi was right in reproaching her. Why, she did not know, but yet she did not the less feel that these reproaches were merited. However, 
To Teresa's great astonishment, Luigi remained mute, and not a word escaped his lips the rest of the evening. When the chill of night had driven away the guests from the gardens, and the gates of the villa were closed on them for the fast indoors, he took Teresa quite away, and as he left her at her home, he said, Teresa, what were you thinking of as you danced opposite the young Countess of San Feliz? I thought, replied the young girl with all the frankness of her nature, that I would give half my life for a costume such as you wore. And what said your cavalier to you? He said it only depended on myself to have it, and I had only one word to say. He was right, said Luigi. Do you desire it as ardently as you say? Yes. Well, then, you shall have it. The young girl, must astonished, raised her head to look at him, but his face was so gloomy and terrible that her words froze to her lips. As Luigi spoke thus, he left her. Teresa followed him with her eyes into the darkness as long as she could, and when he had quite disappeared, she went into the house with a sight. That night a memorable event occurred, due no doubt to the imprudence of some servant who had neglected to extinguish the lights. The villa of San Felice took fire in the rooms adjoining the very apartment of the lovely Carmela. Awakened in the night by the night, awakened in the night by the light of the flames, she sprang out of bed wrapped herself in a dressing gown and attempting to escape by the door, but the corridor by which she hoped to fly was already a prey to the flames. She then returned to her room, calling for help as loudly as she could, when suddenly her window, which was twenty feet from the ground, was opened. A young peasant jumped into the chamber, seized her in his arms, and with superhuman skill and strength conveyed her to the turf at the grass plot, where she fainted. When she recovered, her father was by her side. All the servants surrounded her, offering her assistance. An entire wing of the villa was burned down. But what of that, as long as Carmel was safe and uninjured? Her preservers everywhere sought for, but he did not appear. He was inquired after, but no one had seen him. Carmela was greatly troubled that she had not recognized him. As the Count was immensely rich, excepting the danger Carmela had run, and the marvellous manner in which he had escaped, made that appear to him rather a favour of providence than a real misfortune. The loss occasioned by the conflagration was to him but a trifle. The next day, at the usual hour, the two young peasants were on the borders of the floors. Luigi arrived first. He came toward Teresa in high spirits, and seemed to have completely forgotten the events of the previous evening. The young girl was very pensive, but seeing Luigi so cheerful, she on her part assumed a smiling air, which was natural to her when she was not excited or in a passion. Luigi took her arm beneath his own and led her to the door of the grotto. Then he paused. The young girl, perceiving that there was something extraordinary, looked at him steadfastly. Teresa, said Luigi. Yesterday evening you told me you would give all the world to have a costume similar to that of the Count's daughter. Yes, replied Teresa with astonishment, but it was meant to utter such a wish. And I replied, very well, you shall have it. Yes, replied the young girl, whose astonishment increased at every word uttered by Luigi. But of course your reply was only to please me. I have promised no more than I have given you, Teresa, said Luigi proudly. Go into the grotto and dress yourself. At this word she drew away the stone and showed Teresa the grotto, lighted up by two wax lights, which burned on half side of a splendid mirror. On a rustic table, made by Luigi, were spread out the pearl necklace and the diamond pins, and on a chair at the side was laid the rest of the costume. Teresa uttered a cry of joy, and, without inquiring whence this attire came, or even thanking Luigi, darted into the grotto, transformed into a dressing room. Luigi pushed stone behind her, for on the crest of a small adjacent hill, which cut off the view towards Palestrina, he saw a traveller on, on horseback, stopping a moment, as if uncertain of his road, and thus presenting against the blue sky that perfect outline which is peculiar to distant objects in southern climes. 
When he saw Luigi, he put his horse into a gallop and advanced towards him. Luigi was not mistaken. The traveller, who was going from Palestrina to Tivoli, had mistaken his way. The young man directed him, but, as at the distance of a quarter of a mile the road again divided into three ways, and on reaching this the traveller might again stray from his route, he begged Luigi to be his guide. Luigi threw his cloak on the ground, placed his carbine on his shoulder, and freed from his heavy covering, proceeded the traveller with the rapid steep of a mountainer, which a horse can scarcely keep up with. In ten minutes Luigi and the traveller reached the crossroads. On arriving there, with an air as majestic as that of an emperor, he stretched his hand towards that one of the roads which the traveller was to follow. That is a road, Excellency, and now you cannot again mistake. And here is your recompense, said the traveller, offering the young herdsman some small pieces of money. Thank you, said Luigi, drawing back his hand. I render a service, I'd not sell it. Well, replied the traveller, who seemed used to this difference between the servility of a man of the cities and the pride of the mountaineer. If you refuse wages, you will perhaps accept a gift? Ah, oh, yes, that is another thing. Then, said the traveller, take these two Venetian sequins and give them to your bride, to make herself a pair of earrings. And then you take this poniard, said the young herdsman. You'll not find one better card between Albano and Civita Castellana. I accept it, answered the traveller. But then the obligation will be on my side, for this poniard is worth more than two sequins. For a dealer, perhaps. But for me... Who engraved it myself, it is hardly worth a piastre. What is your name? inquired the traveller. Luigi Vampa, replied the shepherd, with the same air as he would have replied Alexander, King of Macedon. And yours? I, said the traveller, am called Simbad the Sailor. Franz de Pinay started with surprise. Simbad the Sailor, he said. Yes, replied the narrator. That was the name which the traveller gave to Vampa as his own. Well, and what may you have to say against this name? inquired Albert. It is a very pretty name, and the adventures of the gentleman of that name amused me very much in my youth, I must confess. Franz said no more. The name of Simbad the sailor, as may well be supposed, awakened in him a world of recollections, as had the name of Count of Monte Cristo on the previous evening. Proceed, said he to the host. Vampa put two sequins hotly in his pocket, and slowly returned by the way he had gone. As he came within three or three hundred paces of the grotto, he thought he heard a cry. He listened to know whence this sound could proceed. A moment afterwards, he thought he heard his own name pronounced distinctly. The cry proceeded from the grotto. He bounded like a chamois, cocking his carbine as he went, and in a moment reached the summit of a hill opposite to that on which he had perceived the traveller. Three cries for help came more distinctly to his ear. He cast his eyes around him and saw a man carrying off Teresa, as Nessos, the centaur, carried Janira. This man, who was hastening towards the wood, was already three-quarters of the way on the road from the grotto to the forest. Vampa measured the distance. The man was at least two hundred paces in advance of him, and there was not a chance of overtaking him. The young shepherd stopped, as if his feet had been rooted to the ground. Then he put the butt of his carving to his shoulder, took him a ravisher, followed him for a second in his track, and then fired. The ravisher stopped suddenly. His knees bent under him, and he fell with Teresa in his arms. The young girl rose instantly, but the man lay on the earth struggling in the agonies of death. Vampa then rushed towards Teresa, for at ten paces from the dying man her legs had failed her, and she had dropped on her knees, so that the young man feared that the ball that had brought down his enemy had also wounded his betrothed. Fortunately, she was unscathed, and it was fright alone that had overcome Teresa. When Luigi had assured himself that she was safe and unharmed, he turned towards the wounded man. He had just expired with clenched hands, his mouth in a spasm of agony, and his hair on end in sweat of death. 
His eyes remained open and menacing. Vampa approached the corpse and recognized Cocometto. From the day on which the bandit had been saved by the two young peasants, he had been enamored of Teresa, and had sworn she should be his. From that time he had watched them, and profiting by the moment when her lover had left her alone, had carried her off, and believed he at length had her in his power, when the ball, directed by the unerring skill of the young herdsman, had pierced his heart. Vamp gazed on him for a moment without betraying the slightest emotion, while, on the contrary, Teresa, shuddering in every limb, dared not approach the slain ruffian but by the grease, and threw a hesitating glance at that body over the shoulder of her lover. Suddenly Vampa turned towards his mistress. Ha! Ah, said he. Good, good. You are dressed. It is now my turn to dress myself. Teresa was clothed from head to foot in the garb of the Count of San Felice's daughter. Vampa took Cocometto's body in his arms and conveyed it to the grotto, while in her turn Teresa remained outside. If a second traveler had passed, it would have seen a strange thing, a shepherdess watching her flock, clad in a cashmere gown, with earrings and necklaces of pearls, diamond pins, and button sapphires, emeralds and rubies. He would, no doubt, have believed that he had returned to the times of Florian, and would have declared, on reaching Paris, that he had met an alpine shepherdess seated at the foot of the Sabine Hill. At the end of a quarter of an hour, Vampa quitted the grotto. His costume was no less elegant than that of Teresa. He wore a vest of garnet-colored velvet, with buttons of cut gold, a silk waistcoat covered with embroidery, a Roman scarf tied round his neck, a cartridge box worked with gold and red and green silk, sky-blue velvet breeches, fastened above the knee with diamond buckles, garters of deerskin, worked with a thousand arabesques, and a hat wherein hung ribbons of all colors. Two watches hung from his girdle, and a splendid poniard was in his belt. Teresa uttered a cry of admiration. A vampire in this attire resembled a painting by Leopold Robert or Schnetz. He had assumed the entire costume of Cocometto. The young man saw the effect produced on his betrothed, and the smell of pride passed over his lips. Now, he said to Teresa, are you ready to share my fortune, whatever it may be? Oh, yes, exclaimed the young girl enthusiastically. And follow me wherever I go? To the world's end. Then take my arm and let us on. We have no time to lose. The young girl did so without questioning her lover as to where he was conducting her, for he appeared to her at this moment as handsome, proud and powerful as a god. They went toward the forest and soon entered it. We need scarcely say that all the paths of the mountain were known to Vampa. He therefore went forth without a moment's hesitation, although there was no beaten track, but he knew his path by looking at trees and bushes, and thus they kept on advancing for nearly an hour and a half. At the end of this time they had reached the thickest of the forest. A torrent, whose bed was dry, led into a deep gorge. Vampa took this wild road, which, enclosed between two ridges, and shadowed by the two-fifth umbrage of the pines, seemed, but for the difficulties of its descent, that path to a vernus of which Virgil speaks. Teresa had become alarmed at the wild and deserted look of the plain around her, and pressed closely against her guide, not uttering a syllable. But, as she saw in advance with even step and composed countenance, she endeavored to repress her emotion. Suddenly, about ten paces from them, a man advanced from behind a tree and aimed at Vampa. Not another step, he said, or you are a dead man. What then? said Vampa, raising his hand with a gesture of disdain, while Teresa, no longer able to restrain her alarm, clung closely to him. Do wolves friend each other? Who are you? inquired Sentinel. I am Luigi Vampa, shepherd of the San Felice farm. What do you want? I would speak with your companions who are in the glade at Rocca Bianca. Follow me then, said the sentinel. Or as you know your way, go first. Vampa smiled disdainfully at this precaution on the part of the bandit, 
went before Teresa and continued to advance with the same firm and easy step as before. At the end of ten minutes, the bandit made him a sign to stop. The two young persons obeyed. Then, the bandit's thrice imitated the cry of a crow. A croak answered this signal. Good, said the sentry. You may now go on. Luigi and Teresa again set forward. As they went on, Teresa clung trembling to her lover at sight of weapons and the glistening of carbines through the trees. The retreat of Rocca Bianca was at the top of a small mountain, which no doubt in former days had been a volcano. An extinct volcano before the days when Ramos and Romulus had deserted Alba to come and found the city of Rome. Teresa and Luigi reached the summit and all at once found themselves in the presence of twenty bandits. "'Here is a young man who seeks and wishes to speak to you,' said the sentinel. "'What has he to say?' inquired the young man who was in command in the chief's absence. "'I wish to say that I am tired of a shepherd's life,' was Vampa's reply. "'Ha, ah, I understand,' said the lieutenant. "'And you seek admittance into our ranks?' "'Welcome!' cried several bandits from Ferrozino, Pampinara and Danini, who had recognized Luigi Vampa. "'Yes, but I came to ask something more than to be your companion.' "'And what may that be?' inquired the bandits with astonishment. "'I come to ask to be your captain,' said the young man. The bandits shouted with laughter. "'What have you done to aspire to this honor? demanded the lieutenant. I have killed your chief, Cocometo, whose dress I now wear, and I set fire to the Villa San Feliz to procure a wedding dress for my betrothed. An hour afterwards, Luigi Vampo was chosen captain, Vice Cocometo deceased. Well, my dear Albert, said Franz, turning towards his friends, what think you of citizen Luigi Vampa? I say he is a myth, replied Albert, and never had an existence. And what may a myth be? inquired Pastrini. The explanation will be too long, my dear landlord, replied Franz. And you say that Signor Vampa exercises his profession at this moment in the environs of Rome, and with a boldness of which no bandit before him ever gave an example. Then the police have vainly tried to lay hands on him. Why, you see, he has a good understanding with shepherds in the plains, the fishermen of the Tiber, and the smugglers of the coast. They seek for him in the mountains, and he is on the waters. They follow him on the waters, and he is on the open sea. Then they pursue him, and he has suddenly taken refuge in the islands, at Giglio, Guanajuato, or Monte Cristo. And when they hunt for him there, he reappears suddenly at Albano, Tivoli, or La Riccia. And how does he behave towards travelers? Halos, his plan is very simple. It depends on the distance he may be from the city, whether he keeps eight hours, twelve hours, or a day within to pay the ransom. And when that time has elapsed, he allows another hour's grace. At sixtieth minutes of this hour, if the money is not forthcoming, he blows out the prisoner's brains with a pistol shot, or plants his dagger in his heart, and that settles the account. Well, Albert, inquired Franz of his companion, are you still disposed to go to the Colosseum by the outer wall? Quite so, said Albert, if the way be picturesque. The clock struck nine as the door opened and the coachman appeared. Excellencies, said he, the coach is ready. Well then, said Franz, let us to the Colosseum. By the Porta del Popolo or by the street, Your Excellencies? By the street, Marlowe, by the street, cried Franz. Ah, my dear fellow, said Albert, rising and lighting his third cigar. Really, I thought you had more courage. So saying, the two young men went down the staircase and got into the carriage. End of chapter 33《ハプトゥーのアルテクストゥーアレクサンドゥーゥーマゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥーゥー
For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Anka in Mannheim, Germany, November 2010. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 33 Roman Bandits. The next morning, Franz woke first and instantly rang the bell. The sound had not yet died away when Signor Pastrini himself entered. "'Well, Excellency,' said the landlord triumphantly, and without waiting for Franz to question him, "'I feared yesterday, when I would not promise you anything, that you were too late. There is not a single carriage to be had. That is, for the last three days of the carnival.' "'Yes,' returned Franz, "'for the very three days it is most needed.' "'What is the matter?' said Albert, entering. "'No carriage to be had?' "'Just so,' returned Franz. "'You have guessed it.' "'Well, your eternal city is a nice sort of place.' "'That is to say, Excellency,' replied Pastrini, "'who was desirous of keeping up the dignity of the capital of the Christian world "'in the eyes of his guests, "'that there are no carriages to be had from Sunday to Tuesday evening, "'but from now till Sunday you can have fifty, if you please.' "'Ah, that is something,' said Albert. "'Today is Thursday, and who knows what may arrive between this and Sunday.' Ten or twelve thousand travellers will arrive, replied Franz, which will make it still more difficult. My friend, said Monserf, let us enjoy the present without gloomy forebodings for the future. At least we can have a window. Where? In the Corso. Ah, a window, exclaimed Signor Pastrini. Utterly impossible. There was only one left on the fifth floor of the Doria Palace, and that has been led to a Russian prince for twenty sequins a day. The two young men looked at each other with an air of stupefaction. Well, said Franz to Albert, do you know what is the best thing we can do? It is to pass the carnival at Venice. There we are sure of obtaining gondolas if we cannot have carriages. Ah, the devil, no, cried Albert. I came to Rome to see the carnival, and I will, though I see it on stilts. Bravo! An excellent idea. We will disguise ourselves as monster Pocinellos or shepherds of the Lond, and we shall have complete success. Do your Excellency still wish for a carriage from now to Sunday morning? Parbleu, said Albert. Do you think we are going to run about on foot in the streets of Rome like lawyers' clerks? I hasten to comply with your Excellency's wishes. Only, I tell you beforehand, the carriage will cost you six piastres a day. And, as I am not a millionaire like the gentleman in the next apartments, said Franz, I warn you that as I have been four times before at Rome, I know the prices of all the carriages. We will give you twelve piastres for today, tomorrow, and the day after, and then you will make a good profit. But, Excellency, said Pastrini, still striving to gain his point. Now go, returned Franz, or I shall go myself and bargain with your affettatore, who is mine also. He is an old friend of mine, who has plundered me pretty well already, and, in the hope of making more out of me, he will take a less prize than the one I offer you. You will lose the preference, and that will be your fault. Do not give yourselves the trouble, Excellency, returned Signor Pastrini, with a smile peculiar to the Italian speculator when he confesses defeat. I will do all I can, and I hope you will be satisfied. And now we understand each other. When do you wish the carriage to be here? In an hour. In an hour it will be at the door. An hour after the vehicle was at the door. It was a hack conveyance which was elevated to the rank of a private carriage in honour of the occasion. But, in spite of its humble exterior, the young men would have thought themselves happy to have secured it for the last three days of the carnival. Excellency, cried the Cicerone, seeing Franz approach the window, shall I bring the carriage nearer to the palace? Accustomed as Franz was to the Italian phraseology, his first impulse was to look round him, but these words were addressed to him. Franz was the Excellency, the vehicle was the carriage, and the Hotel de Londres was the palace. The genius for laudation characteristic of the race was in that phrase. Franz and Albert descended, the carriage approached the palace, their Excellencies stretched their legs along the seats, the Cicerone sprang into the seat behind. Where do your excellencies wish to go? asked he. To St. Peter's first, and then to the Colosseum, returned Albert. But Albert did not know that it takes a day to see St. Peter's, and a month to study it. The day was passed at St. Peter's alone. Suddenly the daylight began to fade away. Franz took out his watch. 
It was half past four. They returned to the hotel. At the door, Franz ordered the coachman to be ready at eight. He wished to show Albert the Colosseum by moonlight, as he had shown him St. Peter's by daylight. When we show a friend a city one has already visited, we feel the same pride as when we point out a woman whose lover we have been. He was to leave the city by the Porta del Popolo, skirt the outer wall, and re-enter by the Porta San Giovanni. Thus they would behold the Colosseum without finding their impressions dulled by the first looking on the Capitol, the Forum, the Arch of Septimus Severus, the Temple of Antoninus and Faustina, and the Via Sacra. They sat down to dinner. Signor Pastrini had promised them a banquet. He gave them a tolerable repast. At the end of the dinner he entered in person. Franz thought that he came to hear his dinner praised, and began accordingly, but at the first words he was interrupted. "'Excellency,' said Pastrini, "'I am delighted to have your approbation, but it was not for that I came.' "'Did you come to tell us you have procured a carriage?' asked Albert, lighting his cigar. "'No, and your excellencies will do well not to think of that any longer. At Rome things can or cannot be done. When you are told anything cannot be done, there is an end of it.' It is much more convenient at Paris. When anything cannot be done, you pay double, and it is done directly. That is what all the French say, returned Signor Pastrini, somewhat piqued. For that reason, I do not understand why they travel. Bud, said Albert, emitting a volume of smoke and balancing his chair on its hind legs. Only madmen, or blockheads like us, ever do travel. Men in their senses do not quit their hotel in the Rue du Helder, their walk on the Boulevard de Gand and the Café de Paris. It is of course understood that Albert resided in the aforesaid street, appeared every day on the fashionable walk, and dined frequently at the only restaurant where you can really dine, that is, if you are on good terms with its frequenters. Signor Pastrini remained silent a short time. It was evident that he was musing over this answer, which did not seem very clear. But, said Franz, in his turn interrupting his host's meditations, you had some motive for coming here. May I beg to know what it was? Ah, yes, you have ordered your carriage at eight o'clock precisely. I have. You intend visiting El Colosseo? You mean the Colosseum? It is the same thing. You have told your coachman to leave the city by the Porta del Popolo, to drive round the walls, and re-enter by the Porta San Giovanni? These are my words exactly. Well, this route is impossible. Impossible? Very dangerous, to say the least. Dangerous? And why? On account of the famous Luigi Vampa. Pray, who may this famous Luigi Vampa be? inquired Albert. He may be very famous at Rome, but I can assure you he is quite unknown at Paris. What? Do you not know him? I have not that honour. You have never heard his name? Never. Well, then, he is a bandit, compared to whom the Descaris and Gasparones were mere children. Now then, Albert, cried Franz, here is a bandit for you at last. I forewarn you, Signor Pastrini, that I shall not believe one word of what you are going to tell us. Having told you this, begin. Once upon a time. Well, go on. Signor Pastrini turned toward Franz, who seemed to him the more reasonable of the two. We must do him justice. He had had a great many Frenchmen in this house, but he had never been able to comprehend them. Excellency, said he gravely, addressing Franz, if you look upon me as a liar, it is useless for me to say anything. It was for your interest. Albert does not say you are a liar, Signor Pastrini, said Franz, but that he will not believe what you are going to tell us. But I will believe all you say, so proceed. But if your excellency doubts my veracity... Signor Pastrini, returned Franz, you are more susceptible than Cassandra, who was a prophetess, and yet no one believed her, while you, at least, are sure of the credence of half your audience. Come, sit down, and tell us all about this Signor Vampa. I had told your excellency he is the most famous bandit we have had since the days of Mastrilla. Well, what has this bandit to do with the order I have given the coachman to leave the city by the Porta del Popolo and to re-enter by the Porta San Giovanni? This, replied Signor Pastrini, that you will go out by one, but I very much doubt your returning by the other. Why? asked Franz. Because after nightfall you are not safe fifty yards from the gates. On your honour is that true? cried Albert. Count, 
returned Signor Pastrini, hurt at Albert's repeated doubts of the truth of his assertions. I do not say this to you, but to your companion, who knows Rome, and knows too that these things are not to be laughed at. My dear fellow, said Albert, turning to Franz, here is an admirable adventure. We will fill our carriage with pistols, blunderbusses, and double-barreled guns. Luigi Vampa comes to take us, and we take him. We bring him back to Rome, and present him to His Holiness the Pope, who asks how he can repay so great a service, and we merely ask for a carriage, and a pair of horses, and we see the carnival in the carriage, and doubtless the Roman people will crown us at the Capitol, and proclaim us, like Curtius and the Veiled Horatius, the preservers of their country. Whilst Albert proposed this scheme, Signor Pastrini's face assumed an expression impossible to describe. And pray, asked Franz, where are these pistols, blunderbusses, and other deadly weapons with which you intend filling the carriage? Not out of my armory, for at Terracina I was plundered even of my hunting knife. I shared the same fate at Aqua Pendente. Do you know, Signor Pastrini, said Albert, lighting a second cigar at the first, that this practice is very convenient for bandits? and that it seems to be due to an arrangement of their own. Doubtless Signor Pastrini found this pleasantry compromising, for he only answered half the question, and then he spoke to Franz, as the only one likely to listen with attention. Your Excellency knows that it is not customary to defend yourself when attacked by bandits. What? cried Albert, whose courage revolted at the idea of being plundered tamely. Not make any resistance? No, for it would be useless. What could you do against a dozen bandits who spring out of some pit, ruin, or aqueduct, and level their pieces at you? Eh, parbleu, they should kill me. The innkeeper turned to Franz with an air that seemed to say, Your friend is decidedly mad. My dear Albert, returned Franz, your answer is sublime, and worthy the let him die of Corneille. Only when Horace made that answer, the safety of Rome was concerned. But, as for us, it is only to gratify a whim, and it would be ridiculous to risk our lives for so foolish a motive. Albert poured himself out a glass of lacrima Christi, which he sipped at intervals, muttering some unintelligible words. Well, Signor Pastrini, said Franz, now that my companion is quieted, and you have seen how peaceful my intentions are, tell me who is this Luigi Vampa? Is he a shepherd or a nobleman, young or old, tall or short? Describe him, in order that, if we meet him by chance, like Bagabu John or Lara, we may recognize him. You could not apply to any one better able to inform you on all these points, for I knew him when he was a child, and one day that I fell into his hands, going from Ferentino to Alatri, he, fortunately for me, recollected me and set me free, not only without ransom, but made me a present of a very splendid watch, and related his history to me. Let us see the watch, said Albert. Signor Pastrini drew from his fob a magnificent briquet, bearing the name of its maker, of Parisian manufacture, and a count's coronet. Here it is, said he. Pest, returned Albert. I compliment you on it. I have its fellow. He took his watch from his waistcoat pocket, and it cost me three thousand francs. Let us hear the history, said Franz, motioning Signor Pastrini to seat himself. Your Excellency's permitted? asked the host. Pardieu, cried Albert, you are not a preacher to remain standing. The host sat down, after having made each of them a respectful bow, which meant that he was ready to tell them all they wished to know concerning Luigi Vampa. You tell me, said Franz, at the moment Signor Pastrini was about to open his mouth, that you knew Luigi Vampa when he was a child. He is still a young man then. A young man? He is only two and twenty. He will gain himself a reputation. What do you think of that, Albert, at two and twenty to be thus famous? Yes, and at his age, Alexander, Caesar, and Napoleon, who have all made some noise in the world, were quite behind him. So, continued Franz, the hero of this history is only two and twenty. Scarcely so much. Is he tall or short? Of the middle height, about the same stature as His Excellency, returned to the host, pointing to Albert. Thanks for the comparison, said Albert, with a bow. Go on, Signor Pastrini, continued Franz, smiling at his friend's susceptibility. To what class of society does he belong? He was a shepherd boy attached to the farm of the Count of San Felice, situated between Palestrina and the Lake of Gabri. 
He was born at Pampinara and entered the Count's service when he was five years old. His father was also a shepherd, who owned a small flock, and lived by the wool and the milk, which he sold at Rome. When quite a child, the little vampire displayed a most extraordinary precocity. One day, when he was seven years old, he came to the curate of Palestrina, and asked to be taught to read. It was somewhat difficult, for he could not quit his flock, but the good curate went every day to say mass at a little hamlet too poor to pay a priest, and which, having no other name, was called Borgo. He told Luigi that he might meet him on his return, and that then he would give him a lesson, warning him that it would be short, and that he must profit as much as possible by it. The child accepted joyfully. Every day Luigi led his flock to graze on the road that leads from Palestrina to Borgo. Every day, at nine o'clock in the morning, the priest and the boy sat down on a bank by the wayside, and the little shepherd took his lesson out of the priest's breviary. At the end of three months he had learned to read. This was not enough. He must now learn to write. The priest had a writing teacher at Rome make three alphabets, one large, one middling, and one small, and pointed out to him that by the help of a sharp instrument he could trace the letters on a slate, and thus learn to write. The same evening, when the flock was safe at the farm, the little Luigi hastened to the smith at Palestrina, took a large nail, heated and sharpened it, and formed a sort of stylus. The next morning he gathered an armful of pieces of slate and began. At the end of three months he had learned to write. The curate, astonished at his quickness and intelligence, made him a present of pens, paper, and a penknife. This demanded new effort, but nothing compared to the first, and at the end of a week he wrote as well with his pen as with a stylus. The curate related the incident to the Count of San Felice, who sent for the little shepherd, made him read and write before him, ordered his attendant to let him eat with the domestics, and to give him two piastres a month. With this Luigi purchased books and pencils. He applied his imitative powers to everything, and like Giotto, when young, he drew on his slate sheep, houses, and trees. Then, with his knife, he began to carve all sorts of objects in wood. It was thus that Pinelli, the famous sculptor, had commenced. A girl of six or seven, that is, a little younger than Vampa, tended sheep on a farm near Palestrina. She was an orphan, born at Valmontone, and was named Teresa. The two children met, sat down near each other, let their flocks mingle together, played, laughed, and conversed together. In the evening they separated the Count of San Felice's flock from those of Baron Cervetti, and the children returned to their respective farms, promising to meet the next morning. The next day they kept their word, and thus they grew up together. Vampa was twelve, and Teresa eleven and yet their natural disposition revealed itself. Beside his taste for the fine arts, which Luigi had carried as far as he could in his solitude, he was given to alternating fits of sadness and enthusiasm, was often angry and capricious, and always sarcastic. None of the lads of Pampinara, Palestrina, or Valmontone had been able to gain any influence over him, or even to become his companion. His disposition, always inclined to exact concessions rather than to make them, kept him aloof from all friendships. Teresa alone ruled by a look, a word, a gesture, this impetuous character, which yielded beneath the hand of a woman, and which beneath the hand of a man might have broken, but could never have been bended. Teresa was lively and gay, but coquettish to excess. The two piastres that Luigi received every month from the Count of San Felice's steward, and the price of all the little carvings in wood he sold at Rome, were expended in earrings, necklaces, and gold hairpins. So that, thanks to her friend's generosity, Teresa was the most beautiful and the best attired peasant near Rome. The two children grew up together, passing all their time with each other, and giving themselves up to the wild ideas of their different characters. Thus in all their dreams, their wishes, and their conversations, Vampa saw himself the captain of a vessel, general of an army, or governor of a province. Teresa saw herself rich, superbly attired, and attended by a train of livery domestics. Then, when they had thus passed the day in building castles in the air, they separated their flocks and descended from the elevation of their dreams to the reality of their humble position. One day the young shepherd told the Count's steward that he had seen a wolf come out of the Sabine mountains and prowl around his flock. 
The steward gave him a gun. This was what Vampa longed for. This gun had an excellent barrel, made at Brescia, and carrying a ball with the precision of an English rifle. But one day the Count broke the stock, and had then cast the gun aside. This, however, was nothing to a sculptor like Vampa. He examined the broken stock, calculated what change it would require to adapt the gun to his shoulder, and made a fresh stock, so beautifully carved that it would have fetched fifteen or twenty piastres had he chosen to sell it. But nothing could be further from his thoughts. For a long time a gun had been the young man's greatest ambition. In every country where independence has taken the place of liberty, the first desire of a manly heart is to possess a weapon, which at once renders him capable of defence or attack, and, by rendering its owner terrible, often makes him feared. From this moment Vampa devoted all his leisure time to perfecting himself in the use of his precious weapon. He purchased powder and ball, and everything served him for a mark. The trunk of some old and moss-grown olive tree, that grew on the Sabine mountains, the fox as he quitted his earth on some marauding excursion, the eagle that soared above their heads, and thus he soon became so expert that Teresa overcame the terror she had first felt at the report, and amused herself by watching him direct the ball wherever he pleased, with as much accuracy as if he placed it by hand. One evening a wolf emerged from a pine wood, near which they were usually stationed, but the wolf had scarcely advanced ten yards ere he was dead. Proud of this exploit, a vampire took the dead animal on his shoulders and carried him to the farm. These exploits had gained Luigi considerable reputation. The man of superior abilities always finds admirers, go where he will. He was spoken of as the most adroit, the strongest, and the most courageous contadino for ten leagues around. And although Teresa was universally allowed to be the most beautiful girl of the Sabines, no one had ever spoken to her of love, because it was known that she was beloved by Vampa. And yet the two young people had never declared their affection. They had grown together like two trees whose roots are mingled, whose branches intertwined, and whose intermingled perfume rises to the heavens. Only their wish to see each other had become a necessity, and they would have preferred death to a day's separation. Teresa was sixteen and Vampa seventeen. About this time a band of brigands that had established itself in the Lipini Mountains began to be much spoken of. The brigands have never been really extirpated from the neighbourhood of Rome. Sometimes a chief is wanted, but when a chief presents himself, he rarely has to wait long for a band of followers. The celebrated Cucumetto, pursued in the Abruzzo, driven out of the kingdom of Naples, where he had carried on a regular war, had crossed the Garigliano like Manfred, and had taken refuge on the banks of the Amazine between Sonino and Giopano. He strove to collect a band of followers, and followed the footsteps of de Cesaris and Gasparone, whom he hoped to surpass. Many young men of Palestrina, Frascati, and Pampinara had disappeared. Their disappearance at first caused much disquietude, but it was soon known that they had joined Cucumetto. After some time, Cucumetto became the object of universal attention. The most extraordinary traits of ferocious daring and brutality were related of him. One day he carried off a young girl, the daughter of a surveyor of Frosinoni. The bandit's laws are positive. A young girl belongs first to him who carries her off, then the rest draw lots for her, and she is abandoned to their brutality until death relieves her sufferings. When their parents are sufficiently rich to pay a ransom, a messenger is sent to negotiate. The prisoner is hostage for the security of the messenger. Should the ransom be refused, the prisoner is irrevocably lost. The young girl's lover was in Cucumetto's troop. His name was Carlini. When she recognized her lover, the poor girl extended her arms to him, and believed herself safe, but Carlini felt his heart sink, for he but too well knew the fate that awaited her. However, as he was a favorite with Cucumetto, as he had for three years faithfully served him, and as he had saved his life by shooting a dragoon who was about to cut him down, he hoped the chief would have pity on him. He took Cucumetto to one side. 
while the young girl, seated at the foot of a huge pine that stood in the centre of the forest, made a veil of her picturesque headdress to hide her face from the lascivious gaze of the bandits. There he told the chief all, his affection for the prisoner, their promises of mutual fidelity, and how every night, since he had been near, they had met in some neighbouring ruins. It so happened that night that Cucumetto had sent Carlini to a village, so that he had been unable to go to the place of meeting. Cucumetto had been there, however, by accident, as he said, and had carried the maiden off. Carlini besought his chief to make an exception in Rita's favour, as her father was rich and could pay a large ransom. Cucumetto seemed to yield to his friend's entreaties, and bade him find a shepherd to send to Rita's father at Frosinoni. Carlini flew joyfully to Rita, telling her she was saved, and bidding her write to her father to inform him what had occurred, and that her ransom was fixed at three hundred piastres. Twelve hours' delay was all that was granted, that is, until nine the next morning. The instant the letter was written, Carlini seized it and hastened to the plain to find a messenger. He found a young shepherd watching his flock. The natural messengers of the bandits are the shepherds who live between the city and the mountains, between civilized and savage life. The boy undertook the commission, promising to be in Frosinoni in less than an hour. Carlini returned, anxious to see his mistress, and announced the joyful intelligence. He found the troop in the glade, sapping off the provisions exacted as contributions from the peasants, but his eye vainly sought Rita and Cucumetto among them. He inquired where they were and was answered by a burst of laughter. A cold perspiration burst from every pore, and his hair stood on end. He repeated his question. One of the bandits rose and offered him a glass filled with Ovieto, saying, To the health of the brave Cucumetto and the fair Rita. At this moment Carlini heard a woman's cry. He divined the truth, seized the glass, broke it across the face of him who presented it, and rushed towards the spot whence the cry came. After a hundred yards he turned the corner of the thicket. He found Rita senseless in the arms of Cucumetto. At the sight of Carlini, Cucumetto rose, a pistol in each hand. The two brigands looked at each other for a moment, the one with a smile of lasciviousness on his lips, the other with a pallor of death on his brow. A terrible battle between the two men seemed imminent, but by degrees Carlini's features relaxed. His hand which had grasped one of the pistols in his belt, fell to his side. Rita lay between them. The moon lighted the group. Well, said Cucumetto, have you executed your commission? Yes, Captain, returned Carlini. At nine o'clock tomorrow, Rita's father will be here with the money. It is well. In the meantime, we will have a merry night. This young girl is charming and does credit to your taste. Now, as I am not egotistical, we will return to our comrades and draw lots for her. You have determined then to abandon her to the common law, said Carlini. Why should an exception be made in her favour? I thought that my entreaties. What right have you, any more than the rest, to ask for an exception? It is true. But never mind, continued Cucumetto, laughing. Sooner or later your turn will come. Carlini's teeth clinched convulsively. Now then, said Cucumetto, advancing towards the other bandits, are you coming? I follow you. Cucumetto departed without losing sight of Carlini, for, doubtless, he feared lest he should strike him unawares, but nothing betrayed a hostile design on Carlini's part. He was standing, his arms folded, near Rita, who was still insensible. Cucumetto fancied for a moment the young man was about to take her in his arms and fly, but this mattered little to him now Rita had been his, and as for the money, three hundred piastres distributed among the band was so small a sum that he cared little about it. He continued to follow the path to the glade, but to his great surprise, Carlini arrived almost as soon as himself. Let us draw lots, let us draw lots, cried all the brigands when they saw the chief. Their demand was fair, and the chief inclined his head in sign of acquiescence. The eyes of all shone fiercely as they made their demand, and the red light of the fire made them look like demons. The names of all, including Carlini, were placed in a hat, and the youngest of the band drew forth a ticket. The ticket bore the name of Diavolaccio. He was the man who had proposed to Carlini the health of their chief, and to whom Carlini replied by breaking the glass across his face. A large wound, extending from the temple to the mouth, was bleeding profusely. 
Diabolaccio, seeing himself thus favoured by fortune, burst into a loud laugh. "'Captain,' said he, "'just now Caligny would not drink to your health when I proposed it to him. Propose mine to him, and let us see if he will be more condescending to you than to me.' Every one expected an explosion on Caligny's part, but to their great surprise he took a glass in one hand and a flask in the other, and filling it. "'Your health, Diabolaccio," said he calmly, and he drank it off, without his hand trembling in the least. Then sitting down by the fire, "'My supper,' said he, "'my expedition has given me an appetite.' "'Well done, Caligny," cried the brigands. "'That is acting like a good fellow.' And they all formed a circle round the fire, while Diabolaccio disappeared. Carlini ate and drank as if nothing had happened. The bandits looked on with astonishment at this singular conduct until they heard footsteps. They turned round and saw Diabolaccio bearing the young girl in his arms. Her head hung back and her long hair swept the ground. As they entered the circle, the bandits could perceive by the firelight the unearthly pallor of the young girl and of Diabolaccio. This apparition was so strange and so solemn that every one rose with the exception of Carlini, who remained seated and ate and drank calmly. Diavolaccio advanced amidst the most profound silence and laid Rita at the captain's feet. Then every one could understand the cause of the unearthly pallor in the young girl and the bandit. A knife was plunged up to the hilt in Rita's left breast. Every one looked at Carlini. The sheath at his belt was empty. Ah, ah, said the chief, I now understand why Carlini stayed behind. All savage natures appreciate a desperate need. No other of the bandits would, perhaps, have done the same, but they all understood what Carlini had done. Now then, cried Carlini, rising in his turn and approaching the corpse, his hand on the butt of one of his pistols. Does any one dispute the possession of this woman with me? No, returned the chief, she is thine. Carlini raised her in his arms and carried her out of the circle of firelight. Cucumetto placed his sentinels for the night, and the bandits wrapped themselves in their cloaks and lay down before the fire. At midnight the sentinel gave the alarm, and in an instant all were on the alert. It was Rita's father who brought his daughter's ransom in person. Here, said he to Cucumetto, here are three hundred piastres. Give me back my child. But the chief, without taking the money, made a sign to him to follow. The old man obeyed. They both advanced beneath the trees, through whose branches streamed the moonlight. Cucumetto stopped at last and pointed to two persons grouped at the foot of a tree. There, said he, demand thy child of Carlini. He will tell thee what has become of her. And he returned to his companions. The old man remained motionless. He felt that some great and unforeseen misfortune hung over his head. At length he advanced toward the group, the meaning of which he could not comprehend. As he approached, Carlini raised his head, and the forms of two persons became visible to the old man's eyes. A woman lay on the ground, her head resting on the knees of a man, who was seated by her. As he raised his head, the woman's face became visible. The old man recognized his child, and Carlini recognized the old man. "'I expected thee,' said the bandit to Rita's father. "'Wretch,' returned the old man, "'what hast thou done?' And he gazed with terror on Rita, pale and bloody, a knife buried in her bosom. A ray of moonlight poured through the trees and lighted up the face of the dead. "'Cucumetto had violated thy daughter,' said the bandit. "'I loved her, therefore I slew her.' For she would have served as the sport of the whole band. The old man spoke not, and grew pale as death. Now, continued Carlini, if I have done wrongly, avenge her. And withdrawing the knife from the wound in Rita's bosom, he held it out to the old man with one hand, while with the other he tore open his vest. Thou hast done well, returned the old man in a hoarse voice. Embrace me, my son. Carlini threw himself, sobbing like a child, into the arms of his mistress's father. These were the first tears the man of blood had ever wept. Now, said the old man, aid me to bury my child. Carlini fetched two pickaxes, and the father and the lover began to dig at the foot of a huge oak, beneath which the young girl was to repose. When the grave was formed, the father kissed her first, and then the lover. Afterwards, one taking the head, the other the feet, they placed her in the grave. Then they knelt on each side of the grave, and said the prayers of the dead. 
Then when they had finished, they cast the earth over the corpse until the grave was filled. Then, extending his hand, the old man said, I thank you, my son, and now leave me alone. Yet, replied Carlini, leave me, I command you. Carlini obeyed, rejoined his comrades, folded himself in his cloak, and soon appeared to sleep as soundly as the rest. It had been resolved the night before to change their encampment. An hour before daybreak, Cucumetto aroused his men, and gave the word to march. But Carlini would not quit the forest, without knowing what had become of Rita's father. He went toward the place where he had left him. He found the old man suspended from one of the branches of the oak which shaded his daughter's grave. He then took an oath of bitter vengeance over the dead body of the one and the tomb of the other. But he was unable to complete this oath, for two days afterwards, in an encounter with the Roman carboneers, Carlini was killed. There was some surprise, however, that, as he was with his face to the enemy, he should have received a ball between his shoulders. That astonishment ceased when one of the brigands remarked to his comrades that Cucumetto was stationed ten paces in Carlini's rear when he fell. On the morning of the departure from the forest of Frosinone, he had followed Carlini in the darkness and heard this oath of vengeance, and like a wise man anticipated it. They told ten other stories of this bandit chief, each more singular than the other. Thus, from Fondi to Perugia, every one trembles at the name of Cucumetto. These narratives were frequently the theme of conversation between Luigi and Teresa. The young girl trembled very much at hearing the stories, but Vampa reassured her with a smile, tapping the butt of his good fowling piece, which threw its ball so well, and if that did not restore her courage, he pointed to a crow perched on some dead branch, took aim, touched the trigger, and the bird fell dead at the foot of the tree. Time passed on, and the two young people had agreed to be married when Vampa should be twenty and Teresa nineteen years of age. They were both orphans and had only their employer's leave to ask, which had been already sought and obtained. One day, when they were talking over their plans for the future, they heard two or three reports of firearms, and then suddenly a man came out of the wood, near which the two young persons used to graze their flocks, and hurried towards them. When he came within hearing, he exclaimed, I am pursued, can you conceal me? They knew full well that this fugitive must be a bandit, but there is an innate sympathy between the Roman brigand and the Roman peasant, and the latter is always ready to aid the former. Vampa, without saying a word, hastened to the stone that closed up the entrance to their grotto, drew it away, made a sign to the fugitive to take refuge there, in a retreat unknown to every one, closed the stone upon him, and then went and resumed his seat by Teresa. Instantly afterwards, four carboneers on horseback appeared on the edge of the wood. Three of them appeared to be looking for the fugitive, while the fourth dragged a brigand prisoner by the neck. The three carboneers looked about carefully on every side, saw the young peasants, and galloping up, began to question them. They had seen no one. That is very annoying, said the brigadier, for the man we are looking for is the chief. Cucumetto? cried Luigi and Teresa at the same moment. Yes, replied the brigadier, and as his head is valued at a thousand Roman crowns, there would have been five hundred for you if you had helped us to catch him. The two young persons exchanged looks. The brigadier had a moment's hope. Five hundred Roman crowns are three thousand lire, and three thousand lire are a fortune for two poor orphans who are going to be married. Yes, it is very annoying, said Vampa, but we have not seen him. Then the carboneers scoured the country in different directions, but in vain. Then, after a time, they disappeared. Vampa then removed the stone, and Cucumetto came out. Through the crevices in the granite he had seen the two young peasants talking with the carboneers, and guessed the subject of their parley. He had read in the countenances of Luigi and Teresa their steadfast resolution not to surrender him, and he drew from his pocket a purse full of gold, which he offered to them. But Vampa raised his head proudly. As to Teresa, her eyes sparkled when she thought of all the fine gowns and gay jewellery she could buy with this purse of gold. Cucumetto was a cunning fiend, and had assumed the form of a brigand instead of a serpent, and this look from Teresa showed to him that she was a worthy daughter of Eve, and he returned to the forest, pausing several times on his way, under the pretext of saluting his protectors. 
Several days elapsed, and they neither saw nor heard of Cucumetto. The time of the carnival was at hand. The Count of San Felice announced a grand masked ball, to which all that were distinguished in Rome were invited. Teresa had a great desire to see this ball. Luigi asked permission of his protector, the steward, that she and he might be present amongst the servants of the house. This was granted. The ball was given by the Count for the particular pleasure of his daughter Carmela, whom he adored. Carmela was precisely the age and figure of Teresa, and Teresa was as handsome as Carmela. On the evening of the ball, Teresa was attired in her best, her most brilliant ornaments in her hair, and gayest glass beads. She was in the costume of the women of Frascati. Luigi wore the very picturesque garb of the Roman peasant at holiday time. They both mingled, as they had leave to do, with the servants and peasants. The festa was magnificent. Not only was the villa brilliantly illuminated, but thousands of coloured lanterns were suspended from the trees in the garden, and very soon the palace overflowed to the terraces, and the terraces to the garden walks. At each cross path was an orchestra, and tables spread with refreshments. The guests stopped, formed quadrilles, and danced in any part of the grounds they pleased. Carmela was attired like a woman of Sonino. Her cap was embroidered with pearls. The pins in her hair were of gold and diamonds. Her girdle was of turkey silk, with large embroidered flowers. Her bodice and skirt were of cashmere, her apron of Indian muslin, and the buttons of a corset were of jewels. Two of her companions were dressed, the one as a woman of Netunu, and the other as a woman of Lauricia. Four young men of the richest and noblest families of Rome accompanied them, with that Italian freedom which has not its parallel in any other country in the world. They were attired as peasants of Albano, Velletri, Civita Castellana, and Sora. We need hardly add that these peasant costumes, like those of the young women, were brilliant with gold and jewels. Carmela wished to form a quadrille, but there was one lady wanting. Carmela looked all around her, but not one of the guests had a costume similar to her own or those of her companions. The Count of San Felice pointed out Teresa, who was hanging on Luigi's arm in a group of peasants. "'Will you allow me, father?' said Carmela. "'Certainly,' replied the Count. "'Are we not in carnival time?' Carmela turned to the young man who was talking with her, and saying a few words to him, pointed her finger to Teresa. The young man looked, bowed in obedience, and then went to Teresa, and invited her to dance in a quadrille directed by the Count's daughter. Teresa felt a flush pass over her face. She looked at Luigi, who could not refuse his assent. Luigi slowly relinquished Teresa's arm, which he had held beneath his own, and Teresa, accompanied by her elegant cavalier, took her appointed place, with much agitation, in the aristocratic quadrille. Certainly, in the eyes of an artist, the exact and strict costume of Teresa had a very different character from that of Carmela and her companions, and Teresa was frivolous and coquettish, and thus the embroidery and muslins, the cashmere waist girdles, all dazzled her, and the reflection of sapphires and diamonds almost turned her giddy brain. Luigi felt a sensation hitherto unknown arising in his mind. It was like an acute pain which gnawed at his heart and then thrilled through his whole body. He followed with his eye each movement of Teresa and her cavalier. When their hands touched, he felt as though he should swoon. Every pulse beat with violence, and it seemed as though a bell were ringing in his ears. When they spoke, although Teresa listened timidly and with downcast eyes to the conversation of her cavalier, as Luigi could read in the ardent looks of the good-looking young man that his language was that of praise, it seemed as if the whole world was turning round with him, and all the voices of hell were whispering in his ears ideas of murder and assassination. Then, fearing that his paroxysm might get the better of him, he clutched with one hand the branch of a tree against which he was leaning, and with the other convulsively grasped the dagger with a carved handle which was in his belt, and which, unwittingly, he drew from the scabbard from time to time. Luigi was jealous. He felt that, influenced by her ambitions and coquettish disposition, Teresa might escape him. The young peasant girl, at first timid and scared, soon recovered herself. We have said that Teresa was handsome, but this is not all. Teresa was endowed with all those wild graces which are so much more potent than our affected and studied elegancies. 
she had almost all the honours of the quadrille, and if she were envious of the Count of San Felice's daughter, we will not undertake to say that Camilla was not jealous of her. And with overpowering compliments her handsome cavalier led her back to the place whence he had taken her, and where Luigi awaited her. Twice or thrice during the dance the young girl had glanced at Luigi, and each time she saw that he was pale and that his features were agitated. Once even the blade of his knife, half drawn from his sheath, had dazzled her eyes with its sinister glare. Thus it was almost tremblingly that she resumed her lover's arm. The quadrille had been most perfect, and it was evident that there was great demand for a repetition, Camilla alone objecting to it, but the Count of San Felice besought his daughter so earnestly that she acceded. One of the cavaliers then hastened to invite Teresa, without whom it was impossible for the quadrille to be formed, but the young girl had disappeared. The truth was that Luigi had not felt the strength to support another such trial, and, half by persuasion and half by force, he had removed Teresa toward another part of the garden. Teresa had yielded in spite of herself, but when she looked at the agitated countenance of the young man, she understood by his silent and trembling voice that something strange was passing within him. She herself was not exempt from internal emotion and without having done anything wrong, yet fully comprehended that Luigi was right in reproaching her. Why, she did not know, but yet she did not less feel that these reproaches were merited. However, to Teresa's great astonishment, Luigi remained mute, and not a word escaped his lips the rest of the evening. When the chill of the night had driven away the guests from the gardens, and the gates of the villa were closed on them for a festa indoors, he took Teresa quite away, and as he left her at her home he said, Teresa, what were you thinking as you danced opposite the young countess of San Felice? I thought, replied the young girl, with all the frankness of her nature, that I would give half my life for a costume such as she wore. And what said your cavalier to you? He said it only depended on myself to have it, and I had only one word to say. He was right, said Luigi. Do you desire it as ardently as you say? Yes. Well, then, you shall have it. The young girl, much astonished, raised her head to look at him, but his face was so gloomy and terrible that her words froze to her lips. As Luigi spoke thus, he left her. Teresa followed him with her eyes into the darkness as long as she could, and when he had quite disappeared she went into the house with a sigh. That night a memorable event occurred, due no doubt to the imprudence of some servant who had neglected to extinguish the lights. The villa of San Felice took fire in the rooms adjoining the very apartment of the lovely Camilla. Awakened in the night by the light of the flames, she sprang out of bed, wrapped herself in a dressing-gown, and attempted to escape by the door, but the corridor by which she hoped to fly was already a prey to the flames. She then returned to her room, calling for help as loudly as she could, when suddenly her window, which was twenty feet from the ground, was opened, a young peasant jumped into the chamber, seized her in his arms, and with superhuman skill and strength, conveyed her to the turf of the grass plot where she fainted. When she recovered, her father was by her side. All the servants surrounded her, offering her assistance. An entire wing of the villa was burnt down, but what of that as long as Carmela was safe and uninjured? Her preserver was everywhere sought for, but he did not appear. He was inquired after, but no one had seen him. Camilla was greatly troubled that she had not recognized him. As the Count was immensely rich, excepting the danger Camilla had run, and the marvellous manner in which she had escaped, made that appear to him rather a favour of providence than a real misfortune. The loss occasioned by the conflagration was to him but a trifle. The next day, at the usual hour, the two young peasants were on the borders of the forest. Luigi arrived first. He came toward Teresa in high spirits, and seemed to have completely forgotten the events of the previous evening. The young girl was very pensive, but seeing Luigi so cheerful, she on her part assumed a smiling air, which was natural to her when she was not excited or in a passion. Luigi took her arm beneath his own, and led her to the door of the grotto. Then he paused. The young girl, perceiving that there was something extraordinary, looked at him steadfastly. Teresa, said Luigi, yesterday evening you told me you would give all the world to have a costume similar to that of the Count's daughter. Yes, replied Teresa with astonishment, but I was mad to utter such a wish. And I replied, very well, you shall have it. 
Yes, replied the young girl, whose astonishment increased at every word uttered by Luigi, but of course your reply was only to please me. I have promised no more than I have given you, Teresa, said Luigi proudly. Go into the grotto and dress yourself. At these words he drew away the stone and showed Teresa the grotto, lighted up by two wax lights, which burned on each side of a splendid mirror. On a rustic table made by Luigi were spread out the pearl necklace and the diamond pins, and on a chair at the side was laid the rest of the costume. Teresa uttered a cry of joy, and, without inquiring whence this attire came, or even thanking Luigi, darted into the grotto, transformed into a dressing-room. Luigi pushed the stone behind her, for on the crest of a small adjacent hill, which cut off the view toward Palestrina, he saw a traveller on horseback, stopping a moment as if uncertain of his road, and thus presenting against the blue sky that perfect outline which is peculiar to distant objects in southern climes. When he saw Luigi, he put his horse into a gallop and advanced toward him. Luigi was not mistaken. The traveller, who was going from Palestrina to Tivoli, had mistaken his way. The young man directed him, but as at a distance of a quarter of a mile, the road again divided into three ways, and on reaching these the traveller might again stray from his route, he begged Luigi to be his guide. Luigi threw his cloak on the ground, placed his carbine on his shoulder, and freed from his heavy covering preceded the traveller with the rapid step of a mountaineer, which a horse can scarcely keep up with. In ten minutes Luigi and the traveller reached the crossroads. On arriving there, with an air as majestic as that of an emperor, he stretched his hand towards that one of the roads which the traveller was to follow. That is your road, Excellency, and now you cannot again mistake. And here is your recompense, said the traveller, offering the young herdsman some small pieces of money. Thank you, said Luigi, drawing back his hand. I render a service. I do not sell it. Well, replied the traveller, who seemed used to this difference between the civility of a man of the cities and the pride of the mountaineer, if you refuse wages, you will, perhaps, accept a gift. Ah, yes, that is another thing. Then, said the traveller, take these two Venetian sequins and give them to your bride to make herself a pair of earrings. And then do you take this poniard, said the young herdsman. You will not find one better calf between Albano and Civita Castellana. I accept it, answered the traveller, but then the obligation will be on my side, for this poniard is worth more than two sequins. For a dealer, perhaps, but for me, who engraved it myself, it is hardly worth a piastre. What is your name? inquired the traveller. Luigi Vampa, replied the shepherd, with the same air as he would have replied, Alexander, King of Macedon. And yours? I, said the traveller, am called Sinbad the Sailor. Franz d'Epinay started with surprise. Sinbad the Sailor, he said. Yes, replied the narrator. That was the name which the traveller gave to Vampa as his own. Well, and what may you have to say against this name? inquired Albert. It is a very pretty name, and the adventures of the gentleman of that name amused me very much in my youth, I must confess. Franz said no more. The name of Sinbad the Sailor, as may well be supposed, awakened in him a world of recollections, as had the name of the Count of Monte Cristo on the previous evening. Proceed, said he to the host. Vampa put the two sequins haughtily into his pocket, and slowly returned by the way he had gone. As he came within two or three hundred paces of the grotto, he thought he heard a cry. He listened to know whence this sound could proceed. A moment afterwards he thought he heard his own name pronounced distinctly. The cry proceeded from the grotto. He bounded like a chamois, cocking his carbine as he went, and in a moment reached the summit of a hill opposite to that on which he had perceived the traveller. Three cries for help came more distinctly to his ear. He cast his eyes around him, and saw a man carrying off Teresa, as Nessos, the centaur, carried Dianaira. This man, who was hastening towards the woods, was already three-quarters of the way on the road from the grotto to the forest. Vampa measured the distance. The man was at least two hundred paces in advance of him, and there was not a chance of overtaking him. The young shepherd stopped, as if his feet had been rooted to the ground, then he put the butt of his carbine to his shoulder took aim at the ravisher, followed him for a second in his track, and then fired. The ravisher stopped suddenly, his knees bent under him, and he fell with Teresa in his arms.
The young girl rose instantly, but the man lay on the earth, struggling in the agonies of death. Vampa then rushed towards Teresa, for at ten paces from the dying man her legs had failed her, and she had dropped on her knees, so that the young man feared that the ball that had brought down his enemy had also wounded his betrothed. Fortunately, she was unscathed, and it was fright alone that had overcome Teresa. When Luigi had assured himself that she was safe and unharmed, he turned towards the wounded man. He had just expired, with clinched hands, his mouth in a spasm of agony, and his hair on end in the sweat of death. His eyes remained open and menacing. Vampa approached the corpse and recognized Cucumetto. From the day on which the bandit had been saved by the two young peasants, he had been enamoured of Teresa, and had sworn she would be his. From that time he had watched them, and profiting by the moment when her lover had left her alone, had carried her off, and believed he at length had her in his power, when the ball, directed by the unerring skill of the young herdsman, had pierced his heart. Vampa gazed on him for a moment without betraying the slightest emotion, while, on the contrary, Teresa, shuddering in every limb, dared not approach the slain ruffian, but by degrees, and threw a hesitating glance at the dead body over the shoulder of her lover. Suddenly Vampa turned toward his mistress. Ah, said he, good, good, you are dressed, it is now my turn to dress myself. Teresa was clothed from head to foot in the garb of the Count of San Felice's daughter. Vampa took Cucumetto's body in his arms and conveyed it to the grotto, while in her turn Teresa remained outside. If a second traveller had passed, he would have seen a strange thing. A shepherdess watching her flock, clad in a cashmere gown with earrings and necklace of pearls, diamond pins and buttons of sapphires, emeralds and rubies. He would, no doubt, have believed that he had returned to the times of Florian, and would have declared on reaching Paris that he had met an alpine shepherdess seated at the foot of the Sabine Hill. At the end of a quarter of an hour Vampa quitted the grotto. His costume was no less elegant than that of Teresa. He wore a vest of garnet-coloured velvet, with buttons of cut gold, a silk waistcoat covered with embroidery, a Roman scarf tied round his neck, a cartridge box worked with gold, and red and green silk, sky-blue velvet breeches fastened above the knee with diamond buckles, garters of deerskin worked with a thousand arabesque, and a hat whereon hung ribbons of all colours, two watches hung from his girdle, and a splendid poniard was in his belt. Teresa uttered a cry of admiration. Vampa in his attire resembled a painting by Leopold Robert or Schnetz. He had assumed the entire costume of Cucumetto. The young man saw the effect produced on his betrothed, and a smile of pride passed over his lips. Now, he said to Teresa, are you ready to share my fortune, whatever it may be? Oh, yes, exclaimed the young girl enthusiastically, and follow me wherever I go, to the world's end. Then take my arm and let us on, we have no time to lose. The young girl did so without questioning a lover as to where he was conducting her, for he appeared to her at this moment as handsome, proud and powerful as a god. They went towards the forest and soon entered it. We need scarcely say that all the paths of the mountain were known to Vampa. He therefore went forward without a moment's hesitation, although there was no beaten track, but he knew his path by looking at the trees and bushes, and thus they kept on advancing for nearly an hour and a half. At the end of this time they had reached the thickest of the forest. A torrent, whose bed was dry, led into a deep gorge. Vampa took this wild road, which, enclosed between two ridges and shadowed by the tufted umbrage of the pines, seemed, but for the difficulties of its descent, that path to Avernus, of which Virgil speaks. Teresa had become alarmed at the wild and deserted look of the plain around her, and pressed closely against her guide, not uttering a syllable. But as she saw him advance with even step and composed countenance, she endeavoured to repress her emotion. Suddenly, about ten paces from them, a man advanced from behind a tree and aimed at Vampa. Not another step, he said, or you are a dead man. What then, said Vampa, raising his hand with a gesture of disdain, while Teresa, no longer able to restrain her alarm, clung closely to him. Do wolves rend each other? Who are you? inquired the sentinel. I am Luigi Vampa, shepherd of the San Felice farm. What do you want? I would speak with your companions who are in the glade at Rocha Bianca. Follow me then, said the sentinel. 
or as you know your way, go first. Vampa smiled disdainfully at this precaution on the part of the bandit, went before Teresa and continued to advance with the same firm and easy step as before. At the end of ten minutes the bandit made them a sign to stop. The two young persons obeyed. Then the bandage thrice imitated the cry of a crow. A croak answered this signal. Good, said the sentry. You may now go on. Luigi and Teresa again set forward. As they went on, Teresa clung tremblingly to her lover at the sight of weapons and the glistening of carbines through the trees. The retreat of Rocha Bianca was at the top of a small mountain, which no doubt in former days had been a volcano, an extinct volcano before the days when Remus and Romulus had deserted Alba to come and found the city of Rome. Teresa and Luigi reached the summit, and all at once found themselves in the presence of twenty bandits. "'Here is a young man who seeks and wishes to speak to you,' said the sentinel. "'What has he to say?' inquired the young man who was in command in the chief's absence. "'I wish to say that I am tired of a shepherd's life,' was Vampa's reply. "'Ah, I understand,' said the lieutenant, "'and you seek admittance into our ranks.' "'Welcome!' cried several bandits from Ferrozino, Pampinara and Anagni, who had recognized Luigi Vampa. "'Yes, but I came to ask something more than to be your companion.' "'And what may that be?' inquired the bandits with astonishment. I come to ask to be your captain, said the young man. The bandits shouted with laughter. And what have you done to aspire to this honor? demanded the lieutenant. I have killed your chief, Kukumetu, whose dress I now wear, and I set fire to the Villa San Felice to procure a wedding dress for my betrothed. An hour afterwards, Luigi Vampa was chosen captain, vice Kukumetu deceased. Well, my dear Albert, said Franz, turning toward his friend, what think you of citizen Luigi Vampa? I say he is a myth, replied Albert, and never had an existence. And what may a myth be? inquired Pastrini. The explanation would be too long, my dear landlord, replied Franz. And you say that Signor Vampa exercises his profession at this moment in the environs of Rome, and with a boldness of which no bandit before him ever gave an example. Then the police have vainly tried to lay hands on him. Why, you see, he has a good understanding with the shepherds in the plains, the fishermen of the Tiber, and the smugglers of the coast. They seek for him in the mountains, and he is on the waters. They follow him on the waters, and he is on the open sea. Then they pursue him, and he has suddenly taken refuge in the islands at Giliu, Guanuti, or Monte Cristo, and when they hunt for him there, he reappears suddenly at Albano, Tivoli, or La Riccia. And how does he behave towards travellers? Alas, his plan is very simple. It depends on the distance he may be from the city, whether he gives eight hours, twelve hours, or a day wherein to pay their ransom. And when that time has elapsed, he allows another hour's grace. At the sixtieth minute of this hour, if the money is not forthcoming, he blows out the prisoner's brains with a pistol shot, or plants his dagger in his heart, and that settles the account. Well, Albert, inquired Franz of his companion, are you still disposed to go to the Colosseum by the outer wall? Quite so, said Albert, if the way be picturesque. The clock struck nine as the door opened and a coachman appeared. Excellency, said he, the coach is ready. Well then, said Franz, let us to the Colosseum. By the Porta del Popolo or by the streets, your excellencies? By the streets, Morbleu, by the streets, cried Franz. Ah, my dear fellow, said Albert, rising and lighting his third cigar. Really, I thought you had more courage. So saying, the two young men went down the staircase and got into the carriage. End of chapter 33All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by J.C. Guan, Montreal, 2007. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas, Chapter 34, The Colosseum. France has so managed his route that during the ride to the Colosseum, 
they passed not a single ancient ruin, so that no preliminary impression interfered to mitigate the colossal proportions of the gigantic building they came to admire. The road selected was a continuation of the Via Sistina. Then, by cutting off the right angle of the street, in which stands Santa Maria Maggiore, and proceeding by the Via Urbana and San Pietro in Vincoli, the travellers would find themselves directly opposite the Colosseum. This itinerary possessed another great advantage, that of leaving France at full liberty to indulge his deep reverie upon the subject of Signora Pastrini's story, in which his mysterious host of Monte Cristo was so strangely mixed up. Seated with folded arms in a corner of the carriage, he continued to ponder over the singular history he had so lately listened to and to ask himself an interminable number of questions touching its various circumstances without however arriving at a satisfactory reply to any of them one fact more than the rest brought his friend sinbad the sailor back to his recollection and that was the mysterious sort of intimacy that seemed to exist between the brigands and the sailors and pastrini's account of vampas having found refuge on board the vessels of smugglers and fishermen reminded Franz of the two Corsican bandits he had found supping so amicably with the crew of the little yak, which had even deviated from its course and touched at Porto Vecchio for the sole purpose of landing them. The very name assumed by his host of Monte Cristo, and again repeated by the landlord of the Hotel de Londres, abundantly proved to him that his island friend was playing his philanthropic part on the shores of Piombino, Civita Vecchio, Ostia and Gaeta, as on those of Corsica, Tuscany, and Spain, and further, Franz but thought of him, having heard his singular entertainer speak both of Tunis and Palermo, proving thereby how largely his circle of acquaintances extended. But however the mind of the young man might be absorbed in these reflections, they were at once dispersed at the sight of the dark frowning ruins of the stupendous Colosseum through the various openings of which the pale moonlight played and flickered like the unearthly gleam from the eyes of the wandering dead. The carriage stopped near the Meta Sudans, the door was opened, and the young men, eagerly alighting, found themselves opposite the Cicerone, who appeared to have sprung up from the ground, so unexpected was his appearance. The usual guide from the hotel, having followed them, they had paid two conductors, nor is it possible, at Rome, to avoid this abundant supply of guides. Besides the ordinary Cicerone, who seizes upon you directly, you set foot in your hotel, and never quits you while you remain in the city, there is also a special Cicerone belonging to each monument, nay, almost to each part of the monument. It may therefore be easily imagined there is no scarcity of guides at the Colosseum, that wonder of all ages, which Marshall, thus eulogizes let memphis cease to boast the barbarous miracles of her pyramids and the wonders of babylon be talked no more among us all must bow to the superiority of the gigantic labor of the caesars and the many voices of fame spread far and wide the surpassing merits of this incomparable monument as for albert and france they essayed not to escape from their ciceronian tyrants and indeed it would have been so much the more difficult to break their bondage, as the guides alone are permitted to visit these monuments with torches in their hands. Thus, then, the young men made no attempt at resistance, but blindly and confidingly surrendered themselves into the care and custody of their conductors. Albert had already made seven or eight similar excursions to the Colosseum, while his less favored companion, trod for the first time in his life the classic ground forming the monument of Flavius Vespasian, and, to his credit be it spoken, his mind, even amid the glib loquacity of the guides, was dully and deeply touched with awe and enthusiastic admiration of all he saw, and certainly no adequate notion of these stupendous ruins can be formed save by such as have visited them, and more especially by moonlight at which time the vast proportions of the building appear twice as large when viewed by the mysterious beams of a southern moonlit sky, whose rays are sufficiently clear and vivid 
to light the horizon with the glow equal to the soft twilight of an eastern clime. Scarcely, therefore, had the reflective friends walked a hundred steps beneath the interior porticoes of the ruin, then, abandoning Albert to the guides, who would by no means yield their prescriptive right of carrying their victims through the routine regularly laid down, and as regularly followed by them, but dragged the unconscious visitor to the various objects with a pertinacity that admitted of no appeal. Beginning, as a matter of course, with the lion's den, and finishing with Caesar's podium, to escape a jargon and mechanical survey of the wonders by which he was surrounded, Franz ascended a half-dilapidated staircase, and, leaving them to follow their monotonous round, seated himself at the foot of a column, and immediately opposite a large aperture, which permitted him to enjoy a full and undisturbed view of the gigantic dimensions of the majestic ruin. Franz had remained for nearly a quarter of an hour perfectly hidden by the shadow of the vast column, at whose base he had found a resting place and from whence his eyes followed the motions of Albert and his guides, who, holding torches in their hands, had emerged from a vomitarium at the opposite extremity of the Colosseum, and then again disappeared down the steps conducting to the seats reserved for the Vestal Virgins, resembling, as they glided along, some restless shades following the flickering glare of so many ignis fatui. All at once his ear caught a sound resembling that of a stone rolling down the staircase opposite the one by which he had himself ascended. There was nothing remarkable in the circumstance of a fragment of granite giving way and falling heavily below, but it seemed to him that the substance that fell gave way beneath the pressure of a foot, and also that some one, who endeavoured as much as possible to prevent his footsteps from being heard, was approaching the spot where he sat. Conjecture soon became certainty, for the figure of a man was distinctly visible to friends, gradually emerging from the staircase opposite, upon which the moon was at that moment pouring a full tide of silvery brightness. The stranger thus presenting himself was probably a person who, like Franz, preferred the enjoyment of solitude and his own thoughts to the frivolous gabble of the guides and his appearance had nothing extraordinary in it. But the hesitation with which he proceeded, stopping and listening, with anxious attention at every step he took, convinced friends that he expected the arrival of some person. By a sort of instinctive impulse, friends withdrew as much as possible behind his pillar. About ten feet from the spot where he and the stranger were, the roof had given way, leaving a large round opening through which might be seen the blue vault of heaven, thickly studded with stars. Around this opening, which had, possibly, for ages permitted a free entrance to the brilliant moonbeams that now illumined the vast pile, grew a quantity of creeping plants, whose delicate green branches stood out in bold relief against the clear azure of the firmament, while large masses of thick, strong, fibrous shoots forced their way through the chasm, and hung floating to and fro, like so many waving strings. The person whose mysterious arrival had attracted the attention of friends stood in a kind of half-light, that rendered it impossible to distinguish his features, although his dress was easily made out. He wore a large brown mantle, one fold of which, thrown over his left shoulder, served likewise to mask the lower part of his countenance, while the upper part was completely hidden by his broad-brimmed hat. The lower part of his dress was more distinctly visible by the bright rays of the moon, which, entering through the broken ceiling, shed their refulgent beams on the feet case in elegantly made boots of polished leather, over which descended fashionably cut trousers of black cloth. From the imperfect means Franz had of judging, he could only come to one conclusion, that the person whom he was thus watching certainly belonged to no inferior station of life. Some few minutes had elapsed, and the stranger began to show manifest signs of impatience, when a slight noise was heard outside the aperture in the roof, and almost immediately 
a dark shadow seemed to obstruct the flood of light that had entered it, and the figure of a man was clearly seen gazing with eager scrutiny on the immense space beneath him. Then, as his eye caught sight of him in the mantle, he grasped a floating mass of thickly matted bows, and glided down by their help to within three or four feet of the ground, and then leaped lightly on his feet. The man who had performed this daring act with so much indifference wore the transtavery costume. "'I beg your excellency's pardon for keeping you waiting,' said the man, in Roman dialect, "'but I don't think I'm many minutes after my time. Ten o'clock has just struck on the Lateran.' "'Say not a word about being late,' replied the stranger in purest Tuscan. "'Tis I who am too soon. "'But even if you had caused me to wait a little while, "'I should have felt quite sure that the delay was not occasioned by any fault of yours.' "'Your Excellency is perfectly right in so thinking,' said the man. "'I came here direct from the castle of St. Angelo, "'and had an immense deal of trouble before I could get a chance to speak to Beppo.' "'And who is Beppo?' Oh, Beppo is employed in the prison, and I give him so much a year to let me know what is going on within His Holiness's castle. Indeed, you are a provident person, I see. Why, you see, no one knows what may happen. Perhaps some of these days I may be entrapped, like poor Peppino, and may be very glad to have some little nibbling mouse to gnaw the meshes of my net, and so help me out of prison. Briefly, what did you glean? that two executions of considerable interest will take place the day after to-morrow at two o'clock, as is customary at Rome at the commencement of all great festivals. One of the culprits will be Massolato, knocked on the head. He is an atrocious villain who murdered the priest who brought him up, and deserves no smallest pity. The other sufferer is sentenced to be decapitato, beheaded, and he, Your Excellency, is poor Peppino. The fact is, that you have inspired not only the pontifical government, but also the neighboring states, with such extreme fear that they are glad of all opportunity of making an example. But Peppino did not even belong to my band. He was merely a poor shepherd, whose only crime consisted in furnishing us with provisions, which makes him your accomplice to all intents and purposes. But mark the distinction with which he is treated. Instead of being knocked on the head, as you would be, if once they caught hold of you, he is simply sentenced to be guillotined, by which means, too, the amusements of the day are diversified, and there is a spectacle to please every spectator, without reckoning the wholly unexpected one I am preparing to surprise them with. My good friend, said the man in the cloak, excuse me for saying that you seem to me precisely in the mood to commit some wild or extravagant act. Perhaps I am but one thing I have resolved on, and that is, to stop at nothing to restore a poor devil to liberty, who has got into this scrape solely from having served me. I should hate and despise myself as a coward, did I desert the brave fellow in his present extremity. And what do you mean to do? To surround the scaffold with twenty of my best men, who, at a signal from me, will rush forward directly Peppino is brought for execution and, by the assistance of their stilettos, drive back the guard and carry off the prisoner. That seems to me as hazardous as uncertain, and convinces me that my scheme is far better than yours. And what is Your Excellency's project? Just this. I will so advantageously bestow two thousand piastres that the person receiving them shall obtain a respite till next year for Peppino, and, during that year, another skilfully placed thousand piastres will afford him the means of escaping from his prison. "'And do you feel sure of succeeding?' "'Pardieu!' exclaimed the man in the cloak, suddenly expressing himself in French. "'What did Your Excellency say?' inquired the other. "'I said, my good fellow, that I would do more single-handed by the means of gold than you and all your troop could effect with stilettos, pistols, carabines, and blunderbusses included.' Leave me, then, to act, and have no fears for the result. At least there can be no harm in myself and party being in readiness, in case Your Excellency should fail. None whatever. Take what precautions you please, if it is any satisfaction to you to do so, but rely upon my obtaining the reprieve I seek. Remember 
the execution is fixed for the day after tomorrow, and that you have but one day to work in. And what of that? Is not a day divided into twenty-four hours, each hour into sixty minutes, and every minute subdivided into sixty seconds? Now, in eighty-six thousand four hundred seconds, very many things can be done. And how shall I know whether your excellency has succeeded or not? Oh, that is very easily arranged. I have engaged the three lower windows at the Café Rospoli. Should I have obtained the requisite pardon for Peppino, the two outside windows will be hung with yellow damasks, and the centre with white, having a large cross in red marked on it. And whom will you employ to carry the reprieve to the officer directing the execution? Send one of your men, disguised as a penitent friar, and I will give it to him. His dress will procure him the means of approaching the scaffold itself, and he will deliver the official order to the officer, who, in his turn, will hand it to the executioner. In the meantime, it will be as well to acquaint Peppino with what we have determined on, if it be only to prevent his dying of fear or losing his senses, because in either case a very useless expense will have been incurred. Your Excellency, said the man, you are fully persuaded of my entire devotion to you, are you not? Nay, I flatter myself that there can be no doubt of it, replied the cavalier in the cloak. Well, then, only fulfill your promise of rescuing Peppino, and henceforward you shall receive not only my devotion, but the most absolute obedience from myself and those under me that one human being can render to another. Have a care how far you pledge yourself, my good friend, for I may remind you of your promise at some, perhaps, not very distant period, when I, in my turn, may require your aid and influence. Let that day come sooner or later, Your Excellency will find me, what I have found you in this my heavy trouble, and if, from the other end of the world, you but write to me word to do such or such thing, you may regard it as done, for done it shall be, on the word and faith of hush, interrupted the stranger. I hear a noise. Tis some travellers who are visiting the Colosseum by torchlight. T'were better we should not be seen together. Those guides are nothing but spies, and might possibly recognize you. And, however I may be honoured by your friendship, my worthy friend, if once the extent of our intimacy were known, I am sadly afraid both my reputation and credit will suffer thereby. Well, then, if you obtain the reprieve, the middle window at the Café Rospoli will be hung with white damask, bearing a red cross. And if you fail, then all three windows will have yellow draperies. And then, and then, my good fellow, use your daggers in any way you please, and I further promise you to be there as a spectator of your prowess. We understand each other perfectly, then. Adieu, Your Excellency. Depend upon me as firmly as I do upon you. Saying these words, the transteverin disappeared down the staircase, while his companion, muffling his features more closely than before in the folds of his mantle, passed almost close to France, and descended to the arena by an outward flight of steps. The next minute, Franz heard himself called by Albert, who made the lofty building re-echo with the sound of his friend's name. Franz, however, did not obey the summons till he had satisfied himself that the two men whose conversation he had overheard were at a sufficient distance to prevent his encountering them in his descent. In ten minutes after the strangers had departed, Franz was on the road to the Piazza de Spagni, listening with studied indifference to the learned dissertation delivered by Albert, after the manner of Pliny and Calpurnius, touching the iron-pointed nest used to prevent the ferocious beast from springing on the spectators. Franz let him proceed without interruption, and, in fact, did not hear what was said. He longed to be alone, and free to ponder over all that had occurred. One of the two men, whose mysterious meeting in the Colosseum he had so unintentionally witnessed, was an entire stranger to him, but not so the other, and though Franz had been unable to distinguish his features, from his being, either wrapped in his mantle or obscured by the shadow, the tones of his voice had made too powerful an impression on him the first time he had heard them,
for him ever again to forget them, hear them when or where he might. It was more especially when this man was speaking in a manner half jesting, half bitter, that Franz's ear recalled most vividly the deep, sonorous, yet well-pitched voice that had addressed him in the grotto of Monte Cristo, and which he heard for the second time amid the darkness and ruined grandeur of the Colosseum. And the more he thought, the more entire was his conviction, that the person who wore the mantle was no other than his former host and entertainer, Sinbad the Sailor. Under any other circumstances, Franz would have found it impossible to resist his extreme curiosity to know more of so singular a personage, and, with that intent, have sought to renew their short acquaintance. But in the present instance, the confidential nature of the conversation he had overheard made him, with propriety, judge that his appearance at such a time would be anything but agreeable. As we have seen, therefore, he permitted his former host to retire without attempting a recognition, but fully promising himself a rich indemnity for his present forbearance, should chance afford him another opportunity. In vain did Franz endeavor to forget the many perplexing thoughts which assailed him. In vain did he court the refreshment of sleep. Slumber refused to visit his eyelids, and the night was passed in feverish contemplation of the chain of circumstances tending to prove the identity of the mysterious visitant to the Colosseum with the inhabitant of the grotto of Monte Cristo, and the more he thought, the firmer grew his opinion on the subject. Worn out at length, he fell asleep at daybreak, and did not awake till late. Like a genuine Frenchman, Albert had employed his time in arranging for the evening's diversion. He had sent to engage a box at the Teatro Argentino, and Franz, having a number of letters to write, relinquished the carriage to Albert for the whole of the day. At five o'clock, Albert returned, delighted with his day's work. He had been occupied in leaving his letters of introduction, and had received in return more invitations to balls and routes than it would be possible for him to accept. Besides this, he had seen, as he called it, all the remarkable sights at Rome. Yes, in a single day he had accomplished what his more serious-minded companion would have taken weeks to effect. Neither had he neglected to ascertain the name of the piece to be played that night at the Teatro Argentino, and also what performers appeared in it. The opera of Parisina was announced for representation, and the principal actors were Casali, Moriani, and La Specia. The young men, therefore, had reasons to consider themselves fortunate in having the opportunity of hearing one of the best works of the composer of Lucia di Lammermoor, supported by three of the most renowned vocalists of Italy. Albert had never been able to endure the Italian theatres, with their orchestras from which it is impossible to see, and the absence of balconies, or open boxes. All these defects pressed hard on a man who had had his dolls at the booths, and had shared a lower box at the opera. Still, in spite of this, Albert displayed his most dazzling and effective costumes each time he visited the theatres, but, alas, his elegant toilet was wholly thrown away, and one of the most worthy representatives of Parisian fashion had to carry with him the mortifying reflection that he had nearly overrun Italy without meeting a single adventure. Sometimes Albert would affect to make a joke of his want of success, but internally he was deeply wounded and his self-love immensely piqued to think that Albert de Morcerf, the most admired and most sought after of any young person of his day, should thus be passed over, and merely have his labor for his pains. And the thing was so much the more annoying, as, according to the characteristic modesty of a Frenchman, Albert had quitted Paris with the full conviction that he had only to show himself in Italy to carry all before him, and that upon his return he should astonish the Parisian world with the recital of his numerous love affairs. Alas, poor Albert, none of those interesting adventures fell in his way. The lovely Genoese, Florentines, and Napolitans were all faithful, if not to their husbands, at least to their lovers, and thought not of changing even for the splendid appearance of Albert de Morcerf, 
and all he gained was the painful conviction that the ladies of Italy have this advantage over those of France, that they are faithful even in their infidelity. Yet he could not restrain a hope that in Italy, as elsewhere, there might be an exception to the general rule. Albert, besides being an elegant, well-looking young man, was also possessed of considerable talent and ability. Moreover, he was a viscount, a recently created one, certainly, but in the present day it is not necessary to go as far back as Noah in tracing a descent, and a genealogical tree is equally estimated, whether dated from 1399 or merely 1815. But to crown all these advantages, Albert de Marcef commanded an income of 50,000 livres, a more than sufficient sum to render him a personage of considerable importance in Paris. It was therefore no small mortification to him to have visited most of the principal cities in Italy without having excited the most trifling observation. Albert, however, hoped to indemnify himself for all these slights and indifferences during the carnival, knowing full well that among the different states and kingdoms in which this festivity is celebrated, Rome is the spot where even the wisest and gravest throw off the usual rigidity of their lives, and deign to mingle in the follies of this time of liberty and relaxation. The carnival was to commence on the morrow. Therefore, Albert had not an instant to lose in settling forth the program of his hopes, expectations, and claims to notice. With this design he had engaged a box in the most conspicuous part of the theatre, and exerted himself to set off his personal attractions by the aid of the most rich and elaborate toilet. The box taken by Albert was in the first circle. Although each of the three tiers of boxes is deemed equally aristocratic, and is, for this reason, generally styled the nobility's boxes, and although the box engaged for the two friends was sufficiently capacious to contain at least a dozen persons, it had cost less than would be paid at some of the French theatres for one admitting merely four occupants. Another motive had influenced Albert's selection of his seat. Who knew but that, thus advantageously placed, he might not in truth attract the notice of some fair Roman, and an introduction might ensue that would procure him the offer of a seat in a carriage, or a place in a princely balcony, from which he might behold the gaieties of the carnival. These united considerations made Albert more lively and anxious to please than he had hitherto been. Totally disregarding the business of the stage, he leaned from his box and began attentively scrutinizing the beauty of each pretty woman, aided by a powerful opera-glass. But, alas, this attempt to attract notice wholly failed. Not even curiosity had been excited, and it was but too apparent that the lovely creatures, into whose good graces he was desirous of stealing, were all so much engrossed with themselves, their lovers, or their own thoughts, that they had not so much as noticed him, or the manipulation of his class. The truth was that the anticipated pleasures of the carnival, with the holy week that was to succeed it, so filled every fair breast, as to prevent the least attention being bestowed even on the business of the stage. The actors made their entries and exits unobserved, or unthought of. At certain conventional moments, the spectators would suddenly cease their conversation, or rouse themselves from their musings, to listen to some brilliant effort of Moriani's, a well-executed recitative by Croselli, or to join in loud applause at the wonderful powers of Lespecchia. But that momentary excitement over, they quickly relapsed into their former state of preoccupation or interesting conversation. Towards the close of the first act, the door of a box which had been hitherto vacant was opened. A lady entered, to whom friends had been introduced in Paris, where, indeed, he had imagined she still was. The quick eye of Albert caught the involuntary start with which his friend beheld the new arrival, and, turning to him, he said hastily, Do you know the woman who has just entered that box? Yes. What do you think of her? Oh, she's perfectly lovely. What a complexion! And such magnificent hair! Is she French? No, a Venetian. And her name is... Countess G. Ah, oh, I know her by name, exclaimed Albert. 
she is said to possess as much wit and cleverness as beauty. I was to have been presented to her when I met her at Madame Villefort's ball. Shall I assist you in repairing your negligence? asked Franz. My dear fellow, are you really on such good terms with her as to venture to take me to her box? Why, I have only had the honor of being in her society and conversation with her three or four times in my life, but you know that even such an acquaintance as that might warrant my doing what you ask. At that instant, the countess perceived friends, and graciously waved her hand to him, to which he replied by a respectful inclination of the head. Upon my word, said Albert, you seem to be on excellent terms with the beautiful countess. You are mistaken in thinking so, returned Franz calmly. But you merely fall into the same error which leads so many of our countrymen to commit the most egregious blunders. I mean that of judging the habits and customs of Italy and Spain by our Parisian notions. Believe me, nothing is more fallacious than to form any estimate of the degree of intimacy you may suppose existing among persons by the familiar terms they seem upon. There is a similarity of feeling at this instant between ourselves and the countess, nothing more. Is there indeed, my good fellow? Pray tell me, is it sympathy of heart? No. Of taste, continued Franz gravely. And in what matter has this congeniality of mine been evinced? By the countess's visiting the Colosseum, as we did last night, by moonlight and nearly alone. You were with her then? I was. And what did you say to her? Oh, we talked of the illustrious dead, of whom that magnificent ruin is a glorious monument. Upon my word, cried Albert, you must have been a very entertaining companion alone, or all but alone, with a beautiful woman in such a place of sentiment as the Colosseum, and yet to find nothing better to talk about than the dead. All I can say is, if ever I should get such a chance, the living should be my theme and you will probably find your theme ill-chosen. But, said Albert, breaking in upon his discourse, never mind the past, let us only remember the present. Are you not going to keep your promise of introducing me to the fair subject of our remarks? Certainly, directly the curtain falls on the stage. What a confounded time this first act takes! I believe on my soul that they never mean to finish it. Oh, yes, they will! Only listen to that charming finale. How exquisitely Corselli sings his part. But what an awkward, inelegant fellow he is. Well, then, what do you say to Lespecchia? Did you ever see anything more perfect than her acting? Why, you know, my dear fellow, when one has been accustomed to Melbourne and Sontag, such singers as these don't make the same impression on you they perhaps do on others. At least you must admire Moriani's style and execution. I never fancied men of his dark, ponderous appearance singing with a voice like a woman's. My good friend, said Franz, turning to him, while Albert continued to point his glass at every box in the theatre. You seem determined not to approve. You are really too difficult to please. The curtain at length fell on the performances to the infinite satisfaction of the Viscount of Morcef, who seized his hat, rapidly passed his fingers through his hair, arranged his cravat and wristbands, and signified to Franz that he was waiting for him to lead the way. Franz, who had mutely interrogated the Countess, and received from her a gracious smile in token that he would be welcome, sought not to retard the gratification of Albert's eager impatience, but began at once the tour of the house closely followed by Albert, who availed himself of the few minutes required to reach the opposite side of the theatre, to settle the height and smoothness of his collar, and to arrange the lappets of his coat. This important task was just completed as they arrived at the Countess's box. At the knock, the door was immediately opened, and the young man, who was seated beside the Countess, in obedience to the Italian custom, instantly rose and surrendered his place to the strangers, who, in turn, would be expected to retire upon the arrival of other visitors. End of Part 1 of Chapter 34 This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by J.C. Guan, Montreal, November 2007. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 34 The Colosseum. Part 2. Franz presented Albert as one of the most distinguished young men of the day, both as regarded his position in society and extraordinary talents. Nor did he say more than the truth, for in Paris and the circle in which the Viscount moved, he was looked upon and cited as a model of perfection. Franz added that his companion, deeply grieved at having been prevented the honor of being presented to the Countess during her sojourn in Paris, was most anxious to make up for it, and had requested him, Franz, to remedy the past misfortune by conducting him to her box, and concluded by asking pardon for his presumption in having taken it upon himself to do so. The countess, in reply, bowed gracefully to Albert, and extended her hand with cordial kindness to Franz. Then, inviting Albert to take the vacant seat beside her, she recommended Franz to take the next best, if he wished to view the ballet, and pointed to the one behind her own chair. Albert was soon deeply engrossed in discoursing upon Paris and Parisian matters, speaking to the countess of the various persons they both knew there. Franz perceived how completely he was in his element, and, unwilling to interfere with the pleasure he so evidently felt, took up Albert's glass, and began in his turn to survey the audience. Sitting alone, in the front of a box immediately opposite, but situated on the third row, was a woman of exquisite beauty, dressed in a Greek costume, which, evidently, from the ease and grace with which she wore it, was her national attire. Behind her, but in deep shadow, was the outline of a masculine figure, but the features of this latter personage it was not possible to distinguish. Franz could not forbear breaking in upon the apparently interesting conversation passing between the Countess and Albert, to inquire of the former if she knew who was the far Albanian opposite, since beauty such as hers was well worthy of being observed by either sex. "'All I can tell about her,' replied the Countess, "'is that she has been at Rome since the beginning of the season. For I saw her where she now sits the very first night of the season.' and since then she has never missed a performance. Sometimes she is accompanied by the person who is now with her, and at others she is merely attended by a black servant. And what do you think of her personal appearance? Oh, I consider her perfectly lovely. She is just my idea of what Medora must have been. Franz and the Countess exchanged a smile, and then the latter resumed her conversation with Albert, while Franz returned to his previous survey of the house and company. The curtain rose on the ballet, which was one of those excellent specimens of the Italian school, admirably arranged and put on the stage by Henry, who has established for himself a great reputation throughout Italy for his taste and skill in the choreographic art, one of those masterly productions of grace, method, and elegance in which the whole corp of ballet, from the principal dancers to the humblest supernumerary, are all engaged on the stage at the same time, and a hundred and fifty persons may be seen exhibiting the same attitude, or elevating the same arm or leg, with a simultaneous movement, that would lead you to suppose that but one mind, one act of volition influenced the moving mass. The ballet was called Poliska. However much the ballet might have claimed his attention, Franz was too deeply occupied with the beautiful Greek to take any note of it while she seemed to experience an almost childlike delight in watching it, her eager, animated looks contrasting strongly with the utter indifference of her companion, who, during the whole time the piece lasted, never even moved, not even when the furious, crashing din produced by the trumpets, cymbals, and the Chinese bells sounded their loudest from the orchestra. Of this he took no heed, but was, as far as appearances might be trusted, enjoying soft repose and bright celestial dreams. The ballet, at length, came to a close. 
and the curtain fell amid the loud, unanimous plaudits of an enthusiastic and delighted audience. Owing to the very judicious plan of dividing the two acts of the opera with the ballet, the pauses between the performances are very short, the singers in the opera having time to repose themselves and change their costume, when necessary, while the dancers are executing their pirouettes and exhibiting their graceful steps. The overture of the second act began, and, at the first sound of the leader's bow across his violin, Franz observed the sleeper slowly arise and approach the Greek girl, who turned around to say a few words to him, and then, leaning forward again on the railing of her box, she became as absorbed as before in what was going on. The countenance of the person who had addressed her remained so completely in the shade that, though Franz tried his utmost, he could not distinguish a single feature. The curtain rose, and the attention of Hans was attracted by the actors, and his eyes turned from the box containing the Greek girl and her strange companion to watch the business of the stage. Most of my readers are aware that the second act of Parisina opens with the celebrated and effective duet in which Parisina, while sleeping, betrays to Atto the secret of her love for Hugo. The injured husband goes through all the emotions of jealousy, until conviction seizes on his mind, and then, in a frenzy of rage and indignation, he awakens his guilty wife to tell her that he knows her guilt, and to threaten her with his vengeance. This duet is one of the most beautiful, expressive, and terrible conceptions that has ever emanated from the fruitful pen of Donizetti. Franz now listened to it for the third time, yet its note, so tenderly expressive and featurely grand as the wretched husband and wife give vent to their different griefs and passions, thrilled through the soul of Franz with an effect equal to his first emotions upon hearing it. Excited beyond his usual calm demeanor, Franz rose with the audience, and was about to join the loud, enthusiastic applause that followed. But suddenly his purpose was arrested. His hands fell by his sides, and the half-uttered bravos expired on his lips. The occupant of the box in which the Greek girl sat appeared to share the universal admiration that prevailed, for he left his seat to stand up in front, so that, his countenance being fully revealed, Franz had no difficulty in recognizing him as the mysterious inhabitant of Monte Cristo, and the very same person he had encountered the preceding evening in the ruins of the Colosseum and whose voice and figure had seemed so familiar to him. All doubt of his identity was now at an end. His singular host evidently resided at Rome. The surprise and agitation occasioned by this full confirmation of Hans's former suspicion had no doubt imparted a corresponding expression to his features. For the countess, after gazing with a puzzled look at his face, burst into a fit of laughter, and begged to know what had happened. Countess, returned Franz, totally unheeding her raillery. I asked you, a short time since, if you knew any particulars respecting the Albanian lady opposite. I must now beseech you to inform me who and what is her husband. Nay, answered the Countess, I know no more of him than yourself. Perhaps you never before noticed him. What a question, so truly French! Do you not know that we Italians have eyes only for the man we love? True, replied Franz. All I can say is, continued the countess, taking up the lorgnette and directing it toward the box in question, that the gentleman whose history I am unable to furnish seems to me as though he had just been dug up. He looks more like a corpse permitted by some friendly grave-digger to quit his tomb for a while and revisit this earth of ours than anything human. How ghastly pale is he! Oh, he is always as colorless as you now see him, said Franz. Then you know him? Almost screamed the countess. Oh, pray do, for heaven's sake, tell us all about. Is he a vampire, or a resuscitated corpse, or what? I fancy I have seen him before, and I even think he recognizes me. And I can well understand, said the countess, shrugging up her beautiful shoulders, as though an involuntary shudder passed through her veins, that those who have once seen that man will never be likely to forget him. 
The sensation experienced by Franz was evidently not particular to himself. Another, and wholly uninterested person, felt the same unaccountable awe and misgiving. Well, inquired Franz, after the countess had a second time directed her lorgnette at the box, what do you think of our opposite neighbor? Well, that he is no other than Lord Ruthwin himself in a living form. This fresh allusion to Byron, Scott, of course, the son of an ill-fated sire, and the father of a yet more unfortunate family, bore in his looks that cast of inauspicious melancholy by which the physiognomist of that time pretended to distinguish those who were predestined to a violent and unhappy death. The Abbot, Chapter 22 Drew a smile to Franz's countenance, although he could but allow that if anything was likely to induce belief in the existence of vampires, it would be the presence of such a man as the mysterious personage before him. I must positively find out who and what he is, said Franz, rising from his seat. No, no, cried the countess, you must not leave me. I depend upon you to escort me home. Oh, indeed, I cannot permit you to go. Is it possible, whispered Franz, that you entertain any fear? I'll tell you, answered the countess. Byron had the most perfect belief in the existence of vampires, and even assured me that he had seen them. The description he gave me perfectly corresponds with the features and character of the man before us. Oh, he is the exact personification of what I have been led to expect. The cold black hair, large, bright, glittering eyes, in which a wild, unearthly fire seems burning. The same ghastly paleness. Then observe, too, that the woman with him is altogether unlike all others of her sex. She's a foreigner, a stranger. Nobody knows who she is, or where she comes from. No doubt she belongs to the same horrible race he does, and is, like himself, a dealer in magical arts. I entreat of you not to go near him, at least tonight, and if tomorrow your curiosity still continues as great, pursue your researches if you will, but tonight you neither can nor shall. For that purpose I mean to keep you all to myself. Franz protested he could not defer his pursuit till the following day, for many reasons. Listen to me, said the countess, and do not be so very headstrong. I am going home. I have a party at my house tonight, and therefore cannot possibly remain till the end of the opera. Now I cannot for one instant believe you so devoid of gallantry as to refuse a lady your escort when she even condescends to ask you for it. There was nothing else left for Franz to do but to take up his hat, open the door of the box, and offer the countess his arm. It was quite evident, by her manner, that her uneasiness was not feigned and Franz himself could not resist a feeling of superstitious dread, so much the stronger in him, as it arose from a variety of corroborative recollections, while the terror of the countess sprang from an instinctive belief, originally created in her mind by the wild tales she had listened to till she believed them truth. Franz could even feel her arm tremble as he assisted her into the carriage. Upon arriving at her hotel, Franz perceived that she had deceived him when she spoke of expecting company. On the contrary, her own return before the appointed hour seemed greatly to astonish the servants. "'Excuse my little subterfuge,' said the countess, in reply to her companion's half-reproachful observation on the subject. "'But that horrid man had made me feel quite uncomfortable, and I longed to be alone, that I might compose my startled mind.' Franz essayed to smile. Nay, said she, do not smile. It ill accords with the expression of your countenance, and I am sure it does not spring from your heart. However, promise me one thing. What is it? Promise me, I say. I will do anything you desire, except relinquish my determination of finding out who this man is. I have more reasons than you can imagine for desiring to know who he is from whence he came, and whither he is going. Where he comes from, I am ignorant, but I can readily tell you where he is going to, and that is down below, without the least doubt. Let us only speak of the promise you wish me to make, said Franz. Well, then, 
You must give me your word to return immediately to your hotel, and make no attempt to follow this man to-night. There are certain affinities between the persons we quit and those we meet afterward. For heaven's sake, do not serve as a conductor between that man and me. Pursue your chase after him to-morrow, as eagerly as you please, but never bring him near me, if you would not see me die of terror. And now, good night. Go to your rooms, and try to sleep away all recollections of this evening. For my own part, I am quite sure I shall not be able to close my eyes. So saying, the countess quitted Franz, leaving him unable to decide whether she were merely amusing herself at his expense, or whether her fears and agitations were genuine. Upon his return to the hotel, Franz found Albert in his dressing-gown and slippers, listlessly extended on the sofa, smoking a cigar. "'My dear fellow,' cried he, springing up, "'is it really you? Why, I did not expect to see you before to-morrow.' "'My dear Albert,' replied Franz, "'I am glad of this opportunity to tell you, once and for ever, "'that you entertain a most erroneous notion concerning Italian women. "'I should have thought the continual failure you have met with in all your own love affairs "'might have taught you better by this time. "'Upon my soul, these women would puzzle the very devil to read them aright. "'Why, here, they give you their hand, they press yours in return.' They keep up a whispering conversation, permit you to accompany them home. Why, if a Parisian were to indulge in a quarter of these marks of flattering attention, her reputation would be gone for ever. And the very reason why the women of this fine country put so little restraint on their words and actions is because they live so much in public, and have really nothing to conceal. Besides, you must have perceived that the Countess was really alarmed. At what? at the sight of that respectable gentleman sitting opposite to us in the same box with the lovely Greek girl. Now, for my part, I met them in the lobby after the conclusion of the piece, and, hang me, if I can guess where you took your notions of the other world from. I can assure you that this hobgoblin of yours is a deuce fine-looking fellow, admirably dressed. Indeed, I feel quite sure, from the cut of his clothes, they are made by a first-rate Paris tailor, probably Blin or Hummon. He was rather too pale, certainly, but then, you know, paleness is always looked upon as a strong proof of aristocratic descent and distinguished breeding. Hans smiled, for he well remembered that Albert particularly prided himself on the entire absence of color in his own complexion. Well, that tends to confirm my own ideas, said Hans, that the countess's suspicions were destitute alike of sense and reason. Did he speak in your hearing? And did you catch any of his words? I did, but they were uttered in the Romaic dialect. I knew that from the mixture of Greek words. I don't know whether I ever told you that when I was at college I was rather, rather strong in Greek. He spoke the Romaic language, did he? I think so. That settles it, murmured Franz. Tis he past all doubt. What do you say? Nothing, nothing. But tell me, what were you thinking about when I came in? Oh, I was arranging a little surprise for you. Indeed, of what nature? Why, you know, it is quite impossible to procure a carriage. Certainly, and I also know that we have done all that human means afforded to endeavor to get one. Now then, in this difficulty a bright idea has flashed across my brain. Franz looked at Albert as though he had not much confidence in the suggestion of his imagination. "'I tell you what, Sir Franz,' cried Albert, "'you deserve to be called out for such a misgiving and incredulous glance as that you were pleased to bestow on me just now. And I promise to give you the satisfaction of a gentleman if your scheme turns out as ingenious as you assert. "'Well, then, hearken to me. I listen.' You agree, do you not, that obtaining a carriage is out of the question? I do. Neither can we procure horses. True, we have offered any sum, but have failed. Well, now, what do you say to a cart? I dare say such a thing might be had. Very possibly. And a pair of oxen? As easily found as the cart. Then you see, my good fellow, with a cart and a couple of oxen, our business can be managed. The cart must be tastefully ornamented. And if you and I dress ourselves as Napolitan reapers, 
we may get up a striking tableau after the manner of that splendid picture by leopold robert it would add greatly to the effect if the countess would join us in the costume of a peasant from Pusoli or sorrento our group would then be quite complete more especially as the countess is quite beautiful enough to represent a madonna well said franz this time albert i am bound to give you credit for having hit upon the most capital idea and quite a national one too replied albert with gratified pride a mere mask borrowed from our own festivities ha ha you romans you thought to make us unhappy strangers trot at the heels of your processions like so many lazzaroni because no carriages or horses are to be had in your beggarly city but you don't know us when we can't have one thing we invent another and have you communicated your triumphant idea to anybody only to our host upon my return home i sent for him and i then explained to him what i wished to procure he assured me that nothing would be easier than to furnish all i desired one thing i was sorry for when i bade him have the horns of the oxen glided he told me there would not be time as it would require three days to do that so you see we must do without this little superfluity and where is he now who our host gone out in search of our equipage by to-morrow it might be too late then he will be able to give us an answer to-night oh i expect him every minute at this instant the door opened and the head of signor pastrini appeared permesso inquired he certainly certainly cried franz come in mine host now then asked albert eagerly have you found the desired cart and oxen better than that replied signor pastrini with the air of a man perfectly satisfied with himself take care my worthy host said albert better is a sure enemy to well let your excellencies only leave the matter to me returned signor pastrini in a tone indicative of unbounded self-confidence but what have you done asked franz speak out there's a worthy fellow your excellencies are aware responded the landlord swelling with importance that the count of monte cristo is living on the same floor with yourselves i should think we did know it exclaimed albert since it is owing to that circumstance that we are packed into these small rooms like two poor students in the back streets of paris well then the count of monte cristo hearing of the dilemma in which you are placed has sent to offer you seats in his carriage and two places at his windows in the palazzo rospoli the friends looked at each other with unutterable surprise but do you think asked albert that we ought to accept such offers from a perfect stranger what sort of person is this count of monte cristo asked franz of his host a very great nobleman but whether maltese or sicilian i cannot exactly say but this i know that he is noble as a borghese and rich as a gold mine it seems to me said franz speaking in an undertone to albert that if this person merited the high panegyrics of our landlord he would have conveyed his invitation through another channel and not permitted it to be brought to us in this unceremonious way he would have written or at this instant someone knocked at the door come in said franz a servant wearing a livery of considerable style and richness appeared at the threshold and placing two cards in the landlord's hands who forthwith presented them to the two young men he said please to deliver these from the count of monte cristo to viscount albert de morcerf and mr franz d'epinay the count of monte cristo continued the servant begs these gentlemen's permission to wait upon them as their neighbour and he will be honoured by an intimation of what time they will please to receive him faith franz whispered albert there is not much to find fault with here tell the count replied franz that we will do ourselves the pleasure of calling on him the servant bowed and retired that is what i call an elegant mode of attack said albert you were quite correct in what you said signor pastrini the count of monte cristo is unquestionably a man of first-rate breeding and knowledge of the world then you accept his offer said the host of course we do replied albert still i must own i am sorry to be obliged to give up the cart and the group of reapers it would have produced such an effect 
and were it not for the windows at the Palazzo Rospoli, by way of recompense for the loss of our beautiful scheme, I don't know but what I should have held on by my original plan. What say you, friends? Oh, I agree with you. The windows in the Palazzo Rospoli alone decided me. The truth was that the mention of two places in the Palazzo Rospoli had recalled to Franz the conversation he had overheard the preceding evening in the ruins of the Colosseum between the mysterious unknown and the Transtiberine, in which the stranger in the cloak had undertaken to obtain the freedom of a condemned criminal, and if this muffled-up individual proved, as Franz felt sure he would, the same as the person he had just seen in the Teatro Argentino, then he should be able to establish his identity, and also to prosecute his researches respecting him with perfect facility and freedom. Franz passed the night in confused dreams respecting the two meetings he had already had with his mysterious tormentor, and in winking speculations as to what the morrow would produce. The next day must clear up every doubt, and unless his neighbor and would-be friend, the Count of Monte Cristo, possessed the ring of guise, and by its power was able to render himself invisible, it was very certain he could not escape this time. Eight o'clock found Franz up and dressed, while Albert, who had not the same motives for rising early, was still soundly asleep. The first act of Franz was to summon his landlord, who presented himself with his accustomed obsequiousness. Pray, Signor Pastrini, asked Franz, is not some execution appointed to take place to-day? Yes, Your Excellency, but if your reason for inquiry is that you may procure a window to view it from, you are much too late. Oh, no, answered Franz, I had no such intention, and even if I had felt a wish to witness the spectacle, I might have done so from Monte Piccino. Could I not? Ah, explained mine host, I did not think it likely Your Excellency would have chosen to mingle with such a rabble as are always collected on that hill, which, indeed, they consider as exclusively belonging to themselves. Very possibly I may not go, answered Franz, but in case I feel disposed, give me some particulars of today's executions. What particulars would Your Excellency like to hear? Why, the number of persons condemned to suffer, their names and description of the death they are to die. That happens just lucky, Your Excellency. Only a few minutes ago they brought me the tavoletas. What are they? Sort of wooden tablets hung up at the corners of streets the evening before an execution, on which is pasted up a paper containing the names of the condemned persons, their crimes, and mode of punishment. The reason for so publicly announcing all this is that all good and faithful Catholics may offer up their prayers for the unfortunate culprits, and, above all, beseech of heaven to grant them a sincere repentance. And these tablets are brought to you, that you may add your prayers to those of the faithful, are they? asked Franz somewhat incredulously. Oh, dear no, Your Excellency, I have not time for anybody's affairs but my own, and those of my honourable guest. But I make an agreement with the man who pastes up the papers, and he brings them to me as he would the plebeals, that in case any person staying at my hotel should like to witness an execution, he may obtain very requisite information concerning the time and place, etc. Upon my word, that is a most delicate attention on your part, Signor Pastrini, cried Franz. Why, Your Excellency, returned the landlord, chuckling and rubbing his hands with infinite complacency, I think I may take upon myself to say I neglect nothing to deserve the support and patronage of the noble visitors to this poor hotel. I see that plainly enough, my most excellent host, and you may rely upon me to proclaim so striking a proof of your attention to your guests wherever I go. Meanwhile, oblige me by a sight of one of these tavoletas. Nothing can be easier than to comply with your excellency's wish, said the landlord, opening the door of the chamber. I have caused one to be placed on the landing, close by your apartment. Then, taking the tablet from the wall, he handed it to Franz, who read as follows. The public is informed that on Wednesday, February 23rd, being the first day of the carnival, executions will take place in the Plaza del Popolo, by order of the Tribunal of the Rota, of two persons named Andrea Rondola, and Peppino, 
otherwise called Rocca Priori, the former found guilty of the murder of a venerable and exemplary priest, the name Don Cesare Torlini, canon of the Church of St. John Lateran, and the latter convicted of being an accomplice to the atrocious and sanguinary bandit Luigi Vampa and his band. The first-named malefactor will be subjected to the Mazzuola, the second culprit beheaded. The prayers of all good Christians are entreated for these unfortunate men, that it may please God to awaken them to a sense of their guilt, and to grant them a hearty and sincere repentance for their crimes. This was precisely what Franz had heard the evening before in the ruins of the Colosseum. No part of the program deferred. The names of the condemned persons, their crimes, and mode of punishment, all agreed with his previous information. In all probability, therefore, the Transseverin was no more than the bandit Luigi Vampa himself, and the man shrouded in the mantle, the same he had known as Sinbad the sailor, but who, no doubt, was still pursuing his philanthropic expeditions in Rome, as he had already done at Porto Vecchio and Tunis. Time was getting on, however, and Franz deemed it advisable to awaken Albert, but at the moment he prepared to proceed to his chamber, his friend entered the room in perfect costume for the day. The anticipated delights of the carnival had so run in his head as to make him leave his pillow long before his usual hour. Now, my excellent Signor Pastrini, said Franz, addressing his landlord, since we are both ready, do you think we may proceed at once to visit the Count of Monte Cristo? Most assuredly, replied he. The Count of Monte Cristo is always an early riser and I can answer for his having been up these two hours. Then you really consider we shall not be intruding, if we pay our respects to him directly? Oh, I am quite sure. I will take all the blame on myself if you find I have led you into an error. Well, then, if it be so, are you ready, Albert? Perfectly. Let us go and return our best thanks for his courtesy. Yes, let us do so. The landlord preceded the friends across the landing, which was all that separated them from the apartments of the count, rang at the bell, and, upon the door being opened by a servant, said, I signori francesi. The domestic bowed respectfully, and invited them to enter. They passed through two rooms, furnished in a luxurious manner, they had not expected to see under the roof of Signor Pastrini, and were shown into an elegant fitted-up drawing-room. The richest turkey carpets covered the floor, and the softest and most inviting couches, easy chairs, and sofas offered their high-piled and yielding cushions to such as desired repose or refreshment. Splendid paintings by the first masters were ranged against the walls, intermingled with magnificent trophies of war, while heavy curtains of costly tapestry were suspended before the different doors of the room. "'If your excellencies will please to be seated,' said the man, I will let the Count know that you are here. And with these words he disappeared behind one of the tapestried portiers. As the door opened, the sound of a guzla reached the ears of the young man, but was almost immediately lost, for the rapid closing of the door merely allowed one rich swell of harmony to enter. Franz and Albert looked inquiringly at each other, then at the gorgeous furnishings of the apartment. Everything seemed more magnificent at a second view than it had done at their first rapid survey. Well, said Franz to his friend, what think you of all this? Why, upon my soul, my dear fellow, it strikes me that our elegant and attentive neighbor must either be some successful stock jobber who has speculated in the fall of the Spanish funds or some prince traveling incog. Hush, hush, replied Franz. We shall ascertain who and what he is. He comes. As Frank spoke, he heard the sound of a door turning on its hinges, and almost immediately afterwards the tapestry was drawn aside, and the owner of all these riches stood before the two young men. Albert instantly rose to meet him, but Franz remained, in a manner, spellbound on his chair, for in the person of him who had just entered he recognized not only the mysterious visitant to the Colosseum, and the occupant of the box at the Teatro Argentino, but also his extraordinary host of Monte Cristo. End of chapter 34
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kelly Becher of Mattapoisett, Massachusetts. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 35 La Mazzolata. Gentlemen, said the Count of Monte Cristo as he entered, I pray you excuse me for suffering my visit to be anticipated, but I fear to disturb you by presenting myself earlier at your apartments. Besides, you sent me word that you would come to me, and I have held myself at your disposal. Franz and I have to thank you a thousand times, Count, returned Albert. You extricated us from a great dilemma, and we were on the point of inventing a very fantastic vehicle when your friendly invitation reached us. Indeed, returned the Count, motioning the two men to sit down. It was the fault of that blockhead Pastrini that I did not sooner assist you in your distress. He did not mention a syllable of your embarrassment to me when he knows that, alone and isolated as I am, I seek every opportunity of making the acquaintance of my neighbors. As soon as I learned I could in any way assist you, I most eagerly seized the opportunity of offering my services. The two young men bowed. Franz had, as yet, found nothing to say. He had come to no determination, and, as nothing in the Count's manner manifested the wish that he should recognize him, he did not know whether to make any allusion to the past, or wait until he had more proof. Besides, although sure it was he who had been in the box the previous evening, he could not be equally positive that this was the man he had seen at the Colosseum. He resolved, therefore, to let things take their course without making any direct overture to the Count. Moreover, he had this advantage. He was master of the Count's secret, while the Count had no hold on Franz, who had nothing to conceal. However, he resolved to lead the conversation to a subject which might possibly clear up his doubts. Count, said he, you have offered us places in your carriage, and at your windows in the Rospoli Palace. Can you tell us where we can obtain a sight of the Piazza del Popolo? Ah, said the Count negligently, looking attentively at Morcerf. Is there not something like an execution upon the Piazza del Popolo? Yes, returned Franz, finding that the Count was coming to the point he wished. Say, I think I told my steward yesterday to attend this. Perhaps I can render you this slight service also. He extended his hand and rang the bell thrice. Did you ever occupy yourself, said he to Franz, with the employment of time and the means of simplifying the summoning of your servants? I have. When I ring once, it is for my valet twice for my major-domo, thrice for my steward, thus I do not waste a minute or a word. Here he is. A man of about forty-five or fifty entered, exactly re resembling the smuggler who had introduced Franz into the cavern, but he did not appear to recognize him. It was evident he had his orders. Monsieur Bertuccio, said the Count, you have procured me windows looking on the Piazza del Popolo as I ordered you yesterday. Yes, Excellency, returned the steward, but it was very late. Did I not tell you I wish for one? replied the Count, frowning. And your Excellency has one, which was let to Prince Lobinyev, but I was obliged to pay a hundred. That will do, that will do, Monsieur Bertuccio. Spare these gentlemen all such domestic arrangements. You have the window that is sufficient. Give orders to the coachman, and be in readiness on the stairs to conduct us to it. The steward bowed and was about to quit the room. Ah, continued the Count, be good enough to ask Pastrini if he has received the tavoletta, and if he can send us an account of the execution. There is no need to do that, said Franz, taking out his tablets, for I saw the account, and I copied it down. Very well, you can retire, Monsieur Bertuccio, but let us know when breakfast is ready. These gentlemen, added he, turning to the two friends, will, I trust, do me the honour to breakfast with me. But, my dear Count, said Albert, we shall abuse your kindness. Not at all. On the contrary, you will give me great pleasure. You will, one or other of you, perhaps both, return it to me at Paris. Monsieur Bertuccio lay covers for three. He then took Franz's tablets out of his hand. We announce, he read in the same tone with which he would have read a newspaper, that today, the 23rd of February, will be executed Andrea Rondolo, guilty of murder on the person of the respected and venerated Don Cesare Torlini canon of the church of St. John Lateran, and Peppino, called Rocca Priori, convicted of complicity with the detestable bandit Luigi Vampa, and the men of his band. Hmph. The first will be Masolato, the second Decapitato. 
Yes, continued the Count, it was at first arranged in this way, but I think since yesterday some change has taken place in the order of the ceremony. Really? said Franz. Yes, I passed the evening at Cardinal Rospigliosi's, and there mention was made of something like a pardon for one of the two men. For Andrea Rondolo, asked Franz. No, replied the Count carelessly. For the other. He glanced at the tablets as if to recall the name. For Peppino, called Rocca Priori, you are thus deprived of seeing a man guillotined, but with the mazuola still remains, which is a very curious punishment when seen for the first time, and even the second, while the other, as you must know, is very simple. The Mondea never fails, never trembles, never strikes thirty times ineffectually, like the soldier who beheaded the Count of Chalais, and to whose tender mercy Richelieu had doubtless recommended the sufferer. Ah, added the Count in a contemptuous tone, do not tell me of European punishments. They are in the infancy, or rather the old age of cruelty. Really, Count, replied Franz, one would think that you had studied the different tortures of all the nations of the world. There are at least few that I have not seen, said the Count coldly, and you took pleasure in beholding these dreadful spectacles? My first sentiment was horror, the second indifference, the third curiosity. Curiosity? That is a terrible word. Why so? In life, our greatest preoccupation is death. Is it not, then, curious to study the different ways by which the soul and body can part, and how, according to their different characters, temperaments, and even the different customs of their countries, different persons bear the transition from life to death, from existence to annihilation? As for myself, I can assure you of one thing. The more men you see die, the easier it becomes to die yourself. And, in my opinion, death may be a torture, but it is not an expiation. I do not quite understand you, replied Franz. Pray explain your meaning, for you excite my curiosity to the highest pitch. Listen, said the Count, and deep hatred mounted to his face, as the blood would to the face of any other. If a man had, by unheard of and excruciating tortures, destroyed your father, your mother, your betrothed, a man, a being who, when torn from you, left a desolation, a wound that never closes in your breast. Do you think the reparation that society gives you is sufficient when it interposes the knife of the guillotine between the base of the occupant and the trapezal muscles of the murderer, and allows him who has caused us years of moral sufferings to escape with a few moments of physical pain? Yes, I know, said Franz, that human justice is insufficient to console us. She can give blood in return for blood, that is all. But you must demand from her only what it is in her power to grant. I will put another case to you, continued the Count, that where society, attacked by the death of a person, avenges death by death. But are there not a thousand tortures by which a man may be made to suffer without society taking the least cognizance of them, or offering him even the insufficient means of vengeance, of which we have just spoken, are there not crimes for which the impalement of the Turks, the augurs of the Persians, the stake and the brand of the Iroquois Indians, are inadequate tortures, and which are unpunished by society? Answer me, do not these crimes exist? Yes, answered Franz, and it is to punish them that dueling is tolerated. Ah, dueling, cried the Count, a a pleasant manner upon my soul of arriving at your end when that end is vengeance a man has carried off your mistress a man has seduced your wife a man has dishonored your daughter he has rendered the whole life of one who had the right to expect from heaven that portion of happiness god has promised to every one of his creatures an existence of misery and infamy and you think you are avenged because you send a ball through the head or pass a sword through the breast of that man who has planted madness in your brain and despair in your heart? And remember, moreover, that it is often he who comes off victorious from the strife, absolved of all the crime in the eyes of the world. No, no, continued the Count. Had I to avenge myself, it is not thus I would take revenge. Then you disapprove of dueling. You would not fight a duel asked Albert in his turn, astonished at this strange theory. "'Oh, yes,' replied the Count. "'Understand me, I would fight a duel for a trifle, for an insult, for a blow, and the more so that, thanks to my skill in all bodily exercises, and the indifference to danger I have gradually acquired, I should be almost certain to kill my man, 
Oh, I would fight for such a cause, but in return for a slow, profound, eternal torture. I would give back the same, were it possible, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. As the Orientalists say, our masters in everything, those favored creatures who have formed for themselves a life of dreams and paradise of realities. But, said Franz to the Count, with this theory, which renders you at once judge and executioner of your own cause, it would be difficult to adopt a course that would forever prevent your falling under the power of the law. Hatred is blind. Rage carries you away, and he who pours out vengeance runs the risk of tasting a bitter draught. Yes, if he be poor and inexperienced, not if he be rich and skilful. Besides, the worst that could happen to him would be the punishment of which we have already spoken, and which the philanthropic French Revolution has substituted for being torn to pieces by horses, or broken on the wheel. What matters this punishment, as long as he is avenged? On my word, I almost regret that in all probability this miserable Peppino will not be beheaded, as you might have had an opportunity then of seeing how short a time the punishment lasts, and whether it is worth even mentioning. But, really, this is a most singular conversation for the carnival, gentlemen. How did it arise? Ah, I recollect, you asked for a place at my window. You shall have it, but let us first sit down to table, for here comes the servant to inform us that breakfast is ready. As he spoke, a servant opened one of the four doors of the apartment, saying, Al suo comodo. The two young men arose and entered the breakfast room. During the meal, which was excellent and admirably served, Franz looked repeatedly at Albert, in order to observe the impressions which he doubted not had been made on him by the words of their entertainer, but whether with his usual carelessness he had paid but little attention to him, whether the explanation of the Count of Monte Cristo with regard to dueling had satisfied him, or whether the events which Franz knew of had their effect on him alone. He remarked that his companion did not pay the least regard to them but on the contrary ate like a man who for the last four or five months had been condemned to partake of Italian cookery, that is, the worst in the world. As for the Count, he just touched the dishes. He seemed to fulfill the duties of a host by sitting down with his guests, and awaited their departure to be served with some strange or more delicate food. This brought back to Franz, in spite of himself, the recollection of the terror with which the Count had inspired the Countess G., and her firm conviction that the man in the opposite box was a vampire. At the end of the breakfast, Franz took out his watch. Well, said the Count, what are you doing? You must excuse us, Count, returned Franz, but we have still much to do. What may that be? We have no masks, and it is absolutely necessary to produce them. Oh, do not concern yourself about that. We have, I think, a private room in the Piazza del Popolo, I will have whatever costumes you choose brought to us, and you can dress there. After the execution, cried Franz, before or after, whichever you please, opposite the scaffold, the scaffold forms part of the fetch. Count, I've reflected on the matter, said Franz. I thank you for your courtesy, but I shall content myself with accepting a place in your carriage and at your window at the Rospoli Palace, and I leave you at liberty to dispose of my place at the Piazza del Popolo. "'But I warn you, you elude a very curious sight,' returned the Count. "'You will describe it to me,' replied Franz, "'and the recital from your lips will make as great an impression on me as if I had witnessed it. "'I have more than once intended witnessing an execution, "'but I have never been able to make up my mind. "'And you, Albert?' "'I,' replied the Viscount, "'I saw Castaing executed, but I think I was rather intoxicated that day.' for I had quitted college the same morning, and we had passed the previous night at the tavern. Besides, it is no reason, because you have not seen an execution at Paris, that you should not see one anywhere else. When you travel, it is to see everything. Think what a figure you will make when you are asked, How do they execute at Rome? And you reply, I do not know. And besides, they say that the culprit is an infamous scoundrel who killed with a log of wood a worthy canon who had brought him up like his own son. Diable, when a churchman is killed, it should be with a different weapon than a log, especially when he's behaved like a father. If you went to Spain, would you not see the bullfight? Well, suppose it is a bullfight you are going to see. Recollect the ancient Romans of the circus and the sport where they killed three hundred lions and a hundred men. 
think of the eighty thousand applauding spectators, the sage matrons who took their daughters, and the charming vestals who made with the thumb of their white hands the fatal sign that said, Come, dispatch the dying. Shall you go, then, Albert? asked Franz. Ma foi, yes. Like you, I hesitated, but the Count's eloquence decides me. Let us go, then, said Franz, since you wish it, but on our way to the Piazza del Popolo, I wish to pass through the Corso. Is this possible, Count? On foot, yes. In carriage, no. I will go on foot, then. Is it important that you should go that way? Yes, there is something I wish to see. Well, we will all go by the Corso. We will send the carriage to wait for us on the Piazza del Popolo, by the Strada del Babuino, for I shall be glad to pass myself through the Corso f to see if some orders I have given have been executed. Excellency, said a servant, opening the door, a man in the dress of a penitent wishes to speak to you. Ah, yes, returned the Count, I know who he is. Gentlemen, will you return to the salon? You will find good cigars on the center table. I will be with you directly. The young men rose and returned into the salon, while the Count, again apologizing, left by another door. Albert, who was a great smoker, and who had considered it no small sacrifice to be deprived of the cigars of the Café de Paris, approached the table, and uttered a cry of joy, perceiving some veritable puros. "'Well,' asked Franz, "'what think you of the Count of Monte Cristo?' "'What do I think?' said Albert, evidently surprised at such a question from his companion. "'I think he's a delightful fellow, who does the honours of his table admirably, who has travelled much, read much, is, like Brutus, of the Stoic school, and moreover, added he, sending a volume of smoke up towards the ceiling, that he has excellent cigars. Such was Albert's opinion of the Count, and as Franz well knew that Albert professed never to form an opinion except upon long reflection, he made no attempt to change it. But, said he, did you observe one very singular thing? What? How attentively he looked at you. At me? Yes, Albert reflected. Ah, replied he, sighing, that is not very surprising. I have been more than a year absent from Paris, and my clothes are of a most antiquated cut. The Count takes me for a provincial. The first opportunity you have, undeceive him, I beg, and tell him I am nothing of the kind. Franz smiled. An instant after the Count entered. I am now quite at your service, gentlemen, said he. The carriage is going one way to the Piazza del Popolo, and we will go another. And, if you please, buy the Corso. Take some more of these cigars, Monsieur de Morcerf. With all my heart, returned Albert. Italian cigars are horrible. When you come to Paris, I will return all this. I will not refuse. I intend going there soon, and since you allow me, I will pay you a visit. Come, we have not any time to lose. It is half past twelve. Let us set off. All three descended. The coachman received his master's orders and drove down the Via del Babuino while well, the three gentlemen walked along the Piazza di Spagni and the Via Fratina, which led directly between the Fiano and Rospoli palaces. Franz's attention was directed towards the windows of that last palace, for he had not forgotten the signal agreed upon between the man in the mantle and the Transsevere peasant. "'Which are your windows?' asked he of the Count, with as much indifference as he could assume. "'The three last,' returned he, with a negligence evidently unaffected for he could not imagine with what intention the question was put. Franz glanced rapidly towards the three windows. The side windows were hung with yellow damask, and the center one with white damask and a red cover. The man in the mantle had kept his promise to the trans and there could now be no doubt that he was the Count. The three windows were still untenanted. Preparations were masking on every side. Chairs were placed, scaffolds were raised, and windows were hung with flags. The mask could not appear, the carriages could not move about, but the masks were visible behind the windows, the carriages and the doors. Franz, Albert, and the Count continued to descend the Corso. As they approached the Piazza del Popolo, the crowd became more dense, and above the heads of the multitude, two objects were visible. The obelisk, surmounted by a cross, which, at the point where the three streets del Babuino del Corso and di Repetta met, the two uprights of the scaffold, between which glittered the curved knife of the Mandea. At the corner of the street they met the Count's steward, who was awaiting his master. The window, let at an exorbitant price, which the Count had doubtless wished to conceal from his guests, 
was on the second floor of the great palace, situated between the Via del Babuino and the Monte Pincio. It consisted, as we have said, of a small dressing room, opening into a bedroom, and when the door of communication was shut, the inmates were quite alone. On chairs were laid elegant masquerade costumes of blue and white satin. "'As you left the choice of your costumes to me,' said the Count to the two friends, "'I've had these brought, as they will be the most worn this year, and they are most suitable on account of the confetti, parentheses, sweetmeats, and parentheses, as they do not show the flower.' Franz heard the words of the Count, but imperfectly, and he perhaps did not fully appreciate this new attention to their wishes, for he was wholly absorbed by the spectacle that Piazza del Popolo presented, and by the terrible instrument that was in the centre. It was the first time that Franz had ever seen a guillotine. We say guillotine because the Roman Mandea is formed on almost the same model as the French instrument. The knife, which is shaped like a crescent that cuts with the convex side, falls from a less height, and that is all the difference. Two men, seated on the movable plank on which the victim is laid, were eating their breakfasts while waiting for the criminal. The repast consisted apparently of bread and sausages. One of them lifted the plank, took out a flask of wine, drank some, and then passed it to his companion. These two men were the executioner's assistants. At this sight, Franz felt the perspiration start forth upon his brow. The prisoners transported the previous evening from the Carcere Nuovo to the little church of Santa Maria del Popolo had passed the night, each accompanied by two priests in a chapel closed by a grating before which were two sentinels, who were relieved at intervals. A double line of carboneers, placed on each side of the door of the church, reached to the scaffold and formed a circle around it, leaving a path about ten feet wide, and around the guillotine a space of nearly a hundred feet. All the rest of the square was paved with heads. Many women held their infants on their shoulders, and thus the children had the best view. The Monte Pincio seemed a vast amphitheatre filled with spectators. The balconies of the two churches at the corner of the Via del Babuino and the Via de Ripetta were crammed. The steps even seemed a party-coloured sea There was impelled towards the portico. Every niche in the wall held its living statue. What the Count said was true, the most curious spectacle in life is that of death. And yet, instead of the silence and the solemnity demanded by the occasion, laughter and jests arose from the crowd. It was evident that the execution was, in the eyes of the people, only the commencement of the carnival. Suddenly the tumult ceased, as if by magic, and the doors of the church opened. A brotherhood of penitents, clothed from head to foot in robes of grey sackcloth, with holes for eyes and holding in their hands lighted tapers appeared first the chief marched at the head behind the penitents came a man of vast cloth drawers at the left side of which hung a large knife in a sheath and he bore on his right shoulder a heavy iron sledgehammer this man was the executioner he had moreover sandals bound on his feet by cords behind the executioner came in the order in which they were accompanied to die first peppino and then Andrea. Each was accompanied by two priests. Neither had his eyes bandaged. Peppino walked with a firm step, doubtless aware of what awaited him. Andrea was supported by two priests. Each of them, from time to time, kissed the crucifix a confessor held out to them. At this sight alone, Franz felt his legs tremble under him. He looked at Albert. He was as white as his shirt and mechanically cast away his cigar, although he had not half smoked it. The Count alone seemed unmoved. Nay, more, a slight color seemed striving to rise in his pale cheeks. His nostrils dilated like those of a wild beast that scents its prey, and his lips, half open, disclosed his white teeth, small and sharp like those of a jackal, and yet his features wore an expression of smiling tenderness, such as Franz had never before witnessed in them. His black eyes especially were full of kindness and pity. However, the two culprits advanced, and as they approached, their fates became visible. Peppino was a handsome young man of four or five and twenty, bronzed by the sun. He carried his head erect, and seemed on the watch to see on which side his liberator would appear. Andrea was short and fat. His visage, marked with brutal cruelty, did not indicate age. He might be thirty. In prison he had suffered his beard to grow. His head fell on his shoulder, his legs bent beneath him and his movements were apparently automatic and, and unconscious. "'I thought,' said Franz to the Count, 
that you told me there would be but one execution. I told you true, replied he coldly, and yet here are two culprits. Yes, but only one of these two is about to die. The other has many years to live. If the pardon is to come, there is no time to lose. And see, here it is, said the Count. At the moment when Peppino reached the foot of the Mandea, a priest arrived in some haste, forced his way through the soldiers, and advancing to the chief of the Brotherhood, gave him a folded paper. The piercing eye of Peppino had not his soul. The chief took the paper, unfolded it, and raising his hand, "'Heaven be praised, and his holiness also,' said he in a loud voice. "'There is a pardon for one of the prisoners.' "'A pardon?' cried the people with one voice. "'A pardon?' At this cry Andrea raised his head. "'Pardon for whom?' cried he. Peppino remained breathless. "'A pardon for Peppino, called Roca Priori,' said the principal friar, and he passed the paper to the officer commanding the carbiners, who read and returned it to him. "'For Peppino,' cried Andrea, who seemed roused from the torpor in which he had been plunged. "'Why, for him, and not for me?' We ought to die together. I was promised he should die with me. You have no right to put me to death alone. I will not die alone. I will not. And he broke from the priest, struggling and raving like a wild beast, and striving desperately to break the cords that bound his hands. The executioner made a sign, and his two assistants leaped the scaffold and seized him. What is going on? asked friends of the Count. As all the talk was in the Roman dialect, he had not perfectly understood it. Do you not see? returned the Count. That this human creature who was about to die is furious that his fellow sufferer does not perish with him and were he able he would rather tear him to pieces with his teeth and nails than let him enjoy the life he himself is about to be deprived of oh man man race of crocodiles cried the count extending his clinched hand towards the crowd how well do i recognize you there and that at all times you are worthy of yourselves. Meanwhile Andrea and the two executioners were struggling on the ground, and he kept exclaiming, He ought to die, he shall die, I will not die alone. Look, look, seizing the young man's hand, look, for on my soul it is curious. Here is a man who had resigned himself to his fate, who was going to the scaffold to die. Like a coward it is true. But he was about to die without resistance. Do you know what gave him strength? Do you know what consoled him? It was that another partook of his punishment, that another partook of his anguish, that another was to die before him. Lead two sheep to the butchers, two oxen to the slaughterhouse, and make one of them understand that his companion will not die. The sheep will bleat for pleasure, the ox will bellow with joy. But man, man, whom God created in his own image, man, upon whom God has laid his first, his sole commandment, to love his neighbor, man, to whom God has given a voice to express his thoughts, what is his first cry when he hears his fellow man is saved? A blasphemy. Honor to man, this masterpiece of nature, this king of the creation. And the Count burst into laughter. A terrible laughter that showed he must have suffered horribly to be able thus to laugh. However, the struggle still continued, and it was dreadful to witness. The people all took part against Andrea, and twenty thousand voices cried, Put him to death! Put him to death! Franz sprang back, but the Count seized his arm and held him before the window. What are you doing? said he. Do you pity him? If you heard the cry of Mad Dog, you would take your gun would unhesitatingly shoot the poor beast who, after all, was only guilty of having been bitten by another dog. And yet you pity a man who, without being bitten by one of his race, has yet murdered his benefactor, and who, now unable to kill anyone, because his hands are bound, wishes to see his companion in captivity perish. No, no, look, look! The command was needless. Franz was fascinated by the horrible spectacle. The two assistants had borne Andrea to the scaffold, and there, in spite of his struggles, his bites and his cries, had forced him to his knees. During this time the executioner had raised his mace, and signed to them to get out of the way. The criminal strove to rise, but, 
ere he had time, the mace fell on his left temple. A dull and heavy sound was heard, and the man dropped like an ox on his face, and then turned over on his back. The executioner let fall his mace, drew his knife, and with one stroke opened his throat, and mounting on his stomach, stamped violently on it with his feet. At every stroke a jet of blood sprang from the wound. This time Franz could contain himself no longer, but sank, half fainting, into a seat. Albert, with his eyes closed, was standing grasping the window curtains. The Count was erect and triumphant, like the avenging angel. End of chapter 35is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Chapter 36 The Carnival at Rome When France recovered his senses, he saw Albert drinking a glass of water, of which, to judge from his pallor, he stood in great need, and the Count, who was assuming his masquerade costume. He glanced mechanically towards the square. The scene was wholly changed. Scaffold, executioners, victims, all had disappeared. Only the people remained, full of noise and excitement. The bell of Monte Sittorio, which only sounds on the Pope's decease and the opening of the carnival, was ringing a joyous peal. Well, asked here the Count, what has then happened? Nothing, replied the Count. Only as you see, the carnival is commenced. Make haste and dress yourself. In fact, said Franz, this horrible scene has passed away like a dream. It is but a dream, a nightmare, that has disturbed you. Yes, that I have suffered, but the culprit. That is a dream also. Only he has remained asleep, while you have awakened. And who knows which of you is the most fortunate. But Peppino, what has become of him? Peppino is a lad of sense, who, unlike most men, who are happy in proportion as they are noticed, was delighted to see that the general attention was directed towards his companion. He profited by this distraction to slip away among the crowd, without even thanking the worthy priest who accompanied him. Decidedly, man is an ungrateful and egotistical animal. But dress yourself. See, Monsieur de Morcerf sets you the example. Albert was drawing on the satin pantaloon over his black trousers and varnished boots. Well, Albert, said Franz, do you feel much inclined to join the revels? Come, answer frankly. Ma foi, no, returned Albert, but I am really glad to have seen such a sight, and I understand what the Count said, but when you have once habituated yourself to a similar spectacle, it is the only one that causes you any emotion. Without reflecting that this is the only moment in which you can study character, said the Count. On the steps of the scaffold, death tears out the mask that has been worn through life, and the real visage is disclosed. It must be allowed that Andrea was not very handsome, the hideous scandal. Come, dress yourselves, gentlemen, dress yourselves. Franz felt it would be ridiculous not to follow his two companions' example. He assumed his costume, and fastened on the mask that scarcely equalled the pallor of his own face. The toilet finished, they descended. The carriage awaited them at the door, filled with sweetmeats and bouquet. They fell into the line of carriages. It is difficult to form an idea of the perfect change that had taken place. The stand of the spectacle of gloomy and silent death, 
The Piazza del Popolo presented a spectacle of gay and noisy mirth and revelry. A crowd of masks flowed in from all sides, emerging from the doors, descending from the windows. From every street and every corner drove carriages filled with clowns, harlequins, dominoes, mummers, pantomimists, transteverians, knights, and peasants, screaming, fighting, gesticulating, throwing eggs filled with flour, confetti, nosegays, attacking with their sarcasms and their missiles, friends and foes, companions and strangers, indiscriminately, and no one took offence or did anything but laugh. Franz and Albert were like men who, to drive away a violent sorrow, have recourse to wine, and who, as they drink and become intoxicated, feel a thick veil drawn between the past and the present. They saw, or rather continued to see, the image of what they had witnessed. But little by little the general vertigo seized them and they felt themselves obliged to take part in the noise and confusion. A handful of confetti that came from a neighboring carriage, and which, while it covered Morcerf and his two companions with dust, pricked his neck and that portion of his face uncovered by his mask like a hundred pins, incited him to join in the general combat, in which all the masks around him were engaged. He rose in his turn, and, seizing handfuls of confetti and sweetmeats, with which the carriage was filled, cast them with all the force and skill he was master of. The strife had fairly begun, and the recollection of what I had seen half an hour before was gradually effaced from the young men's minds. So much were they occupied by the gay and glittering procession they now beheld. As for the Count of Monte Cristo, he had never for an instant shown any appearance of having been moved. Imagine the large and splendid corso, bordered from one end to the other with lofty palaces, with their balconies hung with carpets, and their windows with flags. At these balconies are three hundred thousand spectators, Romans, Italians, strangers from all parts of the world, the united aristocracy of birth, wealth, and genius. Lovely women, yielding to the influence of the scene, bend over the balconies, or lean from their windows and shower down confetti, which are returned by bouquets. The air seems darkened with the falling confetti and flying flowers. In the streets, the lively cloud is dressed in the most fantastic costumes. Gigantic cabbages walk gravely about, buffalo's heads bellow from men's shoulders, dogs walk on their high legs. In the midst of all this, a mask is lifted, and as in Callot's temptation of Saint Anthony, a lovely face is exhibited, which we would fain follow, but from which we are separated by troops of friends. This will give a faint idea of the carnival at Rome. At the second turn, the Count stopped the carriage, and requested permission to withdraw, leaving the vehicle at the disposal. Franz looked up. They were opposite the Rospoli Palace. At the center window, the one hung with white damask with a red cross, was a blue domino, beneath which Franz's imagination easily pictured the beautiful Greek of the Argentina. Gentlemen, said the Count, springing out. When you are tired of being actors, and wish to become spectators of this scene, you know you have places at my windows. In the meantime, dispose of my coachman, my carriage, and my servants. We have forgotten to mention that the Count's coachman was attired in a bear skin, exactly resembling Audrey's in The Bear and the Pasha. And the two footmen behind were dressed up as green monkeys with spring masks with which they made grimaces at everyone who passed. Franz thanked the Count for his attention. As for Albert, he was busily occupied throwing bouquets at a carriage full of Roman peasants that was passing near him. Unfortunately for him, the line of carriages moved on again, and while he descended the Piazza del Popolo, the other ascended towards the Palazzo di Venezia. Ah, my dear fellow, said he to Franz, you did not see. What? There, that calash, filled with Roman peasants. No. 
well, I am convinced they are all charming women. How unfortunate that you were masked, Albert, said Franz. Here was an opportunity of making up for past disappointments. Oh, replied he, half laughing, half serious, I hope the carnival will not pass without some amends in one shape or the other. But in spite of Albert's hope, the day passed unmarked by any incident, excepting two or three encounters with a carriage full of Roman peasants. At one of these encounters, accidentally or purposely, Albert's mask fell off. He instantly rose and cast the remainder of the bouquets into the carriage. Doubtless, one of the charming females Albert had detected near the coquettish disguise was touched by his gallantry. For as the carriage of the two friends passed her, she threw a bunch of violence. Albert seized it, and as Franz had no reason to suppose it was meant for him, he suffered Albert to retain it. Albert placed it in his buttonhole, and the carriage went triumphantly on. Well, said Franz to him, there is the beginning of an adventure. Laugh if you please, I really think so. So I will not abandon this bouquet. Well, oh, dear, returned Franz, laughing, in token of your ingratitude. The jest, however, soon appeared to become earnest, for when Albert and Franz again encountered the carriage with the Condadini, the one who had thrown the violets to Albert clapped her hands when she beheld them in his buttonhole. Bravo, bravo, said Franz. Things go wonderfully. Shall I leave you? Perhaps you would prefer being alone? No, replied he. I will not be caught like a fool at the first disclosure by a rendezvous under the clock, as they say at the opera balls. If a fair peasant wishes to carry matters any further, we shall find her, or rather, she will find us tomorrow. Then she will give me some sign or other, and I shall know what I have to do. On oh, my word, said Franz, you are wise as Nestor and prudent as Ulysses, and your fair Circe must be very skilful or very powerful if she succeed in changing you into a beast of any kind. Albert was right. The fair unknown had resolved, doubtless, to carry the intrigue no further, for although the young man made several more turns, but did not again see the calash, which had turned up one of the neighboring streets. Then they returned to the Rose Paul Palace, but the Count and Blue Domino had also disappeared. The two windows, hung with yellow damask, were still occupied by the persons whom the Count had invited. At this moment the same bell that had proclaimed the beginning of the mascherata sounded the retreat. The file on the corso broke the line, and in a second all the carriages had disappeared. Franz and Albert were opposite the Via degli Marati. The coachman, without saying a word, drew up it, passed along the Piazza di Spagni and the Rospoli Palace, and stopped at the door of the hotel. Signor Pastrini came to the door to receive his guest. Franz hastened to inquire after the Count and to express regret that he had not returned in sufficient time, but Pastrini reassured him by saying that the Count of Monte Cristo had ordered a second carriage for himself, and that it had gone at four o'clock to fetch him from the Rose Paul's palace. The Count had moreover charged him to offer the two friends the key of his box at the Argentine. Franz questioned Albert as to his intentions, but Albert had great projects to put into execution before going to the theatre. And instead of making any answer, he inquired if Signor Pastrini could procure him a tailor. A tailor, said the host, and for what? To make us between now and tomorrow two Roman peasant costumes, returned Albert. The host shook his head. To make you two costumes between now and tomorrow? I ask your Excellency's pardon, but this is quite a French demand. For the next week you will not find a single tailor who would consent to sew six buttons on a waistcoat if you paid him a crown apiece for each button. Then I must give up the idea? No, we have them ready-made. Leave all to me. And tomorrow when you awake, you shall find a collection of costumes with which you will be satisfied. My dear Albert, said Francis, leave all to our host. He has already proved himself full of resources. Let us dine quietly, and afterwards go and see the Algerian captive. Agreed, returned Albert. But remember, Signor Pastrini, that both my friends and myself attach the greatest importance to having tomorrow the costume we have asked for. The host again assured them they might rely on him, and that their wishes should be attended to, upon which Franz and Albert mounted to the apartments, 
and proceeded to disencumber themselves of their costumes. Albert, as he took off his dress, carefully preserved the bunch of violets. It was his token reserved for the morrow. The two friends sat down to table, but they could not refrain from remarking the difference between the Count of Monte Cristo's table and that of Signor Pastrini. Truth compelled Franz, in spite of the dislike he seemed to have taken to the Count, to confess that the advantage was not on Pastrini's side. During desert, the servant inquired at what time they reached for the carriage. Albert and Franz looked at each other, fearing really to abuse the Count's kindness. The servant understood him. His Excellency, the Count of Monte Cristo, had, he said, given positive orders that a carriage was to remain at the Lordship's orders all day, and they could therefore dispose of it without fear of indiscretion. They resolved to profit by the Count's courtesy, and ordered their horses to be harnessed, while they substituted evening dress for that which they had on, and which was somewhat the worse for the numerous combats they had sustained. This precaution taken, they went to the theatre and installed themselves in the Count's box. During the first act, the Countess G. entered. Her first look was at the box where she had seen the Count on the previous evening, so that she perceived Franz and Albert in the place of the very person concerning whom she had expressed so strange an opinion to Franz. Her opera glass was so fixedly directed to them that Franz saw it would be cruel not to satisfy her curiosity and availing himself of one of the privileges of the spectators of the Italian theatres, who used their boxes to hold receptions, the two friends went to pay their respects to the Countess. Scarcely had they entered when she motioned to France to assume the seat of honour. Albert, in his turn, sat behind. Well, said she, hardly giving France time to sit down, it seems you have nothing better to do than to make the acquaintance of this new Lord Ruthven, and you are already the best friends in the world. Without being so far advanced as that, my dear Countess, returned Franz, I cannot deny that we have abused his good nature all day. All day? Yes, this morning we breakfasted with him. We rode in his carriage all day, and now we have taken possession of his box. You know him, then? Yes and no. How so? It is a long story. Tell it to me. It would frighten you too much. So much the more reason. At least, wait until the story has a conclusion. Very well, I prefer a complete history. But tell me how you made his acquaintance. Did anyone introduce you to him? No, it was he who introduced himself to us. When? Last night after we left you. Through what medium? The very prosaic one of our landlord. He is staying then at the Hotel de Londres with you? Not only in the same hotel, but on the same floor. Could he his name? For of course, you know. The Count of Monte Cristo. That is not a family name? No, it is the name of the island he has purchased. And he is a Count? A Tuscan Count? Well, we must put up with that, said the Count, who was herself one of the oldest of Venetian families. What sort of a man is he? Ask the Vicomte de Marseille. You hear, Monsieur de Marseille, I am referred to you, said the Countess. We should be very hard to please, madame, returned Albert. Did we not think him delightful? A fair of ten years standing could not have done more for us, or with more perfect courtesy. Come, observed the Countess, smiling. I see my vampire is only some millionaire who has taken the appearance of Lara in order to avoid being confounded with Monsieur de Rothschild. And you have seen her. Her? The beautiful Greek of yesterday. No, we heard, I think, the sound of her guzzler, but she remained perfectly invisible. When you say invisible, interrupted Albert, it is only to keep up the mystery. For whom do you take the blue domino at the window with the white curtains? Who was this window with white hangings? asked the Countess. At the Rospoli Palace. The Count had three windows at the Rospoli Palace? Yes, did you pass through the corso? Yes. Well, did you notice two windows hung with yellow damask and one with white damask with a red cross? Those were the Count's windows. Why, you must be a neighbor. Do you know where those three windows are worth? Two or three hundred Roman crowns? Two or three thousand? The deuce! 
does his island produce him such a revenue? And does not bring him a bioka? Then why did he purchase it? For a whim. He's an original then. In reality, observed Albert, he seemed to me somewhat eccentric. Were he at Paris and a frequenter of the theatres, I should say he was a poor devil, literally mad. This morning he made two or three exits worthy of Didier or Anthony. At this moment a fresh visitor entered, and according to custom, Franz gave up his seat to him. This circumstance had, moreover, the effect of changing the conversation. An hour afterwards the two friends returned to the hotel. Signor Pastrini had already set about procuring the disguises for the morrow, and he assured them that he would be perfectly satisfied. The next morning, at nine o'clock, he entered Francis' room, followed by a tailor, who had eight or ten Roman peasant costumes on his arm. They selected two, exactly alike, and charged the tailor to sew on each of the hats about twenty yards of ribbon, and to procure them two rather long silk sashes of different colours, with which the lower orders decorate themselves on fair days. Albert was impatient to see how he looked in his new dress. A jacket and breeches of blue velvet, silk stockings with clocks, shoes with buckles, and a silk waistcoat. This picturesque attire set him off to great advantage, and when he had bound the scarf around his waist, and when his hat placed coquettishly on one side, let fall on his shoulder a stream of ribbons, Franz was forced to confess that the costume has much to do with the physical superiority we occurred to certain nations. The Turks used to be so picturesque with the long and flowing robes, but are they not now hideous with their blue fox buttoned up to the chin and their red caps, which made them look like a bottle of wine with a red seal? Franz complimented Albert, who looked at himself in the glass with an unequivocal smile of satisfaction. They were thus engaged when the Count of Monte Cristo entered. Gentlemen, said he, although a companion is agreeable, perfect freedom is sometimes still more agreeable. I come to say that today and for the remainder of the carnival, I leave the carriage entirely at your disposal. The host will tell you I have three or four more, so that you will not inconvenience me in any way. Make use of it, I pray you, for your pleasure or your business. The young men wished to decline, but they could find no good reason for refusing an offer which was so agreeable to them. The Count of Monte Cristo remained a quarter of an hour with them, conversing on all subjects with the greatest ease. He was, as we have already said, perfectly well acquainted with the literature of all countries. A glance at the walls of his salon proved to Franz and Albert that he was a connoisseur of pictures. A few words he let fall showed them that it was no stranger to the sciences, and he seemed much occupied with chemistry. The two friends had ventured to return the count of the breakfast he had given them. It would have been too absurd to offer him in exchange for his excellent table, the very inferior one of Signor Pastrini. They told him so frankly, and he received their excuses with the air of a man who appreciated the delicacy. Albert was charmed with the count's manners and he was only prevented from recognizing him for a perfect gentleman by reason of his varied knowledge. The permission to do what he liked with the carriage pleased him above all, for the fair peasants had appeared in a most elegant carriage the preceding evening, and Albert was not sorry to be upon an equal footing with them. At half-past one they descended. The coachman and footman had put on the livery over the disguises, which gave them a more ridiculous appearance than ever and which gained them the applause of Franz and Albert. Albert had fastened the faded bunch of violets to his buttonhole. At the first sound of the bell, they hastened into the corso by the Via Vittoria. At the second turn, a bunch of fresh violets, thrown from a carriage filled with harlequins, indicated to Albert that, like his friend himself, the peasants had changed their costume also and whether it was a result of chance, or whether a similar feeling had possessed them both, while he had changed his costume, they had assumed his. Albert placed the fresh bouquet in his buttonhole, but he kept the faded one in his hand, and when he again met the calash, 
he raised it to his lips, an action which seemed greatly to amuse not only the fair lady who had thrown it, but her joyous companions also. The day was as gay as the preceding one, perhaps even more animated and noisy. The Count appeared for an instant at his window, but when they again passed he had disappeared. It is almost needless to say that the flirtation between Albert and the fair peasant continued all day. In the evening, on his return, Franz found a letter from the embassy informing him that he would have the honor of being received by his holiness the next day. At each previous visit he had made to Rome, he had solicited and obtained the same favor. And incited as much by religious feeling as by gratitude, he was unwilling to quit the capital of the Christian world without laying his respectful homage at the feet of one of St. Peter's successors, who was set the rare example of all the virtues. He did not even think of the carnival, for in spite of his condescension and touching kindness, one cannot decline oneself without awe before the venerable and noble old man called Gregory the Sixteenth. On his return from the Vatican, Franz carefully avoided the Corso. He brought away with him a treasure of pious thoughts, to which the mad gaiety of the massacres would have been profanation. Ten minutes past five, Albert entered overjoyed. The Harlequin had reassumed her peasant costume, and as she passed, she raised her mask. She was charming. Franz congratulated Albert, who received his congratulations with the air of man conscious that they have merited. He had recognized by certain unmistakable signs that his fair incognita belonged to the aristocracy. He had made up his mind to write to her the next day. Franz remarked while he gave these details that Albert seemed to have something to ask of him, but that he was unwilling to ask it. He insisted upon it, declaring before him that he was willing to make any sacrifice the other wished. Albert let himself be pressed just as long as friendship required, and then avoided to Franz that he would do him great favor by allowing him to walk by the carriage alone the next day. Albert attributed to Franz's absence the extreme kindness of the fair peasant in raising her mask. Franz was not sufficiently egotistical to stop Albert in the middle of an adventure that promised to prove so agreeable to his curiosity and so flattering to his vanity. He felt assured that the perfect indiscretion of his friend would duly inform him of all that happened. And as during three years that he had travelled all over Italy, a similar piece of good fortune had never fallen to his share, Franz was by no means sorry to learn how to act on such an occasion. He therefore promised Albert that he would content himself the morrow with witnessing the carnival from the windows of the Rosporsic Palace. The next morning he saw Albert pass and repass, holding an enormous bouquet, which he doubtless meant to make the bearer of his humorous epistle. This belief was changed into certainty when Franz saw the bouquet, conspicuous by a circle of white camellias, in the hand of a charming harlequin dressed in rose-colored satin. The evening was no longer joy but delirium. Albert nothing doubted that the fair unknown would reply in the same manner. Franz anticipated his wishes by saying that noise fatigued him and that he should pass the next day in writing and looking with his journal. Albert was not deceived, for the next evening Franz saw him and triumphantly shaking a folded paper which he held by one corner. Well, said he, was I mistaken? She has answered you, cried Franz. Read. This word was pronounced in a manner impossible to describe. Franz took the letter and read. Tuesday evening, at seven o'clock, descend from your carriage opposite the Via del Pontefici, and follow the Roman peasant who snatches your torch from you. When you arrive at the first step of the church of San Giacomo, be sure to fasten a knot of rose-colored ribbons to the shoulder of your Halloween costume, in order that you may be recognized. Until then, you will not see me. Constancy and discretion. Well, asked he when Franz had finished, what do you think of it? I think the adventure is assuming a very agreeable appearance. I think so also, replied Albert, and I very much fear you will go alone to the Duke of Brationa's ball. Franz and Albert had received that morning an invitation from the celebrated Roman banker. Take care, Albert, said Franz. All the nobility of Rome will be present. And if you, fair incognita, belong to the higher class of society, she must go there. Whether she goes there or not, my opinion is still the same, but now you have read the letter? Yes. You know how imperfectly the women of the Mezzosito are educated in Italy? This is the name of the lower class. Yes. Well, read the letter again, look at the writing, and find if you can any blemish in the language or orthography. The writing was in reality charming, and the orthography irreproachable. You are born to good fortune, said Franz, as he returned the letter. 
"'Laugh as much as you will,' replied Albert. "'I am in love.' "'You love me,' cried Franz. "'I see that I shall not only go alone to the Duke of Bacciolo's, "'but also return to Florence alone. "'If my unknown be as amiable as she is beautiful,' said Albert, "'I shall fix myself in Rome for six weeks at least. "'I adore Rome, and I have always had a great taste for archaeology. "'Come, two or three more such adventures, "'and I do not despair of seeing you a member of the Academy.' Doubtless Albert was about to discuss seriously his right to the academic chair, when they were informed that dinner was ready. Albert's love had not taken away his appetite. He hastened with Franz to seat himself, free to recommence the discussion after dinner. After dinner, the Count of Monte Cristo was announced. They had not seen him for two days. Signor Pastrini informed them that the business had called him to Kiwita Vecchia. He had started in the previous evening, and had only returned an hour since. He was charming. Whether he kept a watch over himself, or whether by accident he did not sound the acrimonious chords that in other circumstances had been touched, he was tonight like everybody else. The man was an enigma to Franz. The Count must feel sure that Franz recognized him, and yet he had not let fall a single word indicating any previous acquaintance between them. On his side, however great Franz's desire was to allude to this former interview, the fear of being disagreeable to the man who had loaded him in his friend with kindness prevented him from mentioning it. The Count had learned that the two friends had sent to secure a box at the Argentina theatre, and were told they were all let. In consequence, he brought them a key of his own, at least such was the apparent motive of his visit. Franz and Albert made some difficulty, alleging their fear of depriving him of it. The Count replied that as he was going to the Pali theatre, the box at the Argentina theatre would be lost if they did not profit by it. This assurance determined the two friends to accept it. Franz had by degrees become accustomed to the Count's pallor, which had so forcibly struck him at the first meeting. He could not refrain from admiring the severe beauty of his features, the only defect, or rather the principal quality of which, was the pallor. Truly a Byronic hero. Franz could not, will not say see him, but even think of him that imagining his stern head upon Manfred's shoulders or beneath Lara's helmet. His forehead was marked with a line that indicated the constant presence of bitter thoughts. He had the fiery eyes that seemed to penetrate to the very soul, and the haughty and disdainful upper lip that gives to the words that utters a peculiar character that impresses them on the minds of those to whom they are addressed. The Count was no longer young. He was at least forty and yet it was easy to understand that he was formed to rule the young men with whom he was associated at present, and to complete his resemblance with the fantastic heroes of the English poet. The Count seemed to have the power of fascination. Albert was constantly expatiating on their good fortune meeting such a man. Franz was less enthusiastic, but the Count exercised over him also the ascendancy of a strong mind always acquired over a man less than you. He had thought several times of the project the Count had visiting Paris, and he had no doubt but that, with his eccentric character, his characteristic face, and his colossal fortune, he would produce a great effect there. And yet he did not wish to be at Paris when the Count was there. The evening passed as evenings mostly pass at Italian theatres, that is, not in listening to the music, but in paying visits and conversing. The Countess G wished to revive the subject of the Count, but Franz announced he had something far newer to tell her, and in spite of Albert's demonstrations of false modesty, he informed the Countess of the great event which had preoccupied them for the last three days. As similar intrigues are not uncommon in Italy, if we may credit travellers, the Countess did not manifest the least incredulity that congratulated Albert on his success. They promised, upon separating, to meet at the Duke of Braxiano's ball, to which all Rome was invited. The hearing of the bouquet kept her word. She gave Albert no sign of her existence the morrow or the day after. At length, Tuesday came, the last and most tumultuous day of the carnival. On Tuesday, the theatre is open at ten o'clock in the morning, as Lent begins after eight at night. On Tuesday, all those who through want of money, time, or enthusiasm have not been to see the carnival before mingle in the gaiety and contribute to the noise and excitement. From two o'clock till five, Franz and Albert followed in the fiat, exchanging handfuls of confetti with the other carriages and the pedestrians, who crowded amongst the horses' feet and the carriage wheels, without a single accident, a single dispute, or a single fight. The fiats are veritable pleasure days to the Italians. The author of this history, who has resided five or six years in Italy, 
does not recollect to have ever seen a ceremony interrupted by one of those events so common in other countries. Albert was triumphant in his Halloween costume. A knot of rose-coloured ribbons fell from his shoulder almost to the ground, in order that there might be no confusion. Franz wore his patient's costume. As the day advanced, the tumult became greater. There was not on the pavement in the cabbages at the windows a single tongue that was silent, a single arm that did not move. It was a human storm, made up of the sound of cries, and a hail of sweetmeats, flowers, eggs, oranges, and nosegays. At three o'clock the sound of fireworks, let off on the Piazza del Popolo and the Piazza di Venezia, heard with difficulty amid the din and confusion, announced that the races were about to begin. The races, like the Moccoli, are one of the episodes peculiar to the last days of the carnival. On the sound of the fireworks, the carriages instantly broke ranks and retired by the adjacent streets. All these evolutions are executed with an inconceivable address and marvellous rapidity, without the police interfering in the matter. The pedestrians ranged themselves against the walls. Then the trampling of horses and the clashing of steel were heard. A detachment of carbineers. Fifteen abreast galloped up the corso in order to clear it for the barbarian. When the detachment arrived at the Piazza di Venezia, a second volume of fireworks was discharged to announce that the street was clear. Almost instantly, in the midst of a tremendous and general outcry, seven or eight horses, excited by the shouts of three hundred thousand spectators, passed by like lightning. Like that the castle of St. Angelo fired three cannon to indicate that number three had won. Immediately, without any other signal, the carriages moved on, flowing on towards the coast, down all the streets like torrents pent up for a while, which again flow into the parent river. And the immense stream again continued its course between the two granite banks. A new source of noise and movement was added to the crowd as sellers of Moccoletti entered on the scene. The Moccoli, or Moccoletti, are candles which vary in size from the Pascal taper to the rushlight and which give to each actor in the great final scene of the carnival two very serious problems to grapple with. First, how to keep his own Moccoletti alight, and secondly, how to extinguish the Moccoletti of others. The Moccoletti is like life. Man has found that one means of transmitting it, and that one comes from God. But he has discovered a thousand means of taking it away, and the devil has somewhat aided him. The Moccoletto is kindled by approaching it to a light. But who can describe the thousand means of extinguishing the Moccoletto? The gigantic bellows, the monstrous extinguishers, the superhuman fans, every one hastened to purchase Moccoletti, Franz and Albert among the rest. The night was rapidly approaching, and already at the cry of Moccoletti, repeated by the shrill voices of a thousand vendors, two or three stars began to burn among the crowd. It was a signal. At the end of ten minutes, fifty thousand lights glittered descending from the Palazzo di Venezia to the Piazza del Popolo, and mounting from the Piazza del Popolo to the Palazzo di Venezia. It seemed like the fate of jack lanterns It is impossible to form any idea of it without having seen it. Supposing that all the stars had descended from the sky and mingled in a wild dance on the face of the earth, the whole accompanied by cries that were never heard in any other part of the world, the Facino follows the prince, the Transteverin, the citizen, every one blowing, extinguishing, relighting, had old Aeolus appeared at this moment, he would have been proclaimed King of the Moccoli, and Aquila the heir presumptive to the throne. This battle of folly and flame continued for two hours. The course was light as day. The features of the spectators on third and fourth stories were visible. Every five minutes Albert took out his watch. At length it pointed to seven. The two friends were in the wheel at Pontefici. Albert sprang out, bearing his Moccoletto in his hand. Two or three masks strove to knock his Moccoletto out of his hand. But Albert, a first-rate pugilist, sent them rolling in the street, one after the other, and continued his course towards the church of San Giacomo. Steps were crowded with masks, who strove to snatch every other's torches. Franz followed Albert with his eyes, and saw him mount the first step. Instantly, a mask, wearing the well-known costume of a peasant woman, snatched his moccoletto from him without his offering any resistance. Franz was too far off to hear what they said, but without doubt nothing hostile passed, for he saw Albert disappear arm in arm with the peasant girl. He watched them pass through the crowd for some time, but at length he lost sight of them in the Via Macello. Suddenly the bell that gave the signal for the end of the carnival sounded, and at the same instant all the Moccoletti were extinguished as if by enchantment. It seemed as though one immense blast of the wind had extinguished everyone. Franz found himself in utter darkness. No sound was audible save that of the carriages that were carrying the maskers home. Nothing was visible save a few lights that burned behind the windows. The carnival was over. End of chapter 36
Chapter 37 The Catacombs of St. Sebastian In his whole life, perhaps, Franz had never before experienced so sudden an impression, so rapid a transition from gaiety to sadness as in this moment. It seemed as though Rome, under the magic breath of some demon of the night, had suddenly changed into a vast tomb. By a chance which added yet more to the intensity of the darkness, the moon, which was on the wane, did not rise until eleven o'clock, and the streets which the young man traversed were plunged in the deepest obscurity. The distance was short, and at the end of ten minutes his carriage, or rather the Count's, stopped before the Hotel de Londres. Dinner was waiting, but as Albert had told him that he should not return so soon, Franz sat down without him. Signor Pastrini, who had become accustomed to see them dine together, inquired into the cause of his absence, but Franz merely replied that Albert had received on the previous evening an invitation which he had accepted. The sudden extinction of the Moccolietti, the darkness which had replaced the light, and the silence which had succeeded the turmoil, had left in Franz's mind a certain depression which was not free from uneasiness. He therefore dined very silently, in spite of the officious attention of his host, who presented himself two or three times to inquire as if he wanted anything. Franz resolved to wait for Albert as late as possible. He ordered the carriage, therefore, for eleven o'clock, desiring Signor Pastrini to inform him the moment that Albert returned to the hostel. Franz resolved to wait for Albert as late as possible. He ordered the carriage, therefore, for eleven o'clock. Desiring Signor Pastrini to inform him the moment that Albert returned to the hotel. At eleven o'clock, Albert had not come back. Franz dressed himself and went out, telling his host that he was going to pass the night at the Duke of Bracciano's. The house of the Duke of Bracciano is one of the most delightful in Rome. The Duchess, one of the last heiresses of the Colonnas, does its honours with the most consummate grace. And thus the fetes have a European celebrity. Franz and Albert had brought to Rome letters of introduction to them, and their first question on his arrival was to inquire the whereabouts of his travelling companion. Franz replied that he had left him at the moment they were about to extinguish the Macaulay, and that he had lost sight of him in the Via Macello. Then he has not returned, said the Duke. I waited for him until this hour, replied Franz. And do you know whither he went? No, not precisely. However, I think it was something very like a rendezvous. Tiavolo, said the Duke. This is a bad day, or rather a bad night to be out late, is it not, Countess? These words were addressed to the Countess G, who had just arrived and was leaning on the arm of Signor Tolonia, the Duke's brother. I think, on the contrary, that it's a charming night, replied the Countess, and those who are here will complain of but one thing. It's too rapid flight. I am not speaking, said the Duke with a smile, of the persons who are here. The men run no other danger than that of falling in love with you, and the women of falling ill of jealousy at seeing you so lovely. I meant persons who are out in the streets of Rome. Ah, asked the Countess. Who is out in the streets of Rome at this hour, unless it be to go to a ball? Our friend, Albert de Morcerf, Countess, whom I left in pursuit of his unknown, about seven o'clock this evening, said Franz, and whom I have not seen since. And don't you know where he is? Not at all. Is he on? He is in masquerade. You should not have allowed him to go, said the Duke to Franz. You, who know Rome better than he does. You might as well have tried to stop number three of the Barbary, who gained the prize in the race today, replied Franz. And then, moreover, what could happen to him? Who can tell? The night is gloomy and the Tiber is near the Via Michello. Franz felt a shudder run through his veins at observing the feeling of the Duke, and the Countess was so much in unison with his own personal disquietude. I informed them at the hotel that I had the honour of passing the night here, Duke said Franz, and desired them to come and inform me of his return. Ah, replied the Duke, here, I think, is one of my servants who is seeking you. The Duke was not mistaken. When he saw Franz, the servant came up to him. 
Your Excellency, he said, the master of the Hotel de Londres has sent to let you know that a man is waiting for you with a letter from the Vicomte of Morcerf. A letter from the Vicomte? exclaimed Franz. Yes, and who is the man? I do not know. Why did he not bring it to me here? The messenger did not say. And where is the messenger? He went away directly. He saw me enter the ballroom to find you. Oh, said the Countess to Franz, go with all speed, poor young man. Perhaps some accident has happened to him. I will hasten, replied Franz. Shall we see you again to give us any information? inquired the Countess. Yes, if it is not any serious affair, otherwise I cannot answer to what I may do myself. Be prudent in any event, said the Countess. Oh, pray be assured of that. Franz took his hat and went away in haste. He had sent away his carriage with orders for it to fetch him at two o'clock. Fortunately, the Palazzo Bracciano, which is on one side of the Corso and on the other side of the Square of the Holy Apostles, is hardly ten minutes' walk from the Hotel de Londres. As he came near the hotel, Franz saw a man in the middle of the street. He had no doubt that it was the messenger from Albert. The man was wrapped up in a large cloak. He went up to him, but to his extreme astonishment, the stranger first addressed him. "'What wants your excellency of me?' inquired the man. Retreating a step or two, as if to keep on his guard. "'Are not you the person who brought me a letter?' inquired Franz, from the Vicomte of Morcerf. "'Your Excellency lodges at Pastrini's Hotel?' "'I do. "'Your Excellency is the travelling companion of the Vicomte? "'I am. "'Your Excellency's name is the Baron Franz d'Epinay. "'Then it is to Your Excellency that this letter is addressed.' "'Is there any answer?' inquired Franz, taking the letter from him. "'Yes, your friend at least hopes so. "'Come upstairs with me, and I will give it to you.' "'I prefer waiting here.' said the messenger with a smile. And why? Your Excellency will know when you have read the letter. Shall I find you here, then? Certainly. Franz entered the hotel. On the staircase, he met Signor Pastrini. Well? said the landlord. Well, what? responded Franz. You have seen the man who desired to speak with you from your friend. He asked of Franz. Yes, I have seen him, he replied and he has handed this letter to me. Light the candles in my apartment, if you please. The innkeeper gave orders to a servant to go before Franz with a light. The young man had found Signor Pastrini looking very much alarmed, and this had only made him the more anxious to read Albert's letter. And so he went instantly towards the wax light and unfolded it. It was written and signed by Albert. Franz read it twice before he could comprehend what it contained. It was thus worded. My dear fellow, the moment you have received this, have the kindness to take the letter of credit from my pocket book, which you will find in the square drawer of the secretary. Add your own to it. If it be not sufficient, run to Torlonia, draw from him instantly four thousand piastres, and give him to the bearer. It is urgent that I should have this money without delay. I do not say more relying on you as you may rely on me, your friend, Albert de Morcerf. P.S. I now believe in Italian banditti. Below these lines were written in a strange hand the following in Italian. Se al se della mattina le quattro mil piastre non sono nel mi mani alla set il conte Alberto avrà setato di vivere. Luigi Vampa. If by six in the morning the four thousand piastres are not in my hands, by seven o'clock the Count Albert will have ceased to live. This second signature explained everything to Franz, who now understood the objection of the messenger to coming up into the apartment. The street was safer for him. Albert then had fallen into the hands of the famous bandit chief, in whose existence he had for so long a time refused to believe. There was no time to lose. He hastened to open the secretary and found the pocketbook in the drawer, and in it the letter of credit. There were in all six thousand piastres, but of these six thousand, Albert had already expended three thousand. As to Franz, he had no letter of credit, 
as he lived at Florence and had only come to Rome to pass seven or eight days. He had brought but a hundred louis, and of these he had not more than fifty left. The seven or eight hundred piastres were wanting to let them both to make up the sum that Albert required. True, he might in such a case rely on the kindness of Signor Tolonia. He was therefore about to return to the Palazzo Bracciano without loss of time, when suddenly a luminous idea crossed his mind. He remembered the Count of Monte Cristo. Franz was about to ring for Signor Pastrini when that worthy idea presented himself. My dear sir, he said hastily, do you know if the Count is within? Yes, Your Excellency, he has this moment returned. Is he in bed? I should say no. Then ring at his door, if you please, and request him to be so kind as to give me an audience. Signor Prastrini did as he was desired, and returning five minutes after, he said, The Count awaits Your Excellency. Franz went along the corridor, and a servant introduced him to the Count. He was in a small room which Franz had not yet seen, and which was surrounded with divans. The Count came towards him. Well, what good winds blows you hither at this hour, said he. Have you come to sup with me? It would be very kind of you. No, I have come to speak to you of a very serious matter. A serious matter, said the Count, looking at Franz with the earnestness usual to him. And what may it be? Are we alone? Yes, replied the Count, going to the door and returning. Franz gave him Albert's letter. Read that, he said. The Count read it. Well, well, said he. Did you see the postscript? I did, indeed. Seal se della mattina le quattro mile piastre non sono nel mi mana. Alla seti il conte Alberto avra cessato de vivia. Luigi Vampa. What think you of that? inquired Franz. Have you the money? he demands. Yes, all but eight hundred piastres. The count went to his secretary, opened it, and pulling out a drawer filled with gold, said to Franz, I hope you will not offend me by applying to you anyone but myself. You see, on the contrary, I come to you first and instantly, and I thank you. Have what you will, and he, he made a sign to Franz to take what he pleased. Is it absolutely necessary then to send the money to Luigi Vampa? asked the young man, looking fixedly in his turn. At the count, judge for yourselves, replied he. The postscript is explicit. I think that if you would take the trouble of reflecting, you could find a way of simplifying the negotiation, said Franz. How so? returned the Count with surprise. If we were to go together to Luigi Vampa, I am sure he would not refuse you Albert's freedom. What influence can I possibly have over a bandit? Have you not just rendered him a service that can never be forgotten? What is that? Have you not saved Peppino's life? Well, well, said the Count. Who told you that? No matter. I know it. The Count knit his brows and remained silent an instant. And if I went to seek Vampa, would you accompany me? If my society would not be disagreeable, be it so. It's a lovely night, and a walk without room will do us both good. Shall I take my arms? For what purpose? Any money? It is useless. Where is the man who brought the letter? In the street. He awaits the answer? Yes. I must learn where we are going. I will summon him hither. It is useless. He would not come up. To your apartments, perhaps but he will not make any difficulty at entering mine. The Count went to the window of the apartment that looked on the street and whistled in a peculiar manner. The man in the mantle quittled the wall and advanced into the middle of the street. Salite, said the Count, in the same tone in which he would have given an order to his servant. The messenger obeyed without the least hesitation, but rather with alacrity, and mounting the steps at a bound, entered the hotel. Five seconds afterwards he was at the door of the room, Ah, oh, it is you, Peppino, said the Count. But Peppino, instead of answering, threw himself on his knees, seized the Count's hand, and covered it with kisses. Ah, oh, said the Count, you have then not forgotten that I saved your life. That is strange, for it is a week ago. No, Excellency, and never shall I forget it, returned Peppino, with an accent of profound gratitude. Never? That is a long time. But it is something that you believe so. Rise and answer. Peppino glanced anxiously at Franz. Oh, you may speak before His Excellency, said he. He's one of my friends. You allow me to give you this title, continued the Count in French. It is necessary to excite this man's confidence. You can speak before me, said Franz. I am a friend of the Count's. Good, returned Peppino, 
I am ready to answer my questions Your Excellency may address to me. How did the Viscount Albert fall into Luigi's hands? Excellency, the Frenchman's carriage passed several times, the one in which was Teresa. The chief's mistress? Yes, the Frenchman threw her a bouquet. Teresa returned it. All this with the consent of the chief, who was in the carriage. What? Was Luigi Vampa in the carriage with the Roman peasants? cried Franz. It was he who drove, disguised as a coachman, replied Peppino. Well, said the Count. Well, then the Frenchman took off his mask. Frieza, with the chief's consent, did the same. The Frenchman asked for a rendezvous. Frieza gave him one. Only, instead of Frieza, it was Beppo who was on the steps of the church of San Giacomo. What? exclaimed Franz. The peasant girl who snatched his mocoletto from him was a lad of fifteen, replied Papino. But it was no disgrace to your friend to have been deceived. Beppo was taken in plenty of others. And Beppo led him outside the walls, said the Count. Exactly so. A carriage was waiting at the end of the Via Macello. Beppo got in, inviting the Frenchman to follow him, and he did not wait to be asked twice. He gallantly offered the right-hand seat to Beppo and sat by him. Beppo told him he was going to take him to a villa a league from Rome. The Frenchman assured him he would follow him to the end of this world. The coachman went to the Via di Repetta and the Porta San Paola, and when they were two hundred yards outside, as the Frenchman became somewhat too forward, Beppo put a brace of pistols to his head. The coachman pulled up and did the same. At the same time, four of the band, who were concealed on the banks of the Almo, surrounded the carriage. The Frenchman made some resistance and nearly strangled Beppo, but he could not resist five armed men and was forced to yield. They made him get out, walk along the banks of the river, and then brought him to Teresa and Luigi, who were waiting for him in the catacombs of St. Sebastian. Well, said the Count, turning towards France, it seems to me that this is a very likely story. What do you say to it? Why, that I should think it very amusing, replied France, if it had happened to anyone but poor Albert. And in truth, if you had not found me here, said the Count, it might have proved a gallant adventure, which would have cost your friend dear. But now he is assured, his alarm will be the only serious consequence. And shall we go and find him? inquired Franz. Oh, decidedly, sir, he is in a very picturesque place. Do you know the catacombs of St. Sebastian? I was never in them, but I have often resolved to visit them. Well, here is an opportunity made to your hand, and it would be difficult to contrive a better. Have you a carriage? No. That is of no consequence. I always have one ready day and night. Always ready? Yes. I am a very capricious being, and I should tell you that sometimes when I rise, or after my dinner, or in the middle of the night, I resolve on starting for some particular point, and away I go. The count rang, and a footman appeared. Order out the carriage, he said, and remove the pistols which are in the holsters. You need not awaken the coachman. Ali will drive. In a very short time, the noise of wheels was heard, and the carriage stopped at the door. The Count took out his watch. Half past twelve, he said. We might start at five o'clock and be in time, but the delay may cause your friend to pass an uneasy night, and therefore we had better go with all speed to extricate him from the hands of the infidels. Are you still resolved to accompany me? More determined than ever. Well then, come along. Franz and the Count went downstairs, accompanied by Peppino. At the door they found the carriage. Ali was on the box, in whom Franz recognized the dumb slave of the grotto of Monte Cristo. Franz and the Count got into the carriage. Peppino placed himself beside Ali, and they set off at a rapid pace. Ali had received his instructions and went down the Corso, crossed the Campo Vaccino, went up the Strada San Gregorio and reached the gates of St. Sebastian. Then the porter raised some difficulties, but the Count of Monte Cristo produced a permit from the Governor of Rome, allowing him to leave or enter the city at any hour of the day or night. The portcullis was therefore raised. The porter had a Louis for his trouble, and then went on their way. The road which the carriage now traversed was the ancient 
Appian Way and bordered with tombs. From time to time, by the light of moon which began to rise, Franz imagined that he saw something like a sentinel appear at various points among the ruins and suddenly retreat into the darkness on a signal from Peppino. A short time before they reached the baths of Caracalla, the carriage stopped, Peppino opened the door, and the Count and the Franz alighted. In ten minutes, said the Count to his companion, we shall be there. He then took Peppino aside, gave him an order in a low voice, and Peppino went away, taking with him a torch brought with them in the carriage. Five minutes elapsed, during which Franz saw the shepherd going along a narrow path that led over the irregular and broken surface of the Campagna. And finally he disappeared in the midst of the tall red herbage, which seemed like the bristling mane of an enormous lion. Now, said the Count, let us follow him. Franz and the Count, in their turn, then advanced along the same path, which, at the distance of a hundred paces, led them over a declivity to the bottom of a small valley. They then perceived two men conversing in the obscurity. Ought we to go on? asked Franz the Count, or shall we wait a while? Let us go on. Peppino will have warned the sentry of our coming. One of the two men was Peppino, and the other a bandit on the lookout. Franz and the Count advanced, and the bandit saluted them. Your Excellency, said Peppino, addressing the Count, if you will follow me, the opening of the catacombs is close at hand. Go on, then, replied the Count. They came to an opening behind a clump of bushes and in the midst of a pile of rocks, by which a man could scarcely pass. Peppino glided first into this crevice. After they got along a few paces, the passage widened. Peppino passed, lighted his torch, and turned to see if they came after him. The Count first reached an open space, and Franz followed him closely. The passageway sloped in a gentle descent, enlarging as they proceeded. Still, Franz and the Count were compelled to advance in a stooping posture, and were scarcely able to proceed abreast of one another. They went on a hundred and fifty paces in this way, and then were stopped by. Who comes there? At the same time, they saw the reflection of a torch on a carbine barrel. A friend, responded Peppino, and advancing alone towards the sentry, he said a few words to him in a low tone, and then he, like the first, saluted the nocturnal visitors, making a sign that they might proceed. Behind the sentinel was a staircase with twenty steps. Franz and the Count descended these, and found themselves in a mortuary chamber. Five corridors diverged like the rays of a star, and the walls dug into niches, which were arranged one above the other in the shape of coffins, showed that they were at last in the catacombs. Down one of the corridors, whose extent it was impossible to determine, rays of light were visible. The Count laid his hand on Franz's shoulder. Would you like to see a camp of bandits in repose? He inquired. Exceedingly, replied Franz. Come with me. Then Peppino put out the torch. Peppino obeyed, and Franz and the Count were in utter darkness, except that fifty paces in advance of them a reddish glare, more evident since Peppino had put out his torch, was visible along the wall. They advanced silently the Count guiding Franz, as if he had the singular faculty of seeing in the dark. Franz himself, however, saw his way more plainly in proportion, as he went on towards the light, which served him in some manner as a guide. Three arcades were before them, and the middle one was used as a door. These arcades opened on one side into the corridor where the Count and the Franz were, and on the other into a large square chamber entirely surrounded by niches similar to those of which we have spoken. In the midst of this chamber were four stones, which had formerly served as an altar, as was evident from the cross which still surmounted them. A lamp placed at the base of a pillar lighted up with its pale and flickering flame the singular scene which presented itself to the eyes of the two visitors concealed in the shadow. A man was seated with his elbow leaning on the column and was reading with his back turned to the arcades, through the openings of which the newcomers contemplated him. This was the chief of the band, Luigi Vampa. Around him and in groups, according to their fancy, lying in their mantles or with their backs against a sort of stone bench, which went all around the columbarium, were to be seen twenty brigands or more, each having his carbine within reach. At the other end, silent, scarcely visible, and like a shadow, was a sentinel who was walking up and down before a grotto, which was only distinguishable because in that spot the darkness seemed more dense 
than elsewhere. When the Count thought Franz had gazed sufficiently on this picturesque tableau, he raised his finger to his lips to warn him to be silent, and ascended the three steps which led to the corridor of the columbarium, entered the chamber by the middle arcade, and advanced towards Vampa, who was so intent on the book before him that he did not hear the noise of his footsteps. Who comes there? cried the sentinel who was less abstracted, and who saw by the lamplight a shadow approaching his chief. At this challenge, Vampa rose quickly, drawing at the same moment a pistol from his girdle. In a moment all the bandits were on their feet, and twenty carbines were levelled at the count. Well, said he in a voice perfectly calm, and no muscle of his countenance disturbed. Well, my dear Vampa, it appears to me that you receive a friend with a great deal of ceremony. Ground arms, exclaimed the chief, with an imperative sign of the hand while with the other he took off his hat respectfully. Then, turning to the singular personage who had caused this scene, he said, Your pardon, Your Excellency, but I was so far from expecting the honour of a visit that I did not really recognise you. It seems that your memory is equally short in everything, Vampa, said the Count, and that not only do you forget people's faces, but also the conditions you make with them. What conditions have I forgotten, Your Excellency? inquired the bandit, with the air of a man who, having committed an error, is anxious to repair it. Was it not agreed, asked the Count, that not only my person, but also that of my friends, should be respected by you? And how have I broken that treaty, Your Excellency? You have this evening carried off and conveyed hither the Vicomte, Albert de Morcerf. Well, continued the Count, in a tone that made Franz shudder, this young gentleman is one of my friends. This young gentleman lodges in the same hotel as myself. This young gentleman has been up and down the Corso for eight hours in my private carriage, and yet, I repeat to you, you have carried him off and conveyed him hither, and, added the Count, taking the letter from his pocket, you have set a ransom on him, as if he were an utter stranger. Why did you not tell me all this? You, inquired the brigand chief, turning towards his men, who all retreated before his look. Why have you caused me thus to fail in my word towards a gentleman like the Count, who has all your lives in his hands? By heavens, if I thought one of you knew that the young gentleman was a friend of His Excellency, I would blow his brains out with my own hand. Well, said the Count, turning towards France, I told you there was some mistake in this. Are you not alone? asked Vampa with uneasiness. I am with the person to whom this letter was addressed, and to whom I desired to prove that Luigi Vampa was a man of his word. Come, Your Excellency, the Count added, turning to France. Here is Luigi Vampa, who will himself express to you his deep regret at the mistake he has committed. Franz approached, the chief advancing several steps to meet him. Welcome among us, Your Excellency, he said to him. You heard what the Count just said, and also my reply. Let me add that I would not for the four thousand piastres at which I had fixed your friend's ransom that this had happened. But, said Franz, looking around him uneasily, where is the Viscount? I do not see him. Nothing has happened to him, I hope, said the Count frowningly. The prisoner is there, replied Vampa, pointing to the hollow space in front of which the bandit was on guard, and I will go myself and tell him he is free. The chief went towards the place he had pointed out as Albert's prison, and Franz and the Count followed him. What is the prisoner doing? inquired Vampa of the sentinel. Ma foi, Captain, replied the sentry. I do not know. For the last hour I have not heard him stir. Come in, Your Excellency, said Vampa. The Count and Franz ascended seven or eight steps after the chief, who drew back a bolt and opened a door. Then by the gleam of a lamp, similar to that which lighted the columbarium, Albert was to be seen wrapped up in a cloak, which one of the bandits had lent him, lying in a corner in profound slumber. Come, said the Count, smiling with his own peculiar smile. Not so bad for a man who is to be shot at seven o'clock tomorrow morning. Vampa looked at Albert with a kind of admiration. He was not insensible to such proof of courage. You're right, Your Excellency, he said. This must be one of your friends. Then going to Albert, he touched him on the shoulder, saying, Will Your Excellency please to awaken? Albert stretched out his arms, rubbing his eyelids, and opened his eyes. Oh, said he, is it you, Captain? You should have allowed me to sleep. I had such a delightful dream. I was dancing to the gallop at Tolonia's with a Countess G. Then he drew his watch from his pocket, that he might see how time sped. Half past one only, said he. Why the devil do you rouse me at this hour? To tell you that you are free, Your Excellency. 
my dear fellow replied albert with perfect ease of mind remember for the future napoleon's maxim never awaken me but for bad news if you had let me sleep on i should have finished my gallop and have been grateful to you all my life so then they have paid my ransom no your excellency well then how am i free a person to whom i can refuse nothing has come to demand you come hither yes hither really then that person is a most amiable person albert looked around and perceived franz what said he is it you my dear franz whose devotion and friendship are thus displayed no not i replied franz but our neighbor the count of monte cristo oh my dear count said albert gaily arranging his cravat and wristbands you are really most kind and i hope you will consider me as under eternal obligations to you and in the first place for the carriage and in the next for this visit and he put out his hand to the count who shuddered as he gave his own but who nevertheless did give it the bandit gazed on the scene with amazement he was evidently accustomed to see his prisoners tremble before him and yet here was one whose gay temperament was not for a moment altered as for franz he was enchanted at the way in which albert had sustained the national honor in the presence of the bandit my dear albert he said if you will make haste you shall ha- yet have time to finish the night at tolonias you may conclude your interrupted gallop so that you will owe no ill will to signor luigi who has indeed throughout this whole affair acted like a gentleman you are decidedly right and we may reach the palazzo by 2 o'clock signor luigi continued albert is there any formality to fulfill before i take leave of your excellency none sir replied the bandit you are as free as air well then a happy and merry life to you come gentlemen come and albert followed by franz and the count descended the staircase crossed the square chamber where stood all the bandits hat in hand peppino said the brigand chief give me the torch what are you going to do inquired the count i will show you the way back myself said the captain that is the least honor that i can render to your excellency and taking the lighted torch from the hands of the herdsman he preceded his guests not as a servant who performs an act of civility but like a king who precedes ambassadors on reaching the door he bowed and now your excellency added he allow me to repeat my apologies and i hope you will not entertain any resentment at what has occurred no my dear vampa replied the count besides you compensate for your mistakes in so gentlemanly a way that one almost feels obliged to you for having committed them gentlemen added the chief turning towards the young men perhaps the offer may not appear very tempting to you but if you should ever feel inclined to pay me a second visit wherever i may be you shall be welcome franz and albert bowed the count went out first then albert franz paused for a moment has your excellency anything to ask me said vampa with a smile yes i i have replied franz i'm curious to know what work you were perusing with so much attention as we entered caesar's commentaries said the bandit it's my favorite work well are you coming asked albert yes replied franz here i am and he in his turn left the caves they advanced to the plain ah oh, your pardon said albert turning around will you allow me captain and he lighted his cigar at vampa's torch now my dear count he said let us on with all the speed we may i am enormously anxious to finish my night at the duke of bracciano's they found the carriage where they had left it the count said a word in arabic to ali and horses went on at great speed it was just 2 o'clock by albert's watch when the two friends entered the dancing room their return was quite an event but as they entered together all uneasiness on albert's account ceased instantly madam said the viscount of morcerf advancing towards the countess yesterday you were so condescending as to promise me a gallop i am rather late in claiming this gracious promise but here is my friend whose character for veracity you well know and he will assure you the delay arose from no fault of mine and at this moment the orchestra gave the signal for the last waltz albert put his arm around the waist of the countess and disappeared with her in the whirl of dancers in the meanwhile franz was considering the singular shudder that had passed over the count of monte cristo at the moment when he had been in some sort forced to give his hand to albert
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Stearns, Concord, New Hampshire. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 38. The Compact. The first words that Albert uttered to his friend on the following morning contained a request that Franz would accompany him on a visit to the Count. True, the young man had warmly and energetically thanked the Count on the previous evening, but services such as he had rendered could never be too often acknowledged. Franz, who seemed attracted by some invisible influence towards the Count, in which terror was strangely mingled, felt an extreme reluctance to permit his friend to be exposed alone to the singular fascination that this mysterious personage seemed to exercise over him, and therefore made no objection to Albert's request, but at once accompanied him to the desired spot, and after a short delay the Count joined them in the salon. "'My dear Count,' said Albert, advancing to meet him, "'permit me to repeat the poor thanks I offered last night, and to assure you that the remembrance of all I owe to you will never be effaced from my memory. Believe me, as long as I live, I shall never cease to dwell with grateful recollection on the prompt and important service you rendered me, and also to remember that to you I am indebted even for my life. My very good friend and excellent neighbor, replied the Count with a smile, you really exaggerate my trifling exertions. You owe me nothing but some trifle of twenty thousand francs, which you have been saved out of your traveling expenses so that there is not much of a score between us. But you must really permit me to congratulate you on the ease and unconcern with which you resigned yourself to your fate, and the perfect indifference you manifested as to the turn events might take. Upon my word, said Albert, I deserve no credit for what I could not help, namely, a determination to take everything as I found it, and to let those bandits see that although men get into troublesome scrapes all over the world, there is no nation but the French that can smile even in the face of grim death himself. All that, however, has nothing to do with my obligations to you, and I now come to ask you whether, in my own person, my family or connections, I can in any way serve you. My father, the Comte de Morcerf, although of Spanish origin, possesses considerable influence, both at the court of France and Madrid, and I unhesitatingly place the best services of myself and all to whom my life is dear, at your disposal. Monsieur de Morcerf, replied the Count, your offer, far from surprising me, is precisely what I expected from you, and I accept it in the same spirit of hearty sincerity with which it is made. Nay, I will go still further, and say that I had previously made up my mind to ask a great favor at your hands. Oh, pray name it. I am wholly a stranger to Paris. It is a city I have never yet seen. Is it possible, exclaimed Albert, that you have reached your present age without visiting the finest capital in the world? I can scarcely credit it. Nevertheless, it is quite true. Still, I agree with you in thinking that my present ignorance of the first city in Europe is a reproach to me in every way, and calls for immediate correction. But, in all probability, I should have performed so important so necessary a duty as that of making myself acquainted with the wonders and beauties of your justly celebrated capital. Had I known any person who would have introduced me into the fashionable world, but unfortunately I possessed no acquaintance there, and of necessity was compelled to abandon the idea. So distinguished an individual as yourself, cried Albert, could scarcely have required an introduction. You are most kind. But as regards myself, I can find no merit I possess, save that, as a millionaire, I might have become a partner in the speculations of M. Aguado and M. Rothschild. But as my motive in travelling to your capital would not have been for the pleasure of dabbling in stocks, I stayed away till some favourable chance could present itself of carrying my wish into execution. Your offer, however, smooths all difficulties. I have only to ask you, my dear Monsieur de Monsef, these words were accompanied by a most peculiar smile, whether you undertake, 
upon my arrival in France, to open to me the doors of that fashionable world of which I know no more than a Huron or a native of Cochin, China. Oh, that I do, and with infinite pleasure, answered Albert, and so much the more readily as a letter received this morning from my father summons me to Paris, in consequence of a treaty of marriage. My dear Franz, do not smile, I beg of you, with a family of high standing, and connected with the very cream of Parisian society. Connected by marriage, you mean, said Franz, laughingly. Well, never mind how it is, answered Albert. It comes to the same thing in the end. Perhaps by the time you return to Paris, I shall be quite a sober, staid father of a family. A most edifying representative I shall make of all the domestic virtues. Don't you think so? But as regards your wish to visit our fine city, my dear Count, I can only say that you may command me and mine to any extent you please. Then it is settled, said the Count, and I give you my solemn assurance that I only waited an opportunity like the present to realize plans that I have long meditated. Franz did not doubt that these plans were the same concerning which the Count had dropped a few words in the grotto of Monte Cristo, and while the Count was speaking, the young man watched him closely, hoping to read something of his purpose in his face. But his countenance was inscrutable especially when, as in the present case, it is veiled in a sphinx-like smile. "'But tell me now, Count,' exclaimed Albert, delighted at the idea of having to chaperone so distinguished a person as Monte Cristo, "'tell me truly whether you are in earnest, or if this project of visiting Paris is merely one of the chimerical and uncertain air-castles, of which we make so many in the course of our lives, but which, like a house built on the sand, is liable to be blown over by the first puff of wind.' I pledge you my honour, returned the Count, that I mean to do as I have said. Both inclination and positive necessity compel me to visit Paris. When do you propose going thither? Have you made up your mind when you shall be there yourself? Certainly I have. In a fortnight or three weeks' time, that is to say, as fast as I can get there. Nay, said the Count, I will give you three months ere I join you. You see, I make an ample allowance for all delays and difficulties. And in three months' time, said Albert, you will be at my house? Shall we make a positive appointment for a particular day and hour? inquired the Count. Only let me warn you that I am proverbial for my punctualist exactitude in keeping my engagements. Day for day, hour for hour, said Albert. That will suit me to a dot. So be it, then replied the Count, and extending his hand toward a calendar, suspended near the chimney-piece, he said, "'Today is the twenty-first of February,' and drawing out his watch, added, "'It is exactly half-past ten o'clock. Now promise me to remember this, and expect me the twenty-first of May, at the same hour in the forenoon.' "'Capital!' exclaimed Albert. "'Your breakfast shall be waiting.' "'Where do you live?' "'Number twenty-seven, Rue de Helder. Have you bachelor's apartments there? I hope my coming will not put you to any inconvenience. I reside in my father's house, but occupy a pavilion at the farther side of the courtyard, entirely separated from the main building. Quite sufficient, replied the Count. As, taking out his tablets, he wrote down, Number 27, Rue de Helder, 21st May, half-past ten in the morning. Now then, said the Count, returning his tablets to his pocket, Make yourself perfectly easy. The hand of your timepiece will not be more accurate in marking the time than myself. Shall I see you again ere my departure? asked Albert. That depends. When do you leave? Tomorrow evening, at five o'clock. In that case, I must say adieu to you. As I am compelled to go to Naples, and shall not return thither, before Saturday evening or Sunday morning. And you, Baron, pursued the Count, addressing Franz, do you also depart tomorrow? Yes. For France? No, for Venice. I shall remain in Italy for another year or two. Then we shall not meet in Paris. I fear I shall not have that honour. Well, since we must part, said the Count, holding out a hand to each of the young men, allow me to wish you both a safe and pleasant journey. It was the first time the hand of Franz had come in contact with that of the mysterious individual before him, 
and unconsciously he shuddered at its touch, for it felt cold and icy as that of a corpse. "'Let us understand each other,' said Albert. "'It is agreed, is it not, that you are to be at number twenty-seven in the Rue de Helder on the twenty-first of May, at half-past ten in the morning, and your word of honour passed for your punctuality. "'The twenty-first of May, at half-past ten in the morning, Rue de Helder, number twenty-seven, replied the Count. The young men then rose, and bowing to the Count, quitted the room. "'What is the matter?' asked Albert of Franz, when they had returned to their own apartments. "'You seem more than commonly thoughtful.' "'I will confess to you, Albert,' replied Franz. "'The Count is a very singular person, and the appointment you have made to meet him in Paris fills me with a thousand apprehensions.' "'My dear fellow,' exclaimed Albert, "'what can there possibly be in that to excite uneasiness? "'Why, you must have lost your senses.' "'Whether I am in my senses or not,' answered Franz, "'that is the way I feel.' "'Listen to me, Franz,' said Albert. "'I am glad that the occasion has presented itself "'for saying this to you, "'for I have noticed how cold you are "'in your bearing towards the Count, "'while he, on the other hand, "'has always been courtesy itself to us.' "'Have you anything particular against him?' "'Possibly. "'Did you ever meet him previously to coming hither?' "'I have. "'And where? "'Will you promise not to repeat a single word "'of what I am about to tell you? "'I promise. "'Upon your honour? "'Upon my honour. "'Then listen to me.' "'Franz then related to his friend "'the history of his excursion to the island of Monte Cristo, "'and of finding a party of smugglers there, and the two Corsican bandits with them. He dwelt with considerable force and energy on the almost magical hospitality he had received from the Count, and the magnificence of his entertainment in the grotto of the Thousand and One Nights. He recounted with circumstantial exactitude all the particulars of the supper, the hashish, the statues, the dream, and how, at his awakening, there remained no proof or trace of all these events, save the small yacht, seen in the distant horizon, driving under full sail toward Porto Vecchio. Then he detailed the conversation overheard by him at the Colosseum, between the Count and Vampa, in which the Count had promised to obtain the release of the bandit Peppino, an engagement which, as our readers are aware, he most faithfully fulfilled. At last he arrived at the adventure of the preceding night, and the embarrassment in which he found himself placed but not having sufficient cash by six or seven hundred piastres to make up the sum required, and finally I was application to the count and the picturesque and satisfactory result that followed. Albert listened with the most profound attention. Well, said he, when Franz had concluded, what do you find to object to in all you have related? The count is fond of travelling, and being rich, possesses a vessel of his own. Go but to Portsmouth or Southampton, and you will find the harbours crowded with the yachts belonging to such of the English as can afford the expense, and have the same liking for this amusement. Now, by way of having a resting place during his excursions, avoiding the wretched cookery, which has been trying its best to poison me during the last four months, while you have manfully resisted its effects for many years, and obtaining a bed on which it is possible to slumber, Monte Cristo has furnished for himself a temporary abode where you first found him. But to prevent the possibility of the Tuscan government taking a fancy to his enchanted palace, and thereby depriving him of the advantages naturally expected from so large an outlay of capital, he has wisely enough purchased the island, taking its name. Just ask yourself, my good fellow, whether there are not many persons of our acquaintance who assume the names of lands and properties they never in their lives are masters of. But, said Franz, the Corsican bandits that were among the crew of his vessel? Why, really the thing seems to me simple enough. Nobody knows better than yourself that the bandits of Corsica are not rogues or thieves, but purely and simply fugitives, driven by some sinister motive from their native town or village, and that their fellowship involves no disgrace or stigma. For my own part, I protest that, should I ever go to Corsica, my first visit ere even I presented myself to the mayor or prefect, should be to the bandits of Columba, if I could only manage to find them, for, on my conscience, they are a race of men I admire greatly. 
still persisted Franz. I suppose you will allow that such men as Vampa and his band are regular villains, who have no other motive than plunder when they seize your person. How do you explain the influence the Count evidently possessed over these ruffians? My good friend, as in all probability I own my present safety to that influence, it would ill become me to search too closely into its source. Therefore, instead of condemning him for his intimacy with outlaws, you must give me leave to excuse any little irregularity there may be in such a connection. Not altogether for preserving my life, for my own idea was that it never was in much danger, but certainly for saving me four thousand piastres, which, being translated, means neither more nor less than twenty-four thousand livres of our money, a sum at which, most assuredly, I should never have been estimated in France. Proving most indisputably, added Albert with a laugh, that no prophet is honoured in his own country. Talking of countries, replied France, of what country is the Count? What is his native tongue? Whence does he derive his immense fortune? And what were those events of his early life, a life as marvellous as unknown, that have tinctured his succeeding years with so dark and gloomy misanthropy? Certainly these are questions that, in your place, I should like to have answered. My dear Franz, replied Albert, when upon receipt of my letter you found the necessity of asking the Count's assistance, you promptly went to him, saying, My friend, Albert de Montsef, is in danger. Help me to deliver him. Was not that nearly what you said? It was. Well, then, did he ask you? Who was Monsieur Albert de Montsef? How did he come by his name? his fortune? What are his means of existence? What is his birthplace? Of what country is he a native? Tell me, did he put all these questions to you? I confess he asked me none. No, he merely came and freed me from the hands of Signor Vampa, where, I can assure you, in spite of all my outward appearance of ease and unconcern, I did not very particularly care to remain. Now then, Franz, when, for services so promptly and unhesitatingly rendered, he would ask me in return to do for him what is done daily for any Russian prince or Italian nobleman who may pass through Paris, merely to introduce him into society. Would you have me refuse? My good fellow, you must have lost your senses to think it possible I could act with such cold-blooded policy. And this time it must be confessed that, contrary to the usual state of affairs and discussions between the young men, the effective arguments were all on Albert's side. Well, said Franz with a sigh, do as you please, my dear Viscount, for your arguments are beyond my powers of refutation. Still, in spite of all, you must admit that this Count of Monte Cristo is a most singular personage. He is a philanthropist, answered the other, and no doubt his motive in visiting Paris is to compete for the Montheon prize, given, as you are aware, to whoever shall be proved to have most materially advanced the interests of virtue and humanity. If my vote and interest can obtain it for him, I will readily give him the one and promise the other. And now, my dear Franz, let us talk of something else. Come, shall we take our luncheon, and then pay a last visit to St. Peter's? Franz silently assented, and the following afternoon, at half-past five o'clock, the young men parted. Albert de Morcef returned to Paris, and Franz d'Empigny to pass a fortnight at Venice, but ere he entered his travelling carriage, Albert, fearing that his expected guest might forget the engagement he had entered into, placed in the care of the waiter at the hotel a card, to be delivered to the Count of Monte Cristo, on which, beneath the name of Vicomte Albert de Mercef, he had written in pencil, 27 Rue de Helder, on the 21st May, half-past 10 a.m. End of chapter 38「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Stearns, Concord, New Hampshire, October 14, 2007. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 39 The Guests. In the house in the Rue de Helder, where Albert had invited the Count of Monte Cristo, everything was being prepared on the morning of the 21st of May to do honour to the occasion. 
Albert de Morcerf, inhabited a pavilion situated at the corner of a large court, and directly opposite another building in which were the servants' apartments. Two windows only of the pavilion faced the street. Three other windows looked into the court, and two at the back into the garden. Between the court and the garden, built in the heavy style of the imperial architecture, was a large and fashionable dwelling of the Count and Countess de Morcerf. A high wall surrounded the whole of the hotel, surmounted at intervals by vases filled with flowers, and broken in the centre by a large gate of gilded iron, which served as a carriage entrance. A small door, close to the lodge of the concierge, gave ingress and egress to the servants and masters when they were on foot. It was easy to discover that the delicate care of a mother, unwilling to part from her son, and yet aware that a young man of the Viscount's age required the full exercise of his liberty, had chosen this habitation for Albert. There were not lacking, however, evidences of what we may call the intelligent egoism of a youth who is charmed with the indolent, careless life of an only son, and who lives, as it were, in a gilded cage. By means of the two windows looking into the street, Albert could see all that passed. The sight of what is going on is necessary to young men, who always want to see the world traverse the horizon, even if that horizon is only a public thoroughfare. Then, should anything appear to merit a more minute examination, Albert de Morcerf could follow up his researches by means of a small gate, similar to that close to the concierge's door, and which merits a particular description. It was a little entrance that seemed never to have been opened since the house was built, so entirely was it covered with dust and dirt, but the well-oiled hinges and locks told quite another story. The door was a mockery to the concierge, from whose vigilance and jurisdiction it was free, and like that famous portal in the Arabian Nights, opening at the sesame of Ali Baba, it was wont to swing backward at a cabalistic word, or a concerted tap from without, from the sweetest voices or whitest fingers in the world. At the end of a long corridor, with which the door communicated, and which formed the antechamber, was on the right Albert's breakfast-room, looking into the court, and on the left the salon, looking into the garden. Shrubs and creeping plants covered the windows, and hid from the garden and court these two apartments, the only rooms into which, as they were on the ground floor, the prying eyes of the curious could penetrate. On the floor above were similar rooms, with the addition of a third, formed out of the antechamber, these three rooms were a salon, a boudoir, and a bedroom. The salon downstairs was only an Algerian divan, for the use of smokers. The boudoir upstairs communicated with the bedchamber by an invisible door on the staircase. It was evident that every precaution had been taken. Above this floor was a large atelier, which had been increased in size by pulling down the partitions, a pandemonium, in which the artist and the dandy strove for preeminence. There were collected and piled up all Albert's successive caprices, hunting horns, bass viols, flutes, a whole orchestra, for Albert had had not a taste but a fancy for music, easels, palettes, brushes, pencils, for music had been succeeded by painting, foils, boxing gloves, broadswords, and single sticks. For following the example of the fashionable young men of the time, Albert de Morcerf cultivated, with far more perseverance than music and drawing, the three arts that complete a dandy's education. For example, fencing, boxing, and single stick. And it was here that he received Grisier, Cook, and Charles Le Boucher. The rest of the furniture of this privileged apartment consisted of old cabinets, filled with Chinese porcelain and Japanese vases, Luca della Robbia, faience, and palacy platters of old armchairs, in which perhaps had sat Henry the Fourth, or Sully, Louis the Thirteenth, or Richelieu. For two of these armchairs, adorned with a carved shield, on which were engraved the fleur de lis of France, on an azure field evidently came from the Louvre, or at least some royal residence. Over these dark and sombre chairs were thrown splendid stuffs, dyed beneath Persia's sun, or woven by the fingers of the woman of Calcutta or of Chandernagar. What these stuffs did there, it was impossible to say. They awaited, while gratifying the eyes, a destination unknown to their owner himself. 
In the meantime they filled the place with their golden and silky reflections. In the center of the room was a roller and blanchette baby grand piano in rosewood, but holding the potentialities of an orchestra in its narrow and sonorous cavity, and groaning beneath the weight of a chef's d'oeuvre of Beethoven, Weber, Mozart, Haydn, Getri, and Popora. On the walls, over the doors, on the ceiling, were swords, daggers, malay creases, maces, battle axes, gilded damasks, and inlaid suits of armor, dried plants, minerals, and stuffed birds. Their flame-colored wings outspread in motionless flight, and the beaks forever open. This was Albert's favorite lounging place. However, the morning of the appointment, the young man had established himself in the small salon downstairs. There, on a table, surrounded at some distance by a large and luxurious divan, every species of tobacco known, from the yellow tobacco of Petersburg to the black of Sinai, and so on, along the scale from Maryland to Puerto Rico, Latakia, was exposed in pots of crackled earthenware, of which the Dutch were so fond. Beside them, in boxes of fragrant wood, were ranged, according to their size and quality, Puros, Regalias, Havanas, and Manilas, and in an open cabinet a collection of German pipes, of shibuks, with their amber mouthpieces, ornamented with coral, and of nargiles, with their long tubes of Morocco, awaiting the caprice or the sympathy of the smokers. Albert had himself presided at the arrangement, or rather, the symmetrical derangement, which, after coffee, the guests at a breakfast of modern days love to contemplate through the vapour that escapes from their mouths, and descends in long and fanciful wreaths to the ceiling. At a quarter to ten, a valet entered. He composed with a little groom named John, and who spoke only English, all Albert's establishment, although the cook of the hotel was always at his service and on great occasion the Count Sacheur also. This valet, whose name was Germain, and who enjoyed the entire confidence of his young master, held in one hand a number of papers, and in the other a packet of letters, which he gave to Albert. Albert glanced carelessly at the different missives, selected two written in a small and delicate hand, and enclosed in scented envelopes, opened them and perused their contents with some attention. "'How did these letters come?' said he. "'One by the post, Madame Dangler's footman left the other. "'Let Madame Dangler's know that I accept the place she offers me in her box. "'Wait. "'Then, during the day, tell Rosa that when I leave the opera I will sup with her as she wishes. "'Take her six bottles of different wine, Cyprus, Sherry, and Malaga, "'and a barrel of Austin oysters. "'Get them at Borrell's, and be sure you say they are from me.' At what o'clock, sir, do you breakfast? What time is it now? A quarter to ten. Very well. At half-past ten, Debray will, perhaps, be obliged to go to the minister, and besides, Albert looked at his tablets, it is the hour I told the Count, 21st May, at half-past ten, and though I do not much rely on his promise, I wish to be punctual. Is the Countess up yet? If you wish, I will inquire. Yes. Ask her for one of her liqueur salarettes. Mine is incomplete. And tell her I shall have the honor of seeing her about three o'clock, and that I request permission to introduce someone to her. The valet left the room. Albert threw himself on the divan, tore off the cover of two or three of the papers, looked at the theatre announcements, made a face seeing they gave an opera, and not a ballet, hunted vainly amongst the advertisements for a new tooth-powder of which he had heard, and threw down, one after the other, the three leading papers of Paris, muttering, These papers become more and more stupid every day. A moment after, a carriage stopped before the door, and the servant announced Monsieur Lucien de Bray, a tall young man with light hair, clear gray eyes, and thin and compressed lips, dressed in a blue coat with beautifully carved gold buttons, a white neckcloth, and tortoiseshell eyeglass suspended by a silken thread, and which, by an effort of these superciliary and zygomatic muscles, he fixed in his eye, entered, with a half-official air, without smiling or speaking. "'Good morning, Lucian. Good morning,' said Albert. "'Your punctuality really alarms me. What do I say? Punctuality? You whom I expected last, you would arrive at five minutes to ten, when the time fixed was half-past.' 
"'Has the ministry resigned?' "'No, my dear fellow,' returned the young man, "'seating himself on the divan. "'Reassure yourself. "'We are tottering always, but we never fall, "'and I begin to believe that we shall pass into a state of immobility, "'and then the affairs of the peninsula will completely consolidate us.' "'Ah, true. "'You drive Don Carlos out of Spain.' "'No, no, my dear fellow. "'Do not confound our plans.' We take him to the other side of the French frontier, and offer him hospitality at Borges. At Borges? Yes. He has not much to complain of. Borges is the capital of Charles the Seventh. Do you not know that all Paris knew it yesterday, and the day before it had already transpired on the Bourse, and Monsieur Danglars? I do not know by what means that man contrives to obtain intelligence as soon as we do. Made a million. "'And you another order, for I see you have a blue ribbon at your buttonhole.' "'Yes, they sent me the order of Charles III,' returned Debray carelessly. "'Come, do not affect indifference, but confess you were pleased to have it.' "'Oh, it is very well as a finish to the toilet. "'It looks very neat on a black coat buttoned up. "'It makes you resemble the Prince of Wales or the Duke of Reichstadt. "'It is for that reason you see me so early, because you have the order of Charles III.' "'And you wish to announce the good news to me?' "'No, because I passed the night writing letters. Five and twenty dispatches. "'I returned home at daybreak and strove to sleep, "'but my head ached, and I got up to have a ride for an hour. "'At the Bois de Boulogne, and we in hunger attacked me at once, Two enemies who rarely accompany each other, "'and who are yet leagued against me, "'a sort of Carlo-Republican alliance. "'I then recollected you gave breakfast this morning, and here I am. "'I am hungry. Feed me.' I am bored. Amuse me. It is my duty as your host, returned Albert, ringing the bell, while Lucian turned over, with his gold-mounted cane, the papers that lay on the table. Germain, a glass of sherry and a biscuit. In the meantime, my dear Lucian, here are cigars. Contraband, of course. Try them, and persuade the minister to sell us such instead of poisoning us with cabbage leaves. Pest! I will do nothing of the kind. The moment they come from government, you would find them execrable. Besides, that does not concern the home but the financial department. Address yourself to Monsieur Human, section of the Indirect Contributions, Corridor A, number 26. On my word, said Albert, you astonish me by the extent of your knowledge. Take a cigar. Really, my dear Albert, replied Lucian, lighting a manila at a rose-colored taper that burned in a beautifully enameled stand. "'How happy you are to have nothing to do! "'You do not know your own good fortune!' "'And what would you do, my dear diplomatist?' replied Morsef, "'with a slight degree of irony in his voice. "'If you did nothing. "'What? "'Private secretary to a minister, "'plunged at once into European cabals and Parisian intrigues, "'having kings, and better still, queens, to protect, "'parties to unite, elections to direct, "'making more use of your cabinet with your pen,' and your telegraph than Napoleon did of his battlefields with his sword and his victories. Possessing five and twenty thousand francs a year, besides your place, a horse, for which Chateau Renaud offered you four hundred louis, and which you could not part with, a tailor who never disappoints you with the opera, the jockey club, and other diversions, can you not amuse yourself? Well, I will amuse you. How? "'by introducing to you a new acquaintance, a man or a woman. "'A man. I know so many men already. "'But you do not know this man. "'Where does he come from, the end of the world? "'Farther still, perhaps. The deuce! "'I hope he does not bring our breakfast with him. "'Oh, no. Our breakfast comes from my father's kitchen. "'Are you hungry? "'Humiliating as such a confession is, I am. "'But I dined at Monsieur de Villefort's, "'and lawyers always give you very bad dinners.' "'You would think they felt some remorse. "'Did you ever remark that?' "'Ah, depreciate other persons' dinners. "'You ministers give such splendid ones.' "'Yes, but we do not invite people of fashion. "'If we were not forced to entertain a parcel of country boobies "'because they think and vote with us, "'we should never dream of dining at home, I assure you. "'Well, take another glass of sherry and another biscuit. "'Willingly. Your Spanish wine is excellent.' "'You see, we were quite right to pacify that country.' "'Yes, but Don Carlos?' "'Well, Don Carlos will drink Bordeaux, "'and in ten years we will marry his son to the little queen.' 
you will then obtain the golden fleece, if you are still in the ministry. I think, Albert, you have adopted the system of feeding me on smoke this morning. Well, you must allow it is the best thing for the stomach, but I hear Beauchamp in the next room. You can dispute together, and that will pass away the time. About what? About the papers. My dear friend, said Lucian, with an air of sovereign contempt, do I ever read the papers? Then you will dispute the more. Monsieur Beauchamp, announced the servant, come in, come in, said Albert, rising and advancing to meet the young man. Here is de Bray, who detests you without reading you, so he says. He is quite right, returned Beauchamp, for I criticize him without knowing what he does. Good day, commander. Ah, you know that already, said the private secretary, smiling and shaking hands with him. Pas deux. And what do they say of it in the world? In which world? We have so many worlds in the year of grace, 1838. In the entire political world, of which you are one of the leaders. They say that it is quite fair, and that sowing so much red, you ought to reap a little blue. Come, come, that is not bad, said Lucian. Why do you not join our party, my dear Beauchamp? With your talents you could make your fortune in three or four years. I only await one thing before following your advice, that is, a minister who will hold office for six months, my dear Albert. One word. For I must give poor Lucian a respite. Do we breakfast or dine? I must go to the chamber, for our life is not an idle one. You only breakfast. I await two persons, and the instant they arrive we shall sit down to table. End of chapter 39「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Clark. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 40. The Breakfast. "'What sort of a person do you expect to breakfast?' said Beecham. "'A gentleman and a diplomatist. And we shall have to wait two hours for the gentleman and three for the diplomatist.' I shall come back to dessert. Keep me some strawberries, coffee, and cigars. I'll take a cutlet on my way to the chamber. Do not do anything of the sort, for with the gentleman of Montmorency and the diplomatist of Metternich, we will breakfast at eleven. In the meantime, follow de Bray's example and take a glass of sherry and a biscuit. Be it so, I'll stay. I must do something to distract my thoughts. You are like de Bray, yet it seems to me that when the minister is out of spirits, the opposition ought to be joyous. Ah, you do not know with what I'm threatened. I shall hear this morning that Monsieur Danglars made a speech at the Chamber of Deputies, and at his wife's this evening I shall hear the tragedy of a peer of France. The devil take the constitutional government, and since we had our choice, as they say, at least, how could we choose that? I understand, you must lay in a stock of hilarity. Do not run down Monsieur Danglars' speeches, said Debray. He votes for you and he belongs to the opposition. Ah, pardieu, that is exactly the worst of all. I am waiting until you send him to speak at the Luxembourg to laugh at my ease. My dear friend, said Albert to Beecham, it is plain that the affairs of Spain are settled, for you are most desperately out of humour this morning. Recollect that Parisian gossip has spoken of a marriage between myself and Mademoiselle Eugène Danglars. I cannot in conscience, therefore, let you run down the speeches of a man who will one day say to me, Vicomte, you know that I gave my daughter two millions. Ah, this marriage will never take place, said Beecham. The king has made him a baron, and can make him a peer, but he cannot make him a gentleman, and the Count of Morsef is too aristocratic to consent for the paltry sum of two million francs to a misalliance. The Viscount of Morsef can only wear a marchioness. But two million francs make a nice little sum, replied Morsef. It's the social capital of a theatre on a boulevard or a railroad to the Jardin de Plantes in Le Rapi. Never mind what he says, Morsef, said Debray. Do you marry her? You marry a money bag label, it's true. But what does that matter? It's better to have a blazon less and a figure more on it. You have seven martlets on your arms. Give three to your wife and you'll still have four. That's one more than Monsieur de Guise had, who so nearly became King of France and whose cousin was Emperor in Germany. On my word, I think you're right, Lucian, said Albert absently. To be sure, besides, every millionaire is as noble as a bastard. That is, he can be. 
Do not say that to Bray, returned Beecham, laughing. For here is Chateau Renard, who, to cure you of your mania for paradoxes, will pass the sword of Renard de Montbaton, his ancestor, through your body. He'll sully it then, replied Lucian, for I'm low, very low. Oh, heavens, cried Beecham. The minister quotes Baranga. What then shall we come to next? Monsieur de Chateau Renard, Monsieur Maximilien Morel, said the servant, announcing two fresh guests. Now then, to breakfast, said Beecham. For, if I remember, you told me you only expected two persons, Albert. Morel, muttered Albert, Morel, who is he? But before he'd finished, Monsieur de Chateau Renard, a handsome young man of thirty, gentleman all over, that is, with the figure of a Guiche and the wit of a Montmartre, took Albert's hand. My dear Albert, said he, let me introduce you to Monsieur Maximilien Morel, captain of Saphis, my friend, and what's more, however the man speaks for himself, my preserver. Salute my hero, Viscount. And he stepped on one side to give place to a young man of refined and dignified bearing, with a large and open brow, piercing eyes, and a black moustache, whom our readers have already seen at Marseille, under circumstances sufficiently dramatic not to be forgotten. A rich uniform, half French, half Oriental, set off his graceful and stalwart figure, and his broad chest was decorated with the Order of the Legion of Honour. The young officer bowed with easy and elegant politeness. Monsieur, said Albert with affectionate courtesy, the Count of Chateau Renard knew how much pleasure this introduction would give me. You are his friend, be ours also. Well said, interrupted Chateau Renard, and pray that, if you should ever be in a similar predicament, he may do as much for you as he did for me. What's he done? asked Albert. Oh, nothing worth speaking of, said Morel. Monsieur Chateau Renard uh, exaggerates. Not worth speaking of, cried Chateau Renard. Life is not worth speaking of. That is rather too philosophical. On my word, Morel, it is very well for you who risk your life every day, but for me, who only did so once, we gather from this, Baron, that Captain Morel saved your life. Exactly so. On what occasion? asked Beecham. Beecham, my good fellow, you know that I'm starving, said Debray. Do not set him off on some long story. Well, I do not prevent your sitting down to table, replied Beecham. Chateau Renard can tell us while we eat our breakfast. Gentlemen, said Morseth, it's only a quarter past ten and I expect someone else. Ah, a true diplomatist, observed Debray. Diplomat or not, I don't know. I only know that he's charged himself on my account with a mission which he terminated so entirely to my satisfaction that, had I been king, I should have instantly created him a knight of all my orders, even if I'd been able to offer him the golden fleece and the garter. Well, since we are not to sit down to table, said Debray, take a glass of sherry and tell us all about it. You all know that I had a fancy of going to Africa. It's a road your ancestors have traced out for you, said Albert gallantly. Yes? But I doubt your object was like theirs, to rescue the Holy Sepulchre. You're quite right, Beecham, observed the young aristocrat. It was only to fight as an amateur. I cannot bear duelling since two seconds, chosen to arrange an affair, forced me to break the arm of one of my best friends, one whom you all know, poor Franz Depinay. Ah, true. You did fight some time ago, said Debray. About what? The devil take me if I can remember, returned Chateau Renard. But... I recollect perfectly one thing, that, being unwilling to let such talents as mine sleep, I wished to try upon the Arabs the new pistols that had been given to me. In consequence, I embarked for Oran, uh, and went thence to Constance, where I arrived just in time to witness the raising of the siege. I retreated with the rest for eight and forty hours. I endured the rain during the day and the cold during the night tolerably well, but on the third morning my horse died of cold. The poor brute, accustomed to being covered up and to have a stove in the table, the Arabian finds himself unable to bear ten degrees of cold in Arabia. That's why you wanted to purchase my English horse, said Debray. You think you'll bear the cold better? You are mistaken, for I have made a vow never to return to Africa. You were very much frightened then, asked Beecham. Well, yes, and I had a good reason to be so, replied Chateau Renard. I was retreating on foot, for my horse was dead. Six Arabs came up, full gallop, to cut off my head. I shot two with my double-barreled gun, and two more with my pistols. But I was then disarmed, and two were still left, 
One sees me by the hair. That's why I wear it so short. Uh, no one knows what may happen. The other swung a yatagan, and I already felt the cold steel on my neck when this gentleman who you see here charged them, shot one who held me by the hair, and cleft the skull of the other with his sabre. He had assigned himself the task of saving a man's life that day, and Chance caused that man to be myself. When I am rich, I will order a statue of Chance from Clagmanon or Mariachetti. Yes, said Morel, smiling. It was the 5th of November, uh, the anniversary of the day which my father was miraculously preserved. Therefore, as far as it lies within my power, I endeavour to celebrate it by some heroic action, interrupted Chateau Renard. I was chosen, but that's not all. After rescuing me from the sword, he rescued me from the cold, not by sharing his cloak with me, like St. Martin, but giving me the whole. Then, from hunger, by sharing with me, guess what? A Strasbourg pie, asked Beecham. No, his horse, of which each of us ate a slight with a hearty appetite. It, it was very hard. The horse, asked Morsef, laughing. No, the sacrifice, returned Chateau Renard. Asked a brave, he would sacrifice his English steed for a stranger. Not for a stranger, said Debray. But for a friend I might, perhaps. I divined that you would become mine, Count, replied Morel. Besides, uh, as I had the honour to tell you, heroism is not, sacrifice or not, the day I owed an offering to bad fortune in recompense for favours good fortune had on other days granted us. The history to which Monsieur Morel alludes, continued Chateau Renard, is an admirable one, for which he will tell you some day when you are better acquainted with him. Today, let us fill our stomachs and nut our memories. What time do you breakfast, Albert? At half past ten. Precisely? asked Debray, taking out his watch. Oh, you'll give me five minutes, Grace, replied Morsef, for I also expect a preserver. Of whom? Of myself, cried Morsef. Pablo, do you think that I cannot be saved as well as anyone else, and that there are only Arabs who cut off heads? Our breakfast is a philanthropic one, and we shall have at table, at least, I hope so, two benefactors of humanity. What, what shall we do? said Debray. We only have one Monthian prize. Well, it will be given to someone who has done nothing to deserve it, said Beecham. That's the way the Academy mostly escapes from the dilemma. And where does he come from? asked Debray. You've already answered the question once, but so vaguely that I venture to put it a second time. Really, said Albert. I do not know. Uh, when I invited him three months ago, he was then at Rome. But since that time, who knows where he may have gone? And you think him capable of being exact? demanded Debray. I think him capable of everything. Well... With the five minutes grace, we only have ten left. I will profit by them to tell you something about my guest. I beg pardon, interrupted Beecham, but are there any materials for an article which you're going to tell us? Yes, and for a most curious one. Go on, then, for I see that I'm not going to make it to the chamber this morning. I must make up for it. I was at Rome last carnival. We know that, said Beecham. Yes, but what you do not know is that I was carried off by bandits. Oh, there are no bandits, cried Debray. Yes, there are, and most hideous, or rather, most admirable ones. I found them ugly enough to frighten me. Come, my dear Albert, said Debray. Confess that your cook is behind hand, that the oysters haven't arrived from Ostend or Marinus, and that, like Madame de Maintbaton, you are going to replace the dish by a story. So say at once. We are sufficiently well-bred to excuse you and to listen to your history, fabulous as it promises to be. And I say to you, fabulous as it may seem, that I tell a true one from beginning to end, the brigands that carried me off and conducted me to a gloomy spot called the Catacombs of St. Sebastian. I know it, said Chateau Renard. I narrowly escaped catching a fever there. And I did more than that, replied Morsef, for I caught one. I was informed that I was prisoner until I paid the sum of 4,000 Roman crowns, about uh, 24,000 francs. Unfortunately, I had not above 1,500. I was at the end of my journey and of my credit. Uh, I wrote to France, and were he here, he would confirm every word. I wrote then to France that if he did not come with 4,000 crowns before six, at ten minutes past, I should have gone to join the blessed saints and glorious martyrs in whom the company I had the honour of being, and Signor Luigi Vampa, such was the name of the chief of these bandits, 
would have scrupulously kept his word. But Franz did come with the four thousand crowns, said Sator Renard. A man whose name is Franz de Epinay or Albert de Morcef has not much difficulty in procuring them. No, he arrived accompanied simply by the guest I'm going to present to you. Ah, this gentleman is a Hercules killing Cacus, a Perseus freeing Andromeda. No, he is a man about my own size. Armed to the teeth? Uh, he had not even a knitting needle, but he paid your ransom. He said two words to the chief, and I was free. And they apologised to him for having carried you off, said Beecham. Just so. Why, he is a second Ariosto. No, his name is the Count of Monte Cristo. There is no Count of Monte Cristo, said Debray. I don't think so, said Chateau Renard, with the air of a man who knows the whole of the European nobility perfectly. Does anyone know anything of a Count of Monte Cristo? He comes possibly from the Holy Land, and one of his ancestors possessed Calvary, uh, as the Mortmarts did the Dead Sea. I think I can assist your researchers, said Maximilian. Monte Cristo is a little island I have often heard spoke of by the old sailors my father employed. A grain of sand in the centre of the Mediterranean, an atom in the infinite. Precisely, cried Albert. Well, he whom I spoke is the lord of the, and master of this grain of sand, of this atom. Uh, he has purchased the title of Count somewhere in Tuscany. He's rich then? I believe so. But that ought to be visible. That's what deceives you, Debray. I don't understand you. Have you read The Arabian Nights? What a question. Well, do you know if the person you see there are rich or poor, if their sacks of wheat are not rubies or diamonds? They seem like poor fishermen, and then suddenly they open some mysterious cavern filled with the wealth of the Indies. Which means... Which means that my Count of Monte Cristo is one of those fishermen. He even had a name taken from the book, since he calls himself Sinbad the Sailor and has a cave filled with gold. And you've seen this cavern, Morsef? asked Beecham. No, but Franz has. For heaven's sake, not a word of this before him. Franz went in with his eyes blindfolded, and was waited on by mutes and by women whom Cleopatra was a painted strumpet. Only he is not quite sure about the women, for they did not come in until after he had taken hashish. So what he took for a woman might simply have been a row of statues. <laughs> The two young men looked at Morsef as if to say, Are you mad or are you laughing at us? And I also, added Morel thoughtfully, have heard something like this from an old sailor named Penelon. Ah, cried Albert, it is very lucky that uh, Monsieur Morel has come to aid me. You are vexed, are you not, that he has thus given a clue to the labyrinth? My dear Albert, said Debray, what you tell us is extraordinary. Ah, because your ambassadors and your consuls do not tell you of them. They have no time. They are too much taken up with interfering in the affairs of their countrymen who travel. Now you get angry and attack our poor agents. How will you have them protect you? The chamber cuts down their salaries every day, so that they now have scarcely any. Will you be Ambassador Albert? Will I send you to Constantinople? No. Lest the first demonstration I make in favour of Mehmet Ali, the Sultan, send me the bowstring, and make my secretary strangle me. You say very true, responded Debray. Yes, said Albert, but this has nothing to do with the existence of the Count of Monte Cristo. Pardieu, everyone exists. Doubtless, but not in the same way. Everyone has not black slaves, a princely retinue, an arsenal of weapons that would do credit to an Arabian fortress, horses that cost 6,000 francs apiece, and a Greek mistress. Have you seen the Greek mistress? I have both seen her and heard her. I saw her at the theatre, and heard her one morning when I breakfasted with the Count. He eats then? Yes, but so little it can hardly be called eating. He must be a vampire. Laugh, if you will. The Countess G, who knew Lord Ruthven, declared that the Count was a vampire. Ah, capital, said Beecham. For a man not connected with newspapers, he is the pendant of the famous sea serpent of the Constitutional. Wild eyes, the irises of which contracts or dilates at pleasure, said Debray. Facial angles strongly developed, magnificent forehead, livid complexion, black beard, uh, sharp and white teeth, politeness unexceptionable. 
Just so, Lucian, returned Morsef. You have described him feature for feature. Yes, keen and cutting politeness. This man has often made me shudder. And one day that we were viewing an execution, I thought I should faint, more from the cold and calm manner in which he spoke of every description of torture than from the sight of the executioner and the culprit. Did he not conduct you to the ruins of the Colosseum and suck your blood? asked Beecham. <laughs> or, having delivered you, make you sign a flaming parchment, surrendering your soul to him as Esau did his birthright? Rail on, rail on at your ease, gentlemen, said Morsef, somewhat piked. When I look at you Parisians, idlers on the Boulevard de Grand or the Bois de Boulange, and think of this man, it seems to me that we were not of the same race. I am highly flattered, returned Beecham. At the same time, added Chateau Renard, your Count of Monte Cristo is a very fine fellow, always accepting his little arrangements with the Italian banditti. There are no Italian banditti, said Debray. No vampire, cried Beecham. No Count of Monte Cristo, added Debray. There's half past ten striking, Albert. Confess you have dreamed this and let us sit down to breakfast, continued Beecham. But the sound of the clock had not died away when Germain announced, His Excellency the Count of Monte Cristo. The involuntary start that everyone gave proved how much Morsef's narrative had impressed them, and Albert himself could not wholly refrain from manifesting sudden emotion. He had not heard a carriage stop in the street or steps in the antechamber. The door itself had opened noiselessly. The Count appeared, dressed with the greatest simplicity, but in the most fastidious dandy could have found nothing to cavail in his toilet. Every article of dress, hat, coat, gloves and boots, were from the first makers. He seemed scarcely five and thirty, but what struck everyone was extreme resemblance to the portrait de Bray had shown. The Count advanced, smiling into the centre of the room, and approached Albert, who hastened towards him, holding out his hand in ceremonial manner. Punctuality, said Monte Cristo, is the politeness of kings, according to one of your sovereigns, I think, but not always the same as with travellers. However, I hope you'll excuse the two or three seconds I am behind hand. Five hundred leagues are not to be accomplished without some trouble, especially in France, where, it seems, it is forbidden to beat the postilions. My dear Count, replied Albert, I was announcing your visit to some of my friends whom I had invited in consequence of the promise you did honour me to make, and whom I now present to you. They are the Count of Chateau Renard, whose nobility goes back to the Twelve Peers, and whose ancestors had a place at the Round Table, Monsieur Lucien de Bray, private secretary to the Minister of the Interior, Monsieur Beecham, an editor of the paper, and the terror of the French government, but of whom, in spite of his national celebrity, you perhaps have not heard of in Italy since his paper is prohibited there, and Monsieur Maximilien Morel, captain of Saphis. At this name, the Count, who had hitherto saluted everyone with courtesy, but at the same time with coldness and formality, stepped a pace forward, with a slight tinge of red coloured in his pale cheeks. You wear the uniform of the new French conquerors, Monsieur, said he. It is a handsome uniform. No one could have said what caused the Count's voice to vibrate so deeply, and what made his eye flash, which was in general so clear, lustrous, and limpid when he pleased. You've never seen our Africans, Count, said Albert. Never, replied the Count, who was by this time perfectly master of himself again. Well, beneath this uniform beats one of the bravest and noblest of hearts in the whole army. Oh, Monsieur de Morcerf, interrupted Morel. L let me go on, Captain. And we have just heard, continued Albert, of a new deed of his, and so heroic a one, that, although I have seen him day to day for the first time, I request you allow me to introduce him to you as my friend. At these words, it was still possible to observe in Monte Cristo the concentrated look, changing colour and slight trembling of the eyelid that show emotion. Ah, you have a noble heart, said the Count. So much the better. This exclamation, which corresponded to the Count's own thought rather than to what Albert was saying, surprised everyone, especially Morel who looked at Monte Cristo in wonder. But, at the same time, the intonation was so soft, however strange that the speech might seem, it was impossible to be offended by it. Why should he doubt it? said Beecham to Chateau Renard. In reality, replied the latter, who, with his aristocratic glance and knowledge of the world, had penetrated at once all that was penetrable in Monte Cristo. Albert has not deceived us. 
Well, the Count is a most singular being. What say you, Morel? Ma foi. He has an open look about him that pleases me in spite of the singular remark he made about me. Gentlemen, said Albert, Germain informs me that breakfast is ready. My dear Count, allow me to show you the way. They passed silently into the breakfast room, and everyone took his place. Gentlemen, said the Count, seating himself, permit me to make a confession which must form my excuse for any improprieties I may commit. I am a stranger, and a stranger to such a degree, that this is the first time I have ever been at Paris. The French way of living is utterly unknown to me, and up to the present time I have followed the Eastern customs, which are entirely in contrast to the Parisian. I beg you, therefore, to excuse me if you find anything in me too Turkish, too Italian, or too Arabian. Now, let us breakfast. With what an air he says all this, muttered Beecham. Decidedly, he's a great man. A great man in his own country, added Debray. A great man in every country, said Chateau Renard. The Count was, it may be remembered, a most temperate guest. Albert remarked this, expressing his fears lest, at the outset, the Parisian mode of life should somehow displease the traveller in the most essential point. My dear Count, said he, I fear one thing, and that is that the fare of the Rue de Helder is not much to your taste as that of the Piazza di Spagni. I ought to have consoled you on the point, and have some dishes prepared expressly. Did you know me better, replied the Count, smiling. You would not have given one thought to such a thing for a traveller like myself, who has successfully lived on macaroni at Naples, Polenta in Milan, uh, Ola Parida in Valencia, Pilau at Constantinople, uh, Carrick in India, <laughs> and Swallow's Nests in China. I eat everywhere, and of everything I only eat but a little, and today, that you reproach me with my want of appetite, is my day of appetite, for I have not eaten a thing since yesterday morning. What? cried all the guests. You've not eaten for four and twenty hours. No, replied the Count. I was forced to go out of my road to obtain some information near Nimes, so that I was somewhat late, therefore I did not choose to stop. And you ate in your carriage? asked Morsef. No, I slept, as I generally do when I am weary without having the courage to amuse myself, or when I am hungry without feeling inclined to eat. But you can sleep when you please, monsieur, said Morel. Yes. You have a recipe for it? An infallible one. That would be invaluable to us in Africa, who have not always any food to eat, and rarely anything to drink. Yes, said Monte Cristo, but unfortunately... A recipe excellent for a man like myself would be very dangerous when applied to an army, which might not awake when it was needed. May we inquire what is in this recipe? asked Debray. Oh yes, returned Monte Cristo. I make no secret of it. It's a mixture of excellent opium, which I fetched myself from Canton in order to have it pure, and the best hashish which grows in the east, uh, that is, between the Tigris and the Euphrates. These two ingredients are mixed in equal portions, and formed into pills. Ten minutes after one is taken, the effect is produced. Uh, ask Baron Franz d'Epinay. I think he tasted them one day. Yes, said Morsef. He said something about it to me. But, said Beecham, who, as become a journalist, was very incredulous, you always carry this drug about you? Always. Would, would it be an indiscretion to ask to see these precious pills? Continued Beecham, hoping to take him at a disadvantage. No, monsieur, replied the count, and he drew from his pocket a marvellous casket formed of a single emerald and closed by a golden lid which unscrewed and gave passage to a small greenish-coloured pellet the size of a pea. The ball had an acrid and penetrating odour. There were four or five more in the emerald, which would contain about a dozen. The casket was passed around the table, but it was more to examine the admirable emerald than to see the pills that it passed from hand to hand. And it's your cook who prepares these pills? Oh, no, monsieur, replied Monte Cristo. I do not thus betray my enjoyments to the vulgar. I am a tolerable chemist and prepare the pills myself. This is a magnificent emerald, and the largest I have ever seen, said Chateau Renard, although my mother has some fairly remarkable family jewels. I had three similar ones, returned Monte Cristo. I gave one to the Sultan, who mounted it in his sabre, another to our Holy Father, the Pope who had it set in his tiara, um, opposite one nearly as large, though not so fine, 
given by the Emperor Napoleon to his predecessor, uh, Pius VII. I kept the third for myself and had it hollowed out, which reduced its value, but rendered it more commodious for the purpose I intended. Everyone looked at Monte Cristo with astonishment. He spoke with such simplicity that it was evident that he spoke the truth, or that he was mad. However, the sight of the emerald made them naturally inclined to the former belief. And what did these two sovereigns give you in exchange for these magnificent presents? asked Debray. Uh, the Sultan, the liberty of a woman, replied the Count. The Pope, the life of a man. So that once in my life I would have been as powerful as if heaven had brought me into the world on the steps of a throne. And it was Peppino that you saved, was it not? cried Morsef. For it was him that you obtained a pardon. Perhaps, returned the Count, smiling. My dear Count, you have no idea what pleasure it gives me to hear you speak thus, said Morsef. I had announced to you beforehand, to my friends, an encounter of the Arabian Nights, a wizard of the Middle Ages, but the Parisians are so subtle in paradoxes that they mistake for caprices the imagination of the most incontestable truths, when the truths do not form a part of their daily existence. For example, here is Debray who reads, and Beecham who prints every day. A member of the jockey club has been stopped and robbed on the boulevard. Four persons have been assassinated in the Rue Saint-Denis, or the Faubourg Saint-Germain. Ten, fifteen, or twenty thirties have been arrested in the Café de Boulevard de Temple, or in the Thermes de Julien. Yet these same men deny the existence of the bandits in the Marema, uh, the Campagna di Romana, or the Pontine Marshes. Tell them yourself that I was taken by bandits, and that without your generous intercession, I would have now been sleeping in the catacombs of St. Sebastian instead of receiving them in my humble abode in the Rue de Helleur. Ah, said Monte Cristo, you promised me never to mention that circumstance. It was not I who made that promise, cried Morsef. It must have been someone else whom you rescued in the same manner, and whom you have forgotten. Pray speak of it, for I shall not only, I trust, relate the little I do know, but also the great deal I do not know. It seems to me, returned the Count, smiling, that you have played a sufficiently important part to know as well as myself what happened. Well, you promise me, if I tell all I know, to relate in your turn, all that I do not know? That's but fair, replied Monte Cristo. Well, said Morsef, for three days I believed myself the object of the attentions of a mask, who I took for a descendant of Tilia or Papia. Uh, while I was simply the object of the attentions of the Contadina, and I say Contadina to avoid saying peasant girl, what I know is, like a fool, a greater fool than he, of whom I spoke just now, I mistook for this peasant girl, a young bandit of fifteen or sixteen, with a beardless chin and a slim waist, and who, just as I was about to imprint a chaste salute on his lips, placed a pistol on my head, and, aided by seven or eight others, led, or rather dragged me, to the catacombs of St. Sebastian, where I found a highly educated brigand perusing Caesar's commentaries, and who deigned to leave off reading to inform me that unless the next morning before six o'clock, four thousand piastres were paid to his account at the bankers, at a quarter past six I should have ceased to exist. The letter is still to be seen, for it is in France de Epinay's possession, signed by me, and with the postscript of Monsieur Luigi Vampa. Uh, that's all I know, but I know not, Count, how you contrive to inspire so much respect in the bandits of Rome, who ordinarily have so little respect for anything. I assure you, France and I were lost in ad admiration. Nothing more simple, returned the Count. I had known the famous Vampa for more than ten years. While he was quite a child and only a shepherd, I gave him a few gold pieces for showing me the way. And he, in order to repay me, gave me a poignard, uh, the hilt of which he had carved with his very own hand, which you may have seen in my collection of arms. In after years, whether he'd forgotten this interchange of presents, which ought to have cemented our friendship, or whether he did not recollect me, he sought to take me, but, on the contrary, it was I who captured him and a dozen of his band. I might have handed them over to Roman justice, which is somewhat expeditious, which would have been particularly to do so with him, but I did nothing of the sort. I suffered him and his band to depart. With the condition that they should sin no more, said Beecham, laughing. 
I see they kept their promise. No, monsieur, returned Monte Cristo, upon the simple condition that they should respect myself and my friends. Perhaps what I am about to say may seem strange to you, you who are socialists, and vaunt humanity and your duty to your neighbour, but I never seek to protect a society which does not protect me, and which, I will even say, generally occupies itself about me only to injure me, and thus by giving them a low price in my esteem and preserving a neutrality towards them. It is society and my neighbour who are indebted to me. Bravo, cried Chateau Renard. You are the first man I have ever met sufficiently courageous to preach egotism. Bravo, Count, bravo. It is frank, at least, said Morel. But I am sure that the Count does not regret having once deviated from the principles he so boldly avowed. How have I deviated from these principles, Monsieur? asked Monte Cristo, who could not help looking at Morel with such intensity that two or three times the young man had been unable to sustain that clear and piercing gaze. Why, it seems to me, replied Morel, that in delivering Monsieur de Morcerf, whom you did not know, you did good to your neighbour and to society. Of which he is the brightest ornament, said Beecham, drinking a glass of champagne. My dear Count, cried Morcerf, you are at fault. One of the most formidable logicians I know, and you must see it clearly proved that instead of being an egotist, you are a philanthropist. Ah, you call yourself an Oriental, ah, a Levantine, a Maltese, Indian, Chinese. Your family name is Monte Cristo. Sinbad the Sailor is your baptismal appellation. Yet the first day you set foot in Paris, you instinctively display the greatest virtue, rather the chief defect of us eccentric Parisians. That is, you assume the vices you have not, and you conceal the virtues you possess. My dear Vicomte, returned Monte Cristo, I do not see in all that I've done uh, anything that merits, either from you or these gentlemen, the pretend eulogies that I've received. Uh, you are no stranger to me, for I knew from the time I gave up my two rooms to you, invited you to breakfast with me, lent you one of my carriages, witnessed the carnival in your company, and saw with you from a window in the Piazza del Popolo the execution that affected you so much that you nearly fainted. I will appeal to any of these gentlemen. Could I leave my guests in the hands of a hideous bandit, as you term him? Besides, you know, I had the idea that you could introduce me into some of the Paris salons when I came to France. You might some time ago have looked upon this resolution as a vague project, but today you see it was a reality, and you must submit to it under a penalty of breaking your word. I will keep it, returned Mor Morsef, but I fear that you will be much disappointed, accustomed as you are to picturesque events and fantastic horizons. Among us, you will not meet with any of those episodes to which your famous existence has so familiarised you. Our Chimbrazo is as Montmartre, uh, our Himalaya is Mont Valerian, our great desert is the plain of Grinnell, where they are now boring an artesian well to water the caravans. We have plenty of thieves, though not so many as is said, but the thieves stand more in the dread of policemen than the Lord. France is so prosaic and Paris so civilised a city that you will not find its 85 departments. I say 85 because I do not include Corsica. You will not find then, in these 85 departments, a single hill on which there is not a telegraph or a grotto on which the com commissary of police has not put a gas lamp. There is but one service I can render you, and for that I place myself entirely at your orders, that is, to present, or to make my friends present you, everywhere. Besides, you have no need of anyone to introduce you, with your name and your fortune and your talent, Monte Cristo bowed with a somewhat ironical st smile, you can present yourself everywhere and be well received. I can be more useful in one way or only. In, if knowledge of Parisian habits, or the means of rendering yourself comfortable, or the bazaars can assist, you may depend on me, to find you a fitting dwelling here. I do not dare offer to share in my apartments with you as I shared with you in Rome. I, who do not profess egotism, yet am an egotist par excellence, for, except myself, these rooms would not hold a shadow more, unless that shadow was feminine. Ah, said the Count, that's a most conjugal reservation. I recollect at Rome you said something of projected marriage. May I congratulate you? The affair is still in projection. And he who says in projection means already decided, said Debray. No, replied Morsef. My father is most anxious about it. 
and I hope, ere long, to introduce you, if not to my wife, at least to my betrothed, Mademoiselle Eugène Danglars. Eugène... Eugène Danglars, said Monte Cristo. Tell me, is not her father Baron Danglars? Yes, returned Morsef, a baron of new creation. What matter, said Monte Cristo, if he has rendered the state services which merit this distinction? Enormous ones, answered Beecham. Although in reality a liberal, he negotiated a loan of six millions for Charles X in uh, 1829, who made him a baron and chevalier of the Legion of Honor, uh, so that he wears the ribbon not, as you would think, in his waistcoat pocket, but at his buttonhole. Ah, interrupted Morcerf, laughing. Beecham, Beecham, keep that for Corsair or the Chivarali, but spare my future father-in-law before me. Then, returning to Monte Cristo, you just now spoke of his name as if you knew the baron. I do not know him, returned Monte Cristo, but I shall probably soon make of his acquaintance, for I have a credit opened with him by the house of Richard and Blontz of London, uh, Arstein and Eccles of Vienna, and Thompson and French of Rome. As he pronounced the last two names, the Count glanced at Maximilian Morel. If the stranger expected to produce an effect on Morel, he was not mistaken. Maximilian started as if he had been electrified. Thompson and French, said he. Do you, do you know this house, monsieur? They are my bankers in the capital of the Christian world, returned the, the Count quietly. Can my influence with them be of any service to you? Oh, Count, you could assist me perhaps in researches which have been up to the present fruitless. This house in past years did our a great service and has, I know not for what reason, always denied having rendered us this service. Well, I shall be at your orders, said Monte Cristo, bowing. But, continued Morsef, a propos of Danglars, we have strangely wandered from the subject. We are speaking of a suitable habitation for the Count of Monte Cristo. Come, gentlemen, let us all propose some place. Where shall we lodge this new guest of ours in the great city? For Borg Saint Germain, said Chateau Renard. The Count will find there a charming hotel with a court and garden. Bah, Chateau Renard, returned Debray. You only know your dull and gloomy Faubourg Saint Germain. Do not pay any attention to him, Count. Live in the Chaussee d'Autin. That's the real centre of Paris. Boulevard de l'Opera, said Beecham. The second floor, a house with a balcony. The Count will have all of his cushions of silver cloth brought there, and as he smokes his shiblauk, see all of Paris pass before him. You have no idea then, Morel? asked Chateau Renard. You do not propose anything. Oh, yes, replied the young man, smiling. On the contrary, I have one but I expected the Count to be tempted by one of the brilliant proposals made to him, yet he's not replied to any of them. I, I will venture to offer him a suit of apartments uh, in a charming hotel, in Pompadour style, that my sister inhabited for a year, in the Rue Meslay. You have a sister? asked the Count. Yes, Monsieur, a most excellent sister. Married? Nearly nine years. Happy? asked the Count again. As happy as it is permitted for a human creature to be, replied Maximilian. She married the man she loved, who remained faithful to us in our family fortunes, Emmanuel Herbort. Monte Cristo smiled imperceptibly. I live there during my leave of absence, continued Maximilian, and I shall be, together with my brother-in-law Emmanuel, at the disposition of the Count whenever he thinks fit to honour us. One minute, cried Albert, without giving Monte Cristo a chance to reply. Take care, you're going to immure a traveller, Sinbad the sailor, a man who comes to see Paris. You're going to make a patriarch of him. Oh no, said Morel. My sister is five and twenty. My brother-in-law is thirty. They are gay, young and happy. Besides, the Count will be in his own house and only see them when he thinks fit to do so. Thanks, Monsieur, said Monte Cristo. I shall content myself with being presented to your sister and her husband, if you do me the honour of introducing me. But I cannot accept the offer of any one of these gentlemen, since my habitation is already prepared. What? cried Morsef. You are then going to a hotel? That will be very dull for you. Was I so badly lodged at Rome? said Monte Cristo, smiling. Parbleu, at Rome you spent 50,000 piastres in furnishings in your apartment, but I presume that you are not disposed to spend a similar sum every day. It's not that which deterred me, replied Monte Cristo, but as I determined to have a house to myself, I sent on my valet de chambre, and he ought to have by this time have bought the house and furnished it. But then you have a valet de chambre who knows Paris? 
said Beecham. It's the first time he's ever been in Paris. He's black and cannot speak, returned Monte Cristo. It's Ali, cried Albert in the midst of the general surprise. Yes, Ali himself, um, my Nubian mute, whom you saw, I think, at Rome. Certainly, said Morsef. I rec recollect him perfectly. But how can you charge a Nubian to purchase a house and a mute to furnish it? He'll do everything wrong. Undeceive yourself, monsieur, replied Monte Cristo. I am quite sure that, on the contrary, he will choose everything I wish. He knows my tastes, my caprices, my wants. He's been here a week, and with the instinct of a hound hunting by himself, he will arrange everything for me. He knew that I should arrive today at ten o'clock. He was waiting for me at nine at the Barrière de Fontainebleau. He gave me this paper. It contains the number of my new abode. Read it yourself. Monte Cristo passed a paper to Albert. Ah, that is really original, said Beecham. And very princely, added Chateau Renard. What, you do not know your house? asked Debray. No, said Monte Cristo. I told you I did not wish to be behind my time. I dressed myself in the carriage and descended at the Viscount's door. The young men looked at each other. They did not know if it was a comedy Monte Cristo was playing, but every word he uttered had such an air of simplicity that it was impossible to suppose what he said was false. Besides, why should he tell a falsehood? We must content ourselves, then, said Beecham, with rendering the Count all the little services in our power. I, in my quality of a journalist, open all the theatres to him. Thanks, Monsieur, returned Monte Cristo. My steward has taken orders to take a box at each theatre. Is your steward also a Nubian? asked Debray. No, he is a countryman of yours. If a Corsican is a countryman of anyone's. But you know him, Monsieur de Morcerf? Is that excellent Monsieur Bertuccio, who understood hiring windows so well? Yes, you saw him the day I had the honour of receiving you. He's been a soldier, a smuggler, everything in fact. I would not be quite sure that he has not been mixed up with the police for some, some trifle. A stab with a knife, for instance. And you have chosen this honest and citizen as your steward, said Debray. Of how much does he rob you every year? On my word, replied the Count, no more than any other. I am sure he answers my purpose, knows no impossibility, so I keep him. Then, continued Chateau Renard, since you have an establishment, a steward, and a hotel in the Champs Elysees, you only want a mistress. Albert smiled. He thought of the fair Greek he had seen in the Count's box at Argentina and valet theatres. I have something better than that, said Monte Cristo. I have a slave. You procure your mistresses from the opera, the vaudeville or the varieties. I purchase mine at Constantinople. It costs me more, but I have nothing to fear. But you forget, replied Debray, laughing, that we Franks, by name and nature, as King Charles said, that the moment that she puts her foot in France, your slave becomes free. Who will tell her? The first person who sees her. She only speaks Romanic. That is different. But we at least shall see her, said Beecham. Do you keep eunuchs as well as mutes? Oh no, replied Monte Cristo. I do not carry brutalism so far. Everyone who surrounds me is free to quit me, and when they leave me they will no longer have any need of me or anything else, for it is that reason perhaps they do not quit me. They had long since passed to dessert and cigars. My dear Albert, said Debray, rising, it is half past two. Your guest is charming, but you leave the best company to go to the worst sometimes. I must return to the ministers. I'll tell him of the counts, and we shall soon know who he is. Take care, returned Albert. No one's been able to accomplish that. Oh, we have three millions for our police. It's true that they are almost always spent beforehand, but no matter, we still have 50,000 francs to spend for this purpose. And when you know, you will tell me? I promise you. Au revoir, Albert. Gentlemen, good morning. As he left the room, Debray called out loudly, My carriage. Bravo, said Beecham to Albert. I shall not go to the chamber, but I have something better to offer my readers than the speech of Monsieur Danglars. For heaven's sake, Beecham replied Morsef, do not deprive me of the merit of introducing him everywhere. Is he not peculiar? He's more than that, replied Chateau Renard. He's one of the most extraordinary men I saw in my life. Are you coming, Morel? Directly. I've given my card to the Count, who promises to pay us a visit at the Rue saint Muslay, number 14. Be sure I shall not fail to do so, returned the Count before bowing, and Maximilian Morel left the room with Baron Chateau Renard.
leaving Monte Cristo alone with Morcerf. End of chapter 40. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kelly Bashir of Mattapoisett, Massachusetts. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 41 the presentation when albert found himself alone with monte cristo my dear count said he allow me to commence my services as cicerone by showing you a specimen of bachelor's apartment you who are accustomed to the palaces of italy can amuse yourself by calculating in how many square feet a young man who is not the worst lodged in paris can live as we pass from one room to another i will open the windows to let you breathe Monte Cristo had already seen the breakfast room and the, and the salon on the ground floor. Albert led him first to his atelier, which was, as we have said, his favorite apartment. Monte Cristo quickly appreciated all that Albert had collected here: old cabinets, Japanese porcelain, Oriental stuffs, Venetian glass, arms from all parts of the world. Everything was familiar to him, and at the first glance he recognized their date, their country, and their origin. Morcerf had expected he should be the guide. On the contrary, it was he who, under the Count's guidance, followed a course of archaeology, mineralogy, and natural history. They descended to the first floor. Albert led his guests into the salon. The salon was filled with works of modern artists. There was landscapes by Dupre, with their long reeds and tall trees, their lowing oxen and marvelous skies. Delacroix's Arabian cavaliers, with their long white burnouses, their shining belts, their damasked arms, their horses who tore each other with their teeth while their riders contended fiercely with their maces, aquarelles of Boulanger representing Notre Dame de Paris, with that vigor that makes the artist the rival of the poet. There were paintings by Diaz, who makes his flowers more beautiful than flowers, his sons more brilliant than the sun designs by de Camp as vividly colored as those of Salvatore Rosa, but more poetic, pastels by Giraud and Muller, representing children like angels and women with the features of, vir of a virgin, sketches torn from the album of Dazette's Travels in the East, that had been made in a few seconds on the saddle of a camel, or beneath the dome of a mosque. In a word, all that modern art can give in exchange and as recompense for the art, lost and gone with ages long since past. Albert expected to have something new this time to show to the traveller, but to his great surprise the latter, without seeking for the signatures, many of which indeed were only initials, named instantly the author of every picture in such a manner that it was easy to see that each name was not only known to him, but that each style associated with it had been appreciated and studied by him. From the salon they passed into the bedchamber. It was a model of taste and simple elegance. A single portrait signed by Leopold Robert, shown in its carved and gilded frame. This portrait attracted the Count of Monte Cristo's attention, for he made three rapid steps in the chamber, and stopped suddenly before it. It was the portrait of a young woman of five or six and twenty, with a dark complexion and light and lustrous eyes, veiled beneath long lashes. She wore the picturesque costume of the Catalan fisherwoman a red and black bodice and gold pins in her hair. She was looking at the sea, and her form was outlined on the blue ocean and sky. The light was so faint in the room that Albert did not perceive the pallor that spread itself over the Count's visage, or the nervous heaving of his chest and shoulders. Silence prevailed for an instant, during which Monte Cristo gazed intently on the picture. "'You have their most charming mistress, Viscount,' said the Count in a perfectly calm tone. "'And this costume—' A ball costume, doubtless, becomes her admirably. Ah, monsieur, returned Albert, I would never forgive you this mistake if you had seen another picture beside this. You do not know my mother. She it is whom you see here. She had her portrait painted thus six or eight years ago. This costume is a fancy one, it appears, and the resemblance is so great that I think I still see my mother the same as she was in 1830. The countess had this portrait painted during the count's absence. She doubtless intended giving him an agreeable surprise, but, 
Strange to say, this portrait seemed to displease my father, and the value of the picture, which is, as you see, one of the best works of Leopold Robert, could not overcome his dislike to it. It is true, between ourselves, that Monsieur de Morcerf is one of the most assiduous peers at the Luxembourg, a general renowned for theory, but a most mediocre amateur of art. It is different with my mother, who paints exceedingly well, and who, unwilling to part with so valuable a picture, gave it to me to put here, where it would be less likely to displease Monsieur de Morcerf, whose portrait by Gros I will also show you. Excuse my talking of family matters, but as I shall have the honor of introducing you to the Count, I tell you this to prevent you making any allusions to this picture. The picture seems to have a malign influence, for my mother rarely comes here without looking at it, and still more rarely does she look at it without weeping. This disagreement is the only one that has ever taken place between the Count and Countess, who are still as much united, although married more than twenty years, as on the first day of their wedding. Monte Cristo glanced rapidly at Albert, as if to seek a hidden meaning in his word, but it was evident the young man uttered them in the simplicity of his heart. Now, said Albert, that you have seen all my treasures, allow me to offer them to you, as unworthy as they are. Consider yourself as in your own house, and to put yourself still more at ease, pray accompany me to the apartments of Monsieur de Morcerf, he whom I wrote from Rome on account of the services you rendered me, and to whom I announced your promised visit and I may say that both the Count and Countess anxiously desire to thank you in person. You are somewhat blasé, I know, and family scenes have not much effect on Sinbad the sailor, who has seen so many others. However, accept what I propose to you as an invitation into Parisian life, a life of politeness, visiting, and introductions. Monte Cristo bowed without making any answer. He accepted the offer without enthusiasm and without regret as one of those conventions of society which every gentleman looks upon as a duty. Albert summoned his servant and ordered him to acquaint Monsieur and Madame de Morcerf of the arrival of the Count of Monte Cristo. Albert followed him with the Count. When they arrived at the antechamber, above the door was visible a shield which, by its rich ornaments and its harmony with the rest of the furniture, indicated its importance the owner attached to this blazon. Monte Cristo stopped and examined it extensively. Azure seven relays, or place bender, said he. These are doubtless your family arms? Except the knowledge of blazons, which allows me to decipher them. I am very ignorant of heraldry. I account a fresh creation, fabricated in Tuscany by the aid of a commandery of St. Stephen, and who would not have taken the trouble had I not been told that when you travel much it is necessary. Besides, you must have something on the panel of your carriage to escape being searched by the custom house officers. "'Excuse my putting such a question to you.' "'It is not indiscreet,' returned Morcerf, with the simplicity of conviction. "'You have guessed rightly. These are our arms, that is, those of my father. But they are, as you see, joined to another shield, which has ghouls, a silver tower, which are my mother's. By her side I am Spanish, but the family of Morcerf is French, and I have heard one of the oldest of the south of France.' "'Yes,' replied Monte Cristo. "'These blazons prove that.' Almost all the armed pilgrims that went to the Holy Land took for their arms either a cross, in honor of their mission, or birds of passage, in sign of the long voyage they were about to undertake, and which they hoped to accomplish on the wings of faith. One of your ancestors had joined the Crusades, and supposing it to be only that of Saint Louis, that makes you mount to the thirteenth century, which is tolerably ancient. It is possible, said Morcerf, my father has in his study a genealogical tree which will tell you all that and which I made commentaries that would have greatly edified Hosier and Joker. At present I no longer think of it, and yet I must tell you that we are beginning to occupy ourselves greatly with these things under our popular government. Well, then, your government would do well to choose from the past something better than the things that I have noticed on your monuments, and which have no heraldic meaning whatever. As for you, Vicount, continued Monte Cristo de Morcerf, you are more fortunate than the government, for your arms are really beautiful and speak to the imagination. Yes, you are at once from Provence and Spain. That explains, if the portrait you showed me be like, the dark hue I so much admired on the visage of the noble Catalan. It would have required the penetration of Oedipus for the Sphinx to have divined the irony the Count concealed beneath these words, apparently uttered with the greatest politeness. Morcerf thanked him with a smile, and pushed open the door, above which were his arms, and which, as we have said, opened into the salon. In the most conspicuous part of the salon was another portrait, 
It was that of a man from five to eight and thirty, in the uniform of a general officer, wearing the double epaulet of heavy ribbon of heavy bullion that indicates superior rank, the ribbon of the Legion of Honor around his neck, which showed he was a commander, and on the right breast the star of a grand officer of the Order of the Saviour, and on the left that of the Grand Cross of Charles the Third, which proved that the person represented by the picture had served in the wars of Greece and Spain, or what was just the same thing as regarded decorations, had fulfilled some diplomatic mission in the two countries. Monte Cristo was engaged in examining this portrait, with no less care than he had bestowed upon the other, when another door opened, and he found himself opposite to the Count Morcerf in person. He was a man of forty to forty-five years, but he seemed at least fifty, and his black moustache and eyebrows contrasted strangely with his almost white hair, which was cut short in the military fashion. He was dressed in plain clothes, and wore at his buttonhole the ribbons of the different orders to which he belonged. He entered with a tolerably dignified step, and some little haste. Monte Cristo saw him advance towards him without making a single step. It seemed as if his feet were rooted to the ground, and his eyes on the Count of Morcerf. Father, said the young man, I have the honor of presenting to you the Count of Monte Cristo, the generous friend whom I had the good fortune to meet in the critical situation of which I have told you. You are most welcome, monsieur, said the Count of Morcerf, saluting Monte Cristo with a smile and monsieur has rendered our house in preserving its only air a service which ensures him our eternal gratitude as he said these words the count of morcerf pointed to a chair while he seated himself in another opposite the window monte cristo in taking the seat morcerf offered him placed himself in such a manner as to remain concealed in the shadow of the large velvet curtains and read on the careworn and livid features of the count a whole history of secret griefs written in each wrinkle time had planted there the countess, said Morcerf, was at her toilet when she was informed of the visit she was about to receive. She will, however, be in the salon in ten minutes. It is a great honor to me, returned Monte Cristo, to be thus, on the first day of my arrival in Paris, brought in contact with a man whose merit equals his reputation, and to whom fortune has for once been equitable. But has she not still on the plains of Metija, or in the mountains of Atlas, a marshal's staff to offer you? Oh, replied Morcerf, reddening slightly, I have left the service, monsieur. Made a peer at the restoration. I served through the first campaign under the orders of Marshal Bourmont. I could, therefore, expect a higher rank, and who knows what might have happened had the elder branch remained on the throne. But the revolution of July was, it seems, sufficiently glorious to allow itself to be ungrateful, and it was so for all services that did not date from the imperial period. I tendered my resignation, for when you have gained your appellates on the battlefield, you do not know how to manoeuvre on the slippery grounds of the salons. I have hung up my sword and cast myself into politics. I have devoted myself to industry. I study the useful arts. During the twenty years I served, I often wished to do so, but I had not the time. These are the ideas that render your nation superior to any other, returned Monte Cristo, a gentleman of high birth, possessor of an ample fortune. You have consented to gain your promotion as an obscure soldier, step by step. This is uncommon. Then become general, peer of France, commander of the Legion of Honor. You consent to again commence a second apprenticeship, without any other hope or any desire than that of one day becoming useful to your fellow creatures. This indeed is praiseworthy. Nay, more, it is sublime. Albert looked on and listened with astonishment. He was not used to see Monte Cristo give vent to such bursts of enthusiasm. Alas, continued the stranger, doubtless to dispel the slight cloud that covered Morcerf's bro, we do not act thus in Italy. We grow according to our race and our species, and we pursue the same lines, and often the same uselessness all our lives. But, Monsieur, for a man of your merit, Italy is not a country, and France opens her arms to receive you. Respond to her call. France will not, perhaps, be always ungrateful. She treats her children ill, but she always welcomes strangers. Ah, father, said Albert with a smile, it is evident you do not know the Count of Monte Cristo. He despises all honours, and contents himself with those written on his passport. That is the most just remark, replied the stranger, I ever heard made concerning myself. You have been free to choose your career, observed the Count of Morcerf with a sigh, and you have chosen the path strewn with flowers. Precisely, monsieur, replied Monte Cristo, with one of those smiles that a painter could never represent or a physiologist analyze. "'If I did not fear to fatigue you,' said the general, evidently charmed with the Count's manners, 
I would have taken you to the chamber. There is a debate very curious to those who are strangers to our modern senators. I shall be most grateful, monsieur, if you will, at some future time, renew your offer, but I have been flattered with the hope of being introduced to the countess, and I will therefore wait. Ah, here is my mother, cried the vicomte. Monte Cristo turned round hastily and saw Madame de Morcerf at the entrance of the salon, at the door opposite to that by which her husband had entered, pale and motionless. When Monte Cristo turned round, she let fall her arm, which for some unknown reason had been resting on the gilded doorpost. She had been there some moments and had heard the last words of the visitor. The latter rose and bowed to the countess, who inclined herself without speaking. "'Ah, good heavens, madame,' said the count, "'are you ill, or is it the heat of the room that affects you?' "'Are you ill, mother?' cried the vicomte, bringing towards her. She thanked them both with a smile. "'No,' returned she. "'But I feel some emotion on seeing, for the first time, the man without whose intervention we should have all been in tears and desolation.' Monsieur, continued the countess, advancing with the majesty of a queen, I owe to you the life of my son, and for this I bless you. Now, I thank you for the pleasure you give me in thus affording me the opportunity of thanking you as I have blessed you, from the bottom of my heart. The count bowed again, but lower than before. He was even paler than Mercedes. Madame, said he, the count and yourself recompense too generously a simple action. To save a man, to spare a father's feelings or a mother's sensibility, is not to do a good action, but a simple deed of humanity. At these words, uttered with the most exquisite sweetness and politeness, Madame de Morcerf replied, It is very fortunate for my son, Monsieur, that he found such a friend, and I thank God that things are thus. And Mercedes raised her fine eyes to heaven with so fervent an expression of gratitude, that the Count fancied he saw tears in them. Monsieur de Morcerf approached her. Madame, said he, I have already made my excuses to the Count for quitting him, and I pray you to do so also. The sitting commences at two, and it is now three, and I am to speak. Go then, and Monsieur and I will strive our best to forget your absence, said the Countess, with the same tone of deep feeling. Monsieur, continued she, turning to Monte Cristo, will you do us the honor of passing the rest of the day with us? Believe me, madame, I feel most grateful for your kindness, but I got out of my travelling carriage at your door this morning, and I am ignorant how I am installed in Paris, which I scarcely know. This is but a trifling inquietude, I know, but one that may be appreciated. We shall have the pleasure another time, said the countess. You promise that? Monte Cristo inclined himself without answering, but the gesture might pass for assent. I will not detain you, monsieur, continued the countess. I would not have our gratitude become indiscreet or importunate. My dear Count, said Albert, I will endeavor to return your politeness at Rome, and place my coup at your disposal until your own be ready. A thousand thanks for your kindness, Vicon, returned the Count of Monte Cristo, but I suppose that Monsieur Bertuccio has suitably employed the four hours and a half I have given him, and that I shall find a carriage of some sort ready at the door. Albert was used to the Count's manner of proceeding. He knew that. Like Nero, he was in search of the impossible, and nothing astonished him but wishing to judge with his own eyes how far the Count's orders had been executed. He accompanied him to the door of the house. Monte Cristo was not deceived. As soon as he appeared in the Count of Morcerf's antechamber, a footman, the same who at Rome had brought the Count's card to the two young men, and announced his visit, sprang into the vestibule, and when he arrived at the door, the illustrious traveller found his carriage awaiting him. It was a coop of Kohler's building, and with, and with horses and harness for which Drake had, to the knowledge of all the lions of Paris, refused on the previous day seven, seven hundred guineas. Monsieur, said the Count to Albert, I do not ask you to accompany to my house, as I can only show you a habitation fitted up in a hurry, and I have, as you know, a reputation to keep up as regards not being taken by surprise. Give me, therefore, one more day before I invite you. I shall then be certain not to fail in my hospitality. If you ask me for a day, Count, I know what to anticipate. It will not be a house I shall see, but a palace. You have decidedly some genius at your control. Ma foi, spread that idea, replied the Count of Monte Cristo, putting his foot on the velvet lined steps of his splendid carriage, and that will be worth something to me among the ladies. As he spoke, he sprang into the vehicle. The door was closed, but not so rapidly that Monte Cristo failed to perceive the almost imperceptible movement which stirred the curtains of the apartment in which he had left Madame de Morcerf. When Albert returned to his mother, he found her, in the boudoir, reclining in a large velvet armchair, 
the whole room so obscured that only the shining spangle, fastened here and there to the drapery, and the angles of the gilded frames of the pictures showed with some degree of brightness in the gloom. Albert could not see the face of the countess, as it was covered with a thin veil she put on her head, and which fell over her features in misty folds. But it seemed to him as though her voice had altered. He could distinguish amid the perfumes of the roses and heliotropes in the flower scents the sharp and fragrant odor of volatile salts, and he noticed in one of the chaise cups on the mantelpiece the countess's smelling bottle taken from its shagreen case, and exclaimed in a tone of uneasiness as he entered, "'My dear mother, have you been ill during my absence?' "'No, no, Albert, but you know these roses, tuberoses, and orange flowers throw out at first, before one is used to them, such violent perfumes.' "'Then, my dear mother,' said Albert, putting his hand to the bell, "'they must be taken to the antechamber. You are really ill, and just now were so pale as you came into the room.' "'Was I, was I pale, Albert?' "'Yes. A pallor that suits you admirably, mother, but which did not the less alarm my father and myself. Did your father speak of it? inquired Mercedes eagerly. No, but, um, but do you not remember that he spoke of the fact to you? Yes, I do remember, replied the countess. A servant entered, summoned by Elber's ring of the bell. Take these flowers into the ante-room or dressing-room, said the viscount. They make the countess ill. Footman obeyed his orders. A long pause ensued, which lasted until all the flowers were moved. "'What is this name of Monte Cristo?' inquired the countess, when the servant had taken away the last vase of flowers. "'Is it a family name, or the name of, his, or the, name of the estate, or a simple title?' "'I believe, mother, it is merely a title. The count purchased an island in the Tuscan archipelago, and, as he told you today, has founded a commandery. You know the same thing was done for St. Stephen of Florence, St. George, Constantinian of Parma, and even for the Order of Malta. Except this, he has no pretension to nobility and calls himself a chance count, although the general opinion at Rome is that the count is a man of very high distinction. His manners are admirable, said the countess, at least as far as I could judge, in the few minutes he remained here. They are perfect, mother, so perfect that they surpass by far all I have known in the leading aristocracy of the three proudest nobilities of Europe, the English, the Spanish, and the German. The countess paused a moment, then, after a slight hesitation, she resumed. You have seen, my dear Albert, I ask the question as a mother, you have seen Monsieur de Monte Cristo in his house, you are quick sighted, have much knowledge of the world, more tact than is usual at your age. Do you think the count is really what he appears to be? What does he appear to be? Why, you have just said, a man of high distinction. I told you, my dear mother, he was esteemed such. But what is your own opinion, Albert? I must tell you that I have not come to any decided opinion respecting him, but I think him a Maltese. I did not ask you of his origin, but what he is. Ah, what he is! That is quite another thing. I have seen many remarkable things in him. But if you would have me really say what I think, I shall reply that I really do look upon him as one of Byron's heroes, whom misery has marked with a fatal, with a fatal brand, some Manfred, some Lara, some Warner, one of those wrecks, as it were, of some ancient family who, disinherited of their patrimony, have achieved one by the force of their adventurous genius, who has placed them above the laws of society. You say, I say that Monte Cristo is an island in the midst of the Mediterranean, without inhabitants or garrison, the resort of smugglers of all nations, and pirates of every flag. Who knows whether or not these industrious worthies do not pay their feudal lord some duties for his protection?" "'That is possible,' said the Countess, reflecting. "'Never mind,' continued the young man. "'Smuggler or not, you must agree, dear mother, as you have seen him, that the Count of Monte Cristo is a remarkable man, who will have the greatest success in the salons of Paris. Why, this very morning, in my rooms, he made his, entree, his entry among us by striking every man of us with amazement, not even excepting Chateau Renaud. And what do you suppose is the Count's age? inquired Mercedes, evidently attaching great importance to this question. Thirty-five or thirty-six, mother? So young, it is impossible, said Mercedes, replying at the same time to what Albert said as well as to her own private reflection. It is the truth, however, three or four times he has said to me, and certainly without the slightest premeditation. At such a period I was five years old, and 
at another ten years old, at another twelve, and I, induced by curiosity which kept me alive to these details, have compared the dates, and never found him inaccurate. The age of this singular man, who is of no age, is then, I am certain, thirty-five. Besides, mother, remark how vivid his eye, how raven-black his hair, and his brow, though so pale is free from wrinkles. He is not only vigorous, but also young. The countess bent her head, as if beneath the heavy wave of bitter thoughts. "'And has this man displayed a friendship for you, Albert?' she said, with a nervous shudder. "'I'm inclined to think so. And do you like him?' "'Why, he pleases me, in spite of Franz d'Epinay, who tries to convince me that he is a being returned from the other world.' The countess shuddered. "'Albert,' she said, in a voice which was altered by emotion, "'I have always put you on your guard against new acquaintances. Now you are a man, and are able to give me advice. Yet I repeat to you, Albert, be prudent. Why, my dear mother, it is necessary, in order to make your advice turn to account, that I should know beforehand what I have to distrust. The Count never plays. He only drinks pure water tinged with a little sherry, and he is so rich that he cannot, without intending to laugh at me, try to borrow money. What, then, have I to fear from him? You are right, said the countess, and my fears are weakness, especially when directed against a man who has saved your life. How did your father receive him, Albert? It is necessary that we should be more than complacent to the count. Monsieur de Morcerf is sometimes occupied, his business makes him reflective, and he might, without intending it. Nothing could be in better taste than my father's demeanor, madame, said Albert. Nay, more, he seemed greatly flattered at two or three compliments which the Count very skilfully and agreeably paid him with as much ease as if he had known him these thirty years. Each of these little tickling errors must have pleased my father, added Albert with a laugh, and thus they parted the best possible friends, and Monsieur de Morcerf even wished to take him to the chamber to hear the speakers. The Countess made no reply. She fell into so deep a reverie that her eyes gradually closed. The young man, standing up before her, gazed upon her with that filial affection which is so tender and endearing with children whose mothers are still young and handsome. Then, after seeing her eyes closed and hearing her breathe gently, he believed she had dropped asleep and, let the ap and left the apartment on tiptoe, closing the door after him with the utmost precaution. "'This devil of a fellow,' he muttered, shaking his head. "'I said at the time he would create a sensation here, and I measure his effect and I measure his effect by an infallible thermometer. My mother has noticed him, and he must, therefore, perforce be remarkable. He went down to the stables, not without some slight annoyance, when he remembered that the Count of Monte Cristo had laid his hands on a turnout, which sent his bays down to second place in the opinion of connoisseurs. Most decidedly, said he, men are not equal, and I must beg my father to develop this theorem in the chamber of peers. End of chapter 41。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Louisa Hall. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 42. Monsieur Bertuccio. Meanwhile, the Count had arrived at his house. It had taken him six minutes to perform the distance, but these six minutes were sufficient to induce twenty young men, who knew the price of the equipage they had been unable to purchase themselves, to put their horses in a gallop in order to see the rich foreigner who could afford to give twenty thousand francs apiece for his horses. The house Ali had chosen, and which was to serve as a town residence to Monte Cristo, was situated on the right hand as you ascend the champs elysees A thick clump of trees and shrubs rose in the centre, and masked a portion of the front. Around this shrubbery two alleys, like two arms, extended right and left, and formed a carriage drive from the iron gates to a double portico, on every step of which stood a porcelain vase filled with flowers. This house, isolated from the rest, had, besides the main entrance, another in the Rue Ponthieu, even before the coachman had hailed the concierge, the massy gates rolled on their hinges, they had seen the Count coming, and at Paris, as everywhere else, he was served with the rapidity of lightning. The coachman entered and traversed the half-circle without slackening his speed, 
and the gates were closed ere the wheels had ceased to sound on the gravel. The carriage stopped at the left side of the portico. Two men presented themselves at the carriage window. The one was Ali, who, smiling with an expression of the most sincere joy, seemed amply repaid by a mere look from Monte Cristo. The other bowed respectfully, and offered his arm to assist the Count in descending. "'Thanks, Monsieur Bertuccio,' said the Count, springing lightly up the three steps of the portico. "'And the notary?' "'He is in the small salon, Excellency,' returned Bertuccio. "'And the cards I ordered to be engraved as soon as you knew the number of the house?' "'Your Excellency, it is done already. I have been myself to the best engraver of the Palais Royal, who did the plate in my presence.' The first card struck off was taken, according to your orders, to the Baron d'Anglars, rue de la Chaussée d'Antin, number seven. The others are on the mantelpiece of Your Excellency's bedroom. Good. What o'clock is it? Four o'clock. Monte Cristo gave his hat, cane, and gloves to the same French footman who had called his carriage at the Count Morcerf's. Then he passed into the small salon, preceded by Bertuccio, who showed him the way. "'These are but indifferent marbles in this antechamber,' said Monte Cristo. "'I trust all this will soon be taken away.' Bertuccio bowed. As the steward had said, the notary awaited him in the small salon. He was a simple-looking lawyer's clerk, elevated to the extraordinary dignity of a provincial scrivener. "'You are the notary empowered to sell the country house that I wish to purchase, monsieur?' asked Monte Cristo. "'Yes, Count,' returned the notary. "'Is the deed of sale ready?' "'Yes, Count.' Have you brought it? Here it is. Very well. And where is this house that I purchase? asked the Count carelessly, addressing himself half to Bertuccio, half to the notary. The steward made a gesture that signified, I do not know. The notary looked at the Count with astonishment. What, said he, does not the Count know where the house he purchases is situated? No, returned the Count. The Count does not know. How should I know? I have arrived from Cadiz this morning. I have never before been at Paris, and it is the first time I have ever even set my foot in France. Ah, that is different. The house you purchase is at Auteuil. At these words Bertuccio turned pale. And where is Auteuil? asked the Count. Close by here, monsieur, replied the notary. A little beyond Passy, a charming situation, in the heart of the Bois de Boulogne. So near as that, said the Count, but that is not in the country. "'What made you choose a house at the gates of Paris, Monsieur Bertuccio?' "'I,' cried the steward with a strange expression, "'His Excellency did not charge me to purchase this house. "'If His Excellency will recollect, if he will think—' "'Ah, true,' observed Monte Cristo. "'I recollect now. "'I read the advertisement in one of the papers "'and was tempted by the false title, A Country House. "'And if Your Excellency will entrust me with the commission, "'I will find you a better at Anguien, at fontenay aux Roses, or at Bellevue, Oh, no, returned Monte Cristo negligently. Since I have this, I will keep it. And you are quite right, said the notary, who feared to lose his fee. It is a charming place, well supplied with spring water and fine trees, a comfortable habitation, although abandoned for a long time, without reckoning the furniture, which, although old, is yet valuable, now that old things are so much sought after. I suppose the Count has the tastes of the day? To be sure, returned Monte Cristo. It is very convenient, then? It is more. It is magnificent. Pest, let us not lose such an opportunity, returned Monte Cristo. The deed, if you please, Mr. Notary. And he signed it rapidly, after having first run his eye over that part of the deed in which were specified the situation of the house and the names of the proprietors. Bertuccio, said he, give fifty-five thousand francs to monsieur. The steward left the room with a faltering step, and returned with a bundle of banknotes, which the notary counted like a man who never gives a receipt for money until after he is sure it is all there. "'And now,' demanded the Count, "'are all the forms complied with?' "'All, sir.' "'Have you the keys?' "'They are in the hands of the concierge, who takes care of the house, but here is the order I have given him to install the Count in his new possessions.' "'Very well.' And Monte Cristo made a sign with his hand to the notary, which said, "'I have no further need of you. You may go.' But, observed the honest notary, the count is, I think, mistaken. It is only fifty thousand francs, everything included. And your fee? Is included in this sum. But have you not come from Auteuil here? Yes, certainly. Well then, it is but fair that you should be paid for your loss of time and trouble, said the count, and he made a gesture of polite dismissal. 
The notary left the room backwards and bowing down to the ground. It was the first time he had ever met a similar client. "'See this gentleman out,' said the Count to Bertuccio. And the steward followed the notary out of the room. Scarcely was the Count alone when he drew from his pocket a book closed with a lock, and opened it with a key which he wore round his neck, and which never left him. After having sought for a few minutes, he stopped at a leaf which had several notes, and compared them with the deed of sale which lay on the table. Auteuil, Rue de la Fontaine, number 28. It is indeed the same, said he. And now, am I to rely on an avowal extorted by religious or physical terror? However, in an hour I shall know all. Bertuccio, cried he, striking a light hammer with a pliant handle on a small gong. Bertuccio! The steward appeared at the door. Monsieur Bertuccio, said the Count, did you never tell me that you had travelled in France? In some parts of France, yes, Excellency. You know the environs of Paris, then? No, Excellency, no, returned the steward, with a sort of nervous trembling, which Monte Cristo, a connoisseur in all emotions, rightly attributed to great disquietude. It is unfortunate, returned he, that you have never visited the environs, for I wish to see my new property this evening, and had you gone with me, you could have given me some useful information. To Auteuil, cried Bertuccio, whose copper complexion became livid. I go to Auteuil. Well, what is there surprising in that? When I live at Auteuil, you must come there, as you belong to my service. Bertuccio hung down his head before the imperious look of his master, and remained motionless, without making any answer. Why, what has happened to you? Are you going to make me ring a second time for the carriage? asked Monte Cristo, in the same tone that Louis the Fourteenth pronounced the famous, I have been almost obliged to wait. Bertuccio made but one bound to the antechamber, and cried in a hoarse voice, His Excellency's horses! Monte Cristo wrote two or three notes, and, as he sealed the last, the steward appeared. Your Excellency's carriage is at the door, said he. Well, take your hat and gloves, returned Monte Cristo. Am I to accompany you, Your Excellency? cried Bertuccio. Certainly, you must give the orders, for I intend residing at the house. It was unexampled for a servant of the Count to dare to dispute an order of his, so the steward, without saying a word, followed his master, who got into the carriage, and signed to him to follow, which he did, taking his place respectfully on the front seat. End of chapter 42